and now I must be at the entertaining part of the presentation, so I'm just going to stand here. First time I've ever been to one of these conferences at all, so uh, this has uh, been been a lot of uh, been a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, it's been great. <laughs> I, I spend a lot of my time on the road or on missions and stuff like that. And so uh, you know, every time we're like, hey, can we go to a conference? They're like, no, you need to work. So 
Um, so it's been uh, a lot of fun. Also, uh, really, uh, I don't know, very encouraging. Um, I came up here not knowing uh, that anybody was going to be here that I would know, uh, except maybe like one person. Um, and uh, I get here and I start seeing people uh, that are familiar to me, colleagues, supporters, stuff like that. And so that's been kind of encouraging. And, and been, I don't know, it's been, it's been nice to, to catch up and see people and uh, that I didn't expect to be here to uh, support me. So uh, thanks for showing up. Thanks, guys. A uh, little bit about me. Um, I have had the privilege of sort of having two different careers. Um, I uh, kind of started off in uh, what's considered the uh, counter um, technical surveillance field. Um, so some people might have heard the term bug sweeping before, things like that. So it's kind of my specialty for the last 20 years um, is, is dabbling around in that field. So uh, think of like fo RF, like fox hunting uh, to the extreme um, is what I do. I started off with diplomatic security, um, doing security systems and stuff for embassies uh, overseas. Um, doing uh, physical security, technical security work, um, all that kind of stuff. Got to see some really cool places. Um, the picture in the upper right corner of the slide hasn't really uh, aged uh, well. Um, that's uh, outside of uh, Kabul. Um, the, uh, and then, um, I kind of, uh, after diplomatic security, uh, they sent me to teach uh, other people um, the craft uh, and so to different agencies and things like that so had a lot of fun doing that taught for like eight and a half years and then um, moved down to Tampa Florida to SOCOM and uh, helped them with start some programs down there as well so uh, a lot of time doing that um, also uh, after that I kind of went to my second career which was uh, red teaming uh, physical penetration testing and red teaming I, I showed up at a uh, uh, a red team um, and they said hey do you know anything about uh, cyber operations and I was like well I can you know I can run uh, Wireshark and I can look at packets and I'm, I'm decent with that and they're like well you know anything about NMAP I was like no uh, do you know anything about uh, you know a list of things it's pretty much no and they said well let's say you take this system here and you know you're trying to you know find out how it works like wh what do you do and my whole thing was like well I'd, I'd set up an RF receiver and I'd see if it has any signals coming off of it and see like so just think, thinking about it differently and they're like well we don't have that so you're hired um, and eventually uh, <coughs> eventually it got to the point to where um, a lot of the physical security stuff and a lot of that physical security knowledge and technical security knowledge they're like I think you would really do really good in uh, physical access and close access so last five years that's been my specialty is um, breaking into buildings, doing work like that, um, with an emphasis on not breaking into the buildings, but affecting the networks, affecting uh, the cyber side of it. Essentially, um, the, uh, the company I was working for, um, the contracts that we were doing, the expectation was that we were going to get in. Um, the, the one thing that the client wanted to see is how can you affect the network when you're there. The big thing about red teaming from our perspective is that if you're not showing a mission effect, then you're not doing any good, right? So, um, so that's kind of been my second career. It's been, you know, the last five, six years of doing that. And um, uh, along with that, I started a company back in uh, 2013 called Skinny Research and Development. Um, we've got a uh, kind of a, a plucky little group there. That's us, uh, kind of the four of us. Uh, the, the guy in the pink shirt, uh, Josiah Bryan, he's just an absolute whiz. Um, he is uh, our, kind of our uh, cyber uh, operations, uh, cyber networking uh, instructor. Uh, really good guy, uh, won a badge challenge at DEF CON one year, puts out CVEs like, like I breathe. Um, the guy's incredible. Um, that's his brother there on the left in the blue shirt. Um, his brother's just kind of an, an administrative uh, a genius. He works with FEMA and does a lot of um, uh, stuff where, you know, hurricane hits Florida, this guy shows up and gets houses where they need to do and stuff like that. And so it's really cool. And the, the lady there in the photograph, that's my wife, Brandy. And today it's her birthday. And so, uh, yeah, so a round of applause. She, uh, uh, li living like we do, um, sometimes we can end up on her birthday uh, in, in Australia. Um, but we're most likely ending up in a place like uh, uh, the northern end of New Mexico in the desert where the only thing you can smell when you wake up is the uh, cattle's being slaughtered uh, in the morning. So um, she has seen a lot of uh, crazy things. And when I asked her, I was like, hey, I'm going to apply for this. I don't know if, you know, this might be on her birthday. She was all game. She's like, apply. We're going to have some fun. So um, thank you for <laughs> letting me do this. Um, 
but yeah, so we do a lot of training, um, do some, some cult consulting products, but the main thing we do is training. We love to train people, um, uh, cyber training, uh, physical security uh, type training, but uh, and TSEM type training. So I do a lot of electronics, uh, a lot of RF type training, um, but that's sort of our thing. So a um, little bit of disclaimer. Uh, so I'm about to play a little fast and loose with electrical theory. So if you're an electrical engineer, you're probably going to, you know, have a, 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 a tick in the back of your neck by the end of this. But um, I kind of want to simplify everything because I know that some people in the room are very cyber oriented, um, very, uh, you know, network operations uh, types. So I want to be able to kind of give you an understanding of, of some of these concepts. Um, and if you are uh, into electronics and microcontrollers, things like that, then you'll be right on board. I won't have to ex kind of explain anything, but a lot of stuff is going to be simplified. I'm not going to try to go into too deep stuff because I, I just don't want to lose anybody, and I think everybody can, can get something from a, a little bit more simplified explanation of things. So the big question of um, kind of this talk is uh, uh, how can an adversary detect uh, if an empty network port is attached to a switch without setting off port security? So this is um, one of many of my daily struggles on the uh, you know, close access side of things, is uh, when you go into a building, you don't always have the luxury of where you end up. Um, you don't have a lot of control sometimes. Uh, sometimes I might be under escort. Sometimes I might be, uh, you know, I, I might have certain limitations about where I can and can't go. And so, you know, you have to pick your battles. And one of the things is you see a lot of these on the wall, right? You can walk into anywhere from a, a kinder care, a bank, or a government building, you'll see these things uh, stacked there. And the, the thought for a lot of us is, ooh, I wonder if that's connected, right? Um, so uh, my thing is if I go into a building, I need to assess whether or not this thing has anything behind it. Because if I waste an asset plugging it into this thing, then you know, if I've only brought three or four of them, well, now I'm down one, right? And if I'm just blindly plugging in and all four of the assets I plug in don't turn out because there's no switch at the end of the line, then I'm screwed, right? So I want to be, I want to have as much control as I can, and I want to be able to um, kind of understand what I'm plugging into and when I'm plugging into it and what I'm, you know, getting involved with. Um, the big thing that I always hear, though, from my end is like, well, is this something the adversary would actually do, right? Like, is an adversary going to take and just plug into a network port just blindly? Like, you know, they might have some intel about it. And, uh, and yeah, you know, it is something the adversary would do, right? Like, we've, we've seen this in the news. Uh, 2019, um, a little bit before that, uh, JPL had a problem where an uh, employee left the uh, Raspberry Pi, uh, plugged in, um, and kind of left. And from what the news uh, we'll talk about for you is that they went in and uh, were able to pull documents on the Mars rover and, uh, and kind of uh, take some of that, that information. And that was a, what we consider kind of like a leave behind device, right? So, you know, you plug it in, leave it behind in the network port. And, you know, whether you're gap jumping that over like an RF link or you're pulling it through the network because there's some misconfiguration, uh, you leave it behind, you leave it in place, and then you kind of get your work done, right? So. We know what's happened in the past. We know the adversary does this. Um, we can point to a lot of different, you know, applications of where, you know, this has happened. Um, so if you're an adversary uh, or emulating one and you go in and you're trying to figure out, uh, all right, well, what is it that, um, uh, what can I use, right? Like, what can I use to try to assess the situation to see if I can plug something in? Um, you might decide, well, hey, there's a ton of these little fluke meters, right, that you can plug in to give you distance of cables and things like that. But those sometimes can be problematic, especially the newer ones, um, because they seem to have some sort of MAC capability or that they're at least locking up uh, switches, right? So you could plug it in. If there's port security, it could lock the port, and now you're done. Um, there's other uh, things like the Shark Jack, the Hack 5 Shark Jack. Um, the, uh, the older model of it, we'll talk about kind of uh, uh, some of the approaches with the Shark Jack. It, it was a little bit problematic for me. Um, it, it, there are, I think, ways to set it up to where it's not as problematic, but, um, but we'll kind of discuss, uh, discuss that a little bit later. So this was my problem, was, you know, how do I know, right? How do I know what is behind that, that wall plate? Is there a switch at the end of the line or not? Um, I didn't arrive at the proper solution for this. Uh, until 
I started to merge those two worlds that I came from. So the counter surveillance world and the cyber world until a kind of a solution came up. And I kind of want to walk you through what happened with a pre-problem, right? So this is a problem that I faced years ago. Um, and uh, if I'm an investigator, right, and I'm doing this technical surveillance countermeasures job and I'm trying to figure out, um, you know, how to assess a network, one thing that uh, like bug sweepers do is their main job is to validate the integrity of everything, right? So if I walk into this room and I'm like, okay, well, you know, what am you know what am I scared of? Like, what am I you know what am I going to be looking at? Well, the legs in these chairs, right? Like, how do I know that the legs in all of these chairs actually are pristine? I, I don't, right? I need to figure out a way to to know, right? The backs in these chairs, the carpet. The, the table, right, the projector, right, like somebody could put something in any one of these to capture audio, um, maybe capture video, uh, there, you know, and there are trade-offs, right, if it's in a chair leg, then it's probably going to be battery powered, it's probably not going to last super long, right, there's all these things, but the job of a countermeasure person is to validate the integrity of everything in the room, right? So then you can turn to a security manager and go, yeah, you're clean, go ahead, have your conference, have your, you know, your private conversation, you're, you're good to go. So, um, so that's kind of the, the problem. And when you move that to Cat5 and, and copper eth uh, ethernet infrastructure, now you're saying, all right, well, how do I validate the length of that run from the wall plate all the way to the switch outside of that area of concern? How do I validate every inch of that? Right, so that's a, a problem. Well, one of the ways you can kind of do that, if you can kind of rephrase that question, is does Cat5 based Ethernet infrastructure provide any reliable, repeatable, measurable characteristics from line to line? Why is this a good question to ask? I'm, I'm kind of interactive, so feel free to speak up. Like, why, like what, what does this give me to asking this question? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So a repeatable method of testing. Exactly. That's, that's perfect, right? So, you know, what I'm looking for on a, on a Cat5 cable, if I've got some equipment um, that, you know, whether it's a meter or an O-scope or something like that, I'm trying to look for some repeatable method so I can go from port to port to port to port and make sure everything looks the same, right? So let's take a look at Cat5-based infrastructure real quick. For some of, this, for some of you, this will be a review. Um, but uh, we'll start with 10, 100 megabits, right? So inside a Cat5 cable, you've got four pair. Um, this is set up as a 568B wiring standard, or like what I like to call it, the right wiring standard. Um, <laughs> so, sorry, old telephone guy. Um, the, uh, yeah, so the, the, the 10, 100 uh, uh, setup is that you have a, a blue, orange, green, brown uh, pair. I almost want to play, say slate, but that's telephone. Um, <coughs> but uh, you have these, these set up in there. And um, uh, what you don't normally see when you see this in a textbook or anything like that is uh, you'll notice I put some little, uh, um, uh, some little icons at the end of each one of these uh, pair. Those are transformers. Those are coils, all right? So those are inside of the NIC. So when you take a look at a, a Cat5 port and you plug into it and it is uh, the port, the RJ45 for a device, just inside that device, are transformer coils to isolate the line from the circuitry uh, of, the, um, of the device, right? So on the end of each one of these pairs is one side of that coil. What happens is your digital stream, your digital bits, ones and zeros, it goes down this wire, hits that coil, and those coils are really close together. They're not touching, but they're really close, and the ma they magnetically couple from one side to the other. Right, to give it that isolation in the circuit. So on, you know, if I got a client on one end, I got a switch on the other end, at each end there is a transformer to allow bits to flow over and in between so that if there is some kind of strange like DC spike of power on the middle of this wire, like at least you have some sort of isolation there. Now, that doesn't mean it's not gonna fry your stuff, but there's something there to keep it from going straight into the circuit. So this is kind of the way it is. Now with 10-100, um, uh, just kind of as a review, what pair, uh, pairs are used on a 10-100 on a uh, line? Anyone? Anyone? Orange. Orange is one. Is that good? Not blue. Green, yes. Orange and green. So 
on a, on a normal, like, old 10-100 uh, megabits per second, uh, you have a, 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 the orange and the green. If you've ever used one of the um, uh, land, one of those uh, little taps, uh, 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 the, um, uh, what do they call them, like throwing star taps and stuff like that, uh, what they do um, in order to uh, do that, uh, make that work, is if you've got like a gigabit switch or something, they actually kind of cut off service to certain lines so that it forces it to go into a 10100 megabit mode, and uh, the only traffic is going to be on the orange and the green uh, pair. Uh, that way you can sort of uh, pull off of it. But So that's 10100. So on a gigabit line, what wires are used? All of them, yeah, every one of them. So all of them's in use at that point. Um, so the cool thing is if you were to take and you were just to cut the brown wire here, um, what would happen is it would downgrade immediately and go into 10-100 mode and just use the orange and the green pair so you wouldn't be completely screwed. Um, so uh, most people don't, some people don't know that about switches is that they're, they're fairly agile sometimes about changing speeds. Uh, and when they change speeds, they actually change physically the waveform on the line. It'll completely change the way it, it sends bits up and down the line. So yeah, so that's kind of how Cat5 uh, infrastructure works. So back to our question. Uh, does Cat5-based Ethernet infrastructure provide any reliable, repeatable, measurable characteristics from line to line? So if I'm looking at my handy-dandy multimeter up here and I'm looking at the different functions that are on it, I can take a look and see that uh, there's different things that I can measure with a multimeter, right? I can measure DC voltage, AC voltage, DC current, AC current. Um, DC voltage, right? So where do we see DC voltage mostly? What's that? I thought I, I heard of battery, like, yeah. So, so yeah, so sometimes you'll see it in a battery, right? Um, you'll see it, it's just, uh, you know, not the type of voltage you get from plugging into a plug in the wall. Um, uh, but in Cat5 cable, um, you, you sometimes see DC voltage with power over Ethernet. Um, it might, may or may not be there. Uh, but if you're going into a building and you don't know what you're going to look at, or you're going into a building to do an investigation, uh, you might not know what might be there. So essentially DC voltage sometimes can be, sometimes might be reliable, oftentimes it's not. Um, you don't know if there's going to be any DC voltage there to check. Um, AC voltage, on a, on a multimeter AC voltage is talking about 60 hertz like wall power. Um, if you see that on Cat5 lines, run. Um, <laughs> don't, don't lick it, that's the one thing. Um, so, uh, <coughs> so yeah, you don't want to kind of be around that. Um, DC current, kind of the same way. If there's DC voltage there, there'll be a DC current. So that just depends on if you got power over Ethernet. The one thing that does repeat from line to line, though, is resistance. Okay. So um, uh, in each one of these lines, like we talked about, you have that that coil uh, set up there. And so <coughs> um, how the the way that uh, resistance is taken, and kind of show you here, uh, the way you take resistance with a meter is the meter will uh, push a little bit of voltage down the line. So if you've never ever worked with electronics before, all resistance is is the amount of crap uh, that's on the line that'll slow your charge from going from one end to the other, right? So if you've got a line that is 100 feet long, the resistance of that'll be X. If you've got a line that's 1,000 feet long, all right, it's going to be more than X, right? You're going to, the more length of the line, the more resistance you'll have. Um, in electronics, we have these uh, little bitty components that are really hard to see here um, called uh, resistors. So this guy right here, so this is so that we can, um, uh, you know, uh, if we need a prescribed amount of resistance, these are all tailored for that. This is a 10 kilo ohm resistor. So if I want to sort of, you know, take a measurement of this, I've got, uh, put this on uh, resistance mode, just a little ohm there, and plug it up. And what'll happen is this will take a little bit of time and tell me, oh, that's a you know, 10 kilo ohm resistor, or really close, 9.84 kilo ohms. Uh, these things, this particular resistor is within 5% of supposed to be you know, what it is. You can get 1% resistors that are a lot more accurate. Um, but that's how resistance works, is that uh, this voltmeter produces a little bit of voltage which causes a current uh, to, to kind of travel down the line. So uh, when you have a little bit of voltage on the line, you have a discrepancy. The way it works is you, you put a little bit of charge on one lead, the red lead, you have less charge on the black lead, and that causes um, uh, 
current flow from the red lead to the black lead, right? Um, the multimeter knows how much voltage it put out. Um, it can measure the current coming back, and it has an internal resistance. Pretty much with all these things, it can tell you what the resistance of that coil is at the end of the wire. Um, thing is, if there's no switch at the end of the wire, what would you read as far as resistance goes? Zero. Yeah, you wouldn't read anything, right? Because there's nothing there to complete the circuit. So to kind of show that off, um, uh, anybody seen one of these before? So this is called a modular adapter. Some of you might have heard of this as a banjo. Uh, what it does is it breaks out each conductor uh, in the Cat5 cable. So, um, so this is conductor one, two, three, four, five, six. So it lets you actually plug in. So I've got this plugged into a switch right now. So if I take and go onto, let's just say the uh, fourth pair, which is seven and eight, hook it up. You'll see it gives me a reading of somewhere under 10 ohms. This is coming up 3.9, four ohms. Um, this will be for every pair. So if I go to one and two, do it again, it'll give me the same thing. Uh, every balanced pair reads under 10 ohms every single time on every single device across the world if it's uh, balanced pair Ethernet. So when we're talking about from an investigative perspective doing like a bug sweeping thing, um, I can rely on every balanced pair always giving me less than 10 ohms of measurement every single time. It uh, doesn't matter if it's a PoE switch, doesn't matter if it's a network switch, it's always the same. So if somebody takes and screws around halfway down the wire, well, they better do it delicately because you imbalance that, one, you will screw with the switch a little bit, um, but two, uh, like if someone's looking, they'll notice there's an imbalance. So this is kind of one method kind of you could use to kind of get at that. Um, and so that, that coil there gives us that reliable, repeatable measurement always. So there is a, a, a few things you need to do. So don't run out of here and all of a sudden feel like, hey, I've got a, you know, um, I've got a voltage source. Yeah, you got a question? Oh, so if it's, uh, so you're talking like a crossover cable? Yeah, I mean, as long as the balance pairs are actually terminating on the balance pairs inside the, the client device, yeah, you'll still get the same thing. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which direction you go to, whether you're, you're firing into a switch or you're firing into the client device. If it's terminating in a, in a NIC, you'll get the same thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, one thing you might be thinking is like, well, if you can push voltage down the line, like I got a, I, I got a, a power supply at home, like maybe I'll hook that up, and just, you know, plug that sucker in. Uh, you got to be careful. All right. So the amount of power that a voltmeter pushes out is really low. All right. So the current that runs through that coil when I hook this voltmeter up is in the microamp range, like 100 microamps, right? So it's a very small amount of current that's running through that coil. So it's not going to damage the coil if you're using a, a multimeter. However, I had a colleague one time that decided it might be cool to play around with a toy um, and, and mess around with some stuff uh, to see if he could put something on a line. And he decided, well, uh, I got a 9 volt battery. That's handy, right? And uh, because of a series of mistakes, uh, what happened <laughs> was um, the 9 volt battery got attached uh, directly to a balanced pair. Well, um, we can do some quick math on that. Uh, there's a little thing called Ohm's Law that lets you figure out exactly how much current was being pulled. And um, the amount of current he was pulling with that 9 volt battery was all of it, right? Um, so, uh, a 9 volt battery will only give out about 500 milliamps before it starts to degrade and you know catch on fire. Um, so uh, he got it up to 1.8 amps uh, theoretically. Um, to put this in perspective for those who don't get electricity that much, 0.7 uh, I think it's 0.7 milliamps or no 7 milliamps across the human heart is enough to stop it. Um, and uh, I believe uh, if you have just one amp running through your body, that's enough to do some significant damage. I know from a personal experience that two amps will burn a hole straight through a proto breadboard, um, <laughs> much, much to my former university's dismay. Um, so uh, when you're messing around with this, uh, just be careful about 
what you're pushing down the line. Um, so back to the problem. How can someone detect if an empty network port is, is a, uh, network port is attached to a switch without setting off port security? Well, um, uh, thing is, is I had my cyber mind on when I was doing this because I'm doing physical security. I'm breaking into stuff. I'm planting devices. I'm doing all of that, and I didn't even think about the other side of stuff, the freaking business that I run that does technical surveillance countermeasures. I wasn't even thinking of the same thing. So what I did is I got a Raspberry Pi, right? And I'm just like, well, if I can put the t TCP dump on the Raspberry Pi and I can plug it in and I can tie that to an LED, then anytime I see multicast or broadcast traffic, like I'll get the thing to light up and that'll tell me if I'm hooked to a switch. Well, okay, there are some problems in that. Same thing, Sharkjack. Sharkjack's kind of the same way. You got a, a embedded Linux on a little uh, um, little plug. You can plug that in, right? Maybe get that working. There's a few things I was having problems with. Um, the Sharkjack, the battery, the old style uh, Sharkjack had a battery, a little lithium battery, and it was problematic because they were small. They didn't last very long. Um, and if I went into a building, I, w I couldn't reliably turn it on and it worked. Um, the other thing is there's boot times associated with both of these devices, right? So unless I have them already powered on when I go in the building, there's an issue where it might not, you know, it, it, it might not be ready for me in time, especially if I'm like under escort or I'm being shown around, right? And I've only got 15 seconds or 20 seconds to make something happen. I don't have, you know, the, the boot time there that I want. So there were some issues I was kind of dealing with. I, I got down to where I had the shark jack open on my desk with like wires, uh, you know, so I could serial into it and actually program it, you know, at a lower level because I couldn't do what I wanted to at the script level. Um, and then that's when kind of, it hit me like, why am I doing all of this? I could solve this problem really easily with what I call prototype zero. All right, so the first time I ever did this uh, in the field, um, I walk into a room. Um, it was nice because I didn't, uh, we were able to get into the building, no problem. Uh, it was fairly open uh, and see a network jack. Well, the network jack was a TV mount network jack, which means it's about right here, okay? So I'm like, great. Like, I'm going to try my new trick. So I take, take my, my banjo, my non modular adapter there, plug it in, okay, and then grab my multimeter and then hold it up here and have my two leads and start stabbing at it, right, trying to get it. So it's like I need a third hand at this point or a fourth because I can't, like, do all of this at once. I'm trying to, like, find, you know, stab it, trying to, like, you know, get the leads to connect to that. It was, you know, I'm thinking in my head, it's like, oh, this would be great because if it's on the ground, I can just put the multimeter down. I can, you know, do everything. But it wasn't. It was like this high. So it went back to the shop. It's like, this is not going to work. I'm going to have something else. So look online, DIY. Look, Google it, DIY uh, uh, multimeter. What do we have? Well, there's a nice uh, setup for an Arduino um, at Circuit Basics that will let you build an ohm meter from, a, uh, from an Arduino. And so um, I was like, oh, this is fantastic, right? So built this out, and um, I didn't like the form factor. It was a little bit bigger than I wanted. Um, I had to have like a USB battery with it, had to hook it all up, um, and it was just a, a little kludgy. So um, uh, we had a tank load of these guys, so the Tink C4.0. Um, it uh, is a super fast microcontroller. It is way faster than anything I need for this, <laughs> for this particular uh, uh, sort of application. But um, it's one of those things where you look over in the bin and you see 50 of them and you're like, well, I guess that's the microcontroller we're going to use. Um, so kind of the second prototype of that was this. So the way this works is um, uh, there's a little pin there. It's a little three-volt pin uh, that uh, that re first resistor is connected to. And uh, what you do is power this guy up. That little three-volt pin will give you a little bit of voltage. R1 is there. It's a big honking resistor uh, to keep the current in check so it doesn't go down there and fry that coil. So that's a fairly big resistor on R1. Um, it'll go down and uh, hit R2, come back down the line, and then you'll see uh, at point 20 there, like uh, input number 20 on the, uh, on the Tinksy, um, that's where you take a voltage measurement. And the logic is very simple. If R2 exists at the end of the line, there'll be a measurable voltage at input 20. Okay, um, if that's the case, light the onboard LED. If R2 does not exist, then the reading zero volts and don't light the LED. Okay, so <clears throat> if I'm sending someone else into the building that's not me, that's not a technical person, I can say, okay, here's the device you need to plug in. 
here is this little thing. We made it look like a cigar almost, and it had little AAA batteries. And I would just tell them, plug it in the wall. If it turns orange, plug the other thing in. If it doesn't, find another one, right? Um, so, so, yeah, so I, I, I call it, uh, what's it uh, uh, um, you know, easy enough a trigger puller can do it. Um, but, uh, so, sorry. Um, but, yeah, so, like, so that was kind of the, uh, um, the idea. Uh, so I kind of, uh, as I kind of changed some jobs and stuff like that, uh, and um, I, now since I do skinny R&D full time, I was like, I need to revisit this and see, like, if there's anything else there we can do. So that came up with uh, Mr. Radar here. So uh, Mr. Radar is, um, it detects the presence of an end device on a switch. It determines if that device may be exclusively 10, 100 megabits capable. Um, it determines if power over ethernet is present. It determines the mode of power over ethernet and it determines all of this in under a second. So you plug this in, immediately you get a response. You get a series of blinking LEDs, you're good to go. And plug in what you got or you don't plug in, you keep moving. Um, this is the circuit, I'm not gonna dwell uh, much on this, just to say uh, that it's powered by three AAA batteries. Um, the microcontroller that runs everything is a Trinket M0. It's a little Adafruit uh, microcontroller that of course is out of stock because everything's out of stock. Um, but uh, the only reason I used it is because it had a minimum number of inputs and it's small, right? I just, I, I didn't wanna overdo anything. Um, all the resistors that you see there is two purposes, one, keep me from blowing up stuff at the switch and two to keep the switch from blowing me up right so all those resistors do is just calm the current down so that there's no major currents running in either direction so if I plug this into any type of Ethernet device I'm not going to harm it and likewise if there's some big nasty PoE thing on, on, on the line and I don't know about it like I'm not going to harm uh, this as well right um, the way it works is uh, there's a little three volt output on the Trinket M0. And uh, when you turn it on, it sends uh, some voltage down that three volt output and down two wires, uh, or two pairs, the orange pair and the brown pair. Um, if both of those uh, uh, are able to make that loop and that coil, those coils are present on both ends uh, at the end, uh, then what it'll do is it'll give you a little green light and say, okay, um, you have the potential for 10, 100 or gigabit on this particular line. However, if um, for whatever reason, maybe you're shooting into a device, it doesn't have to be a switch, maybe it's a VoIP phone, maybe it's an old uh, piece of hardware, and you don't get a return on the fourth pair, it'll hit, get you, hit you with an orange light and say, this is only 10, 100 megabits per second. So if your device that you're wanting to plug in needs the bandwidth, um, you'll know immediately that this is not a gigabit line, so you know, don't plug it in, right? So <clears throat> that's the way it kind of makes that determination. Um, so to kind of uh, show you uh, a little bit of a, how this works. All right, cool. So I've got a switch here. It's an old, uh, it's a Netgear switch. And um, this is Mr. Radar. So plug it in. If I plug into this switch, green light comes up and uh, immediately comes on. Unplug it, goes away. I have another device over here. This is a VoIP phone. Uh, it's a GXP 1450, 1405. Um, older VoIP phone. Plug it in, orange light. So it's a 10 uh, device. Um, the, uh, the pins for uh, gigabit aren't even in it. Right, so the coils aren't even in it. So, um, so it gives you that response instead. So, um, the, so that's how it works at the uh, switch detection level. Um, power over ethernet, there are three um, uh, power over ethernet modes, mode A, mode B, and four wire mode. Uh, mode A, um, the way it works, uh, well, let's say this, um, why would you wanna know it, right? Um, you can buy, uh, uh, for Raspberry Pis, you can buy power over Ethernet hats, right? So if you don't want to take your device and have it run on battery or wall power, um, there's a chance you could run your um, leave behind device off of the power over Ethernet power of the switch. Um, and so sometimes it might be helpful to know if the switch supplies it. It turns out, um, so there are t three different modes, four wire modes for high power cameras. 
um, mostly and for high powered routers and things of that nature. Um, mode A and mode B is what you'll see usually at the client level. The way mode A works is it sends DC power down the uh, orange and the green pair. Um, the way mode B works is normally you have an injector in there. So if you at your office and you look under your desk and you see a little box where Cat5 runs in and Cat5 runs out um, and then goes into a phone, that's an injector. And the injector uh, provides power on different pairs. It provides it on the blue and the brown pair, uh, pairs one and four. So it's different. Uh, thing about power over Ethernet is it operationally works at 48 volts. The polarity can be ambiguous, right? Um, so it could be negative, positive, can be all over the place. Um, PoE switches tend to have a polling voltage less than 48 volts, which means that if there's nothing plugged in and it's an empty, empty switch port, there's voltage there that's not 48 volts that differs from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, if it's mode A, it'll be on pairs two and three. If it's an injector, it'll be on one and four. Um, and uh, uh, PoE clients are suited to handle both mode A and mode B, so it doesn't matter all clients will, will handle both. That's what I need further research in because I'm finding that like Netgear and TP-Link, they seem to float around a nine to 20 volt like range. Um, there's another though uh, uh, switch that I've encountered at a time when I didn't have access to the closet that gave me one volt, like a solid one volt, not like a varying one volt, like like actually negative one volt. Um, and it, you know, so from port to port to port to port, right? So there is a way to fingerprint this. Um, it just, there needs to be some research and I need a wider net to cast essentially to make those deductions. Um, the, uh, the way that the, the PoE detection works is on the input where it detects the voltage, you actually have to artificially raise the voltage on that pin the reason is because if you get a negative voltage coming down the line polarity wise, it'll take it below that range. If you get a positive voltage polarity wise, it'll take it above that range. If you just left that input at zero, then anytime you got a negative voltage coming from the switch, you wouldn't be able to go below zero on these microcontrollers. A microcontroller doesn't measure things in volts, it measures things in uh, like uh, this particular microcontroller has a range of zero to 1024. And so 3.3 volts is 1,024, zero volts is zero. So what you do, the way this is set up, this little uh, circuit is set up, is you take the input and you artificially float it. I float it at like 270 millivolts. That way, if the, if the voltage coming in is negative, it drops it below the range. If it's positive, it pops it above the range. Um, and so you can detect voltage either way, right? Uh, so one side of it's got an input dedicated to mode A and looks on pairs two and three. Other side of it um, looks at uh, 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 mode B and looks at injectors and uh, it's an input just dedicated to pairs one and four. So um, all it does is sit there and look. So just kind of show you how this works real quick. Oh, that's freaky. There we go. Uh, yeah, so, um, so this is, uh, the way, if, if you end up getting um, power over Ethernet uh, and it's um, mode A, what will happen is you'll get a flat, fast blinking, I'll try to cover this up, you'll get a fast blinking red LED in the upper right hand corner. So, so it'll just blink there. Um, if you, that is weird, let's see if I can just, okay, cool. Yeah, um, if you have an injector, then what'll happen is that LED will blink slowly, okay? So green and orange for if the switch is there, fast blink for mode A, slow blink for mode B. Um, so uh, really simple in, ins and outs, right? Um, there, okay, great. Uh, real quick, uh, the code, right, um, there's uh, kind of uh, three major parts of the code, the inputs. So the way it does works is it starts off, it reads any analog voltage that's on the line to see if there's any power over Ethernet there. Uh, it, 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 once it gets that reading, it then turns on a digital input 
to send voltage down the line to check for the coils um, and it reads that when it comes back down or not if there's no coils there right um, after that uh, if the uh, coil uh, when you shot that DC voltage down the line it comes back if it's greater than a particular uh, level then it'll say hey there's definitely a coil there and it'll uh, blink this little uh, dot star LED, either green, I mean, not blink, but it'll turn on that green or that orange LED that you saw. Um, and, you know, the, whoever wrote the function strip.show um, for, for this, uh, kudos. Um, and then uh, uh, Mr. Radar POE detection logic. Uh, so um, if, uh, like I said, this thing floats, um, you know, like there's a value between zero and 1,024, it floats at a value of 90. And so if a negative voltage comes in, it drops it below that, that uh, 100 to 80 range. If it's positive, it goes above it. Um, big thing here, future development. Um, I need a larger test sample size. So if you're interested in this and this is something that you do on a regular basis, please see me. Um, I'd like to talk with you about maybe some, uh, maybe you trying some stuff out for me and see if like, uh, you know, what you're getting as far as, because I would like to, maybe there's a way to fingerprint um, devices at the end of the line. Um, uh, I'd like to integrate everything in single board. Um, I'm not really good at uh, uh, taking microcontrollers and flashing them from scratch and understanding that really well. Um, uh, I can use commercial ones decently, so um, uh, I'm trying to do that. Uh, housing, do need to get a housing for this thing, and uh, I don't have four-wire test mode in this thing yet, um, so that. But if you're interested in finding, uh, finding me anywhere, this is everywhere you can find me. Um, so Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, got a little YouTube channel where I've got tutorial stuff there. And, uh, and then the GitHub for Mr. Radar is live. So um, if you want to build it from scratch, there is uh, uh, KiCad files for the circuit board. Um, and there are uh, 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 firmware uh, INO, .ino files for Arduino IDE uh, there as well. So. Um, Cool, I think that is, uh, that's it. So I, I think we're down like two minutes. Um, so one or two questions, if you got them, be happy to answer them. All right, cool. If you want to talk, um, I'll be just outside the ring for a while after I clean up here, and you'll probably find me in the RF Village any other time. So uh, thanks for coming, and you guys have a good day. stuff out of the way of it. Can you, uh, can you turn it off for me?
So if you can create, if you care to play with it, I have enough uh, time. Hi, my name is Todd. Uh, USB-C? Yeah. Hey, Bob, do we have the USB-C adapter? Thank you. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll save you the pawn ticket. Detected it. I think it's configured right, but I think the projector is on like another channel or something. Yes. I can play with resolutions if you think it's something else. I did not know. Um, 1280 by 720 is right. Is that better? Um, no, I did not. I did not have a phone call. Do they have your, do you have a thumb drive with USB-C? Okay. Um, are there any more of these adapters in case that's a problem? Okay. All right. Uh, sh I do. about having network access. It's under Shmukon or? Okay. Or if you want the UPA or WPA, we can. Shmukon's easier.
Give me a second, I gotta upload this to S3. That's all right. Yeah, at least the connection's fast. What's the address? Okay, stream like a stream of water, bot like a robot. Okay. Uh, Didn't even recognize it. I mean, it was the last person was for. Maybe not. We'll see.
uh, it's not the converter, it's the, um, this stuff's going from HDMI to SDI, and then SDI distributing the distribution. And it's like all the conversion stuff is not working right. It's kind of annoying. Because this is direct HDMI here. All right. Um, whoop, whoop. Well, thanks everybody for your patience this morning. Um, I will dispense with the pleasantries and uh, just ask us to give a very warm Shmukon welcome to Travis Goodspeed. Howdy, everybody. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many of you remember the old timey shit like a Game Boy? All right, and how many of you remember um, this stuff called ROM, or read-only memory, back when it was read-only? Okay. So this photograph here is a mask ROM. And it is a photograph of a mask ROM that I made in my home laboratory. And if you zoom in on this photograph, you can see all of the ones and the zeros of the computer program. There are about 130,000 bits in here, about 96,000 of them are actually used, and at the very bottom of it, you can see that those dots are kind of missing. That's because there's a whole bunch of zeros at the end of the program. Um, you can also notice that at the very far right of the image, some of the columns are darker than others. Um, this is being clipped a little bit by the, the Windows machine, but the rightmost three columns are dark, and the one just to the left of them is very light. And if you flip that around, you get 1110, which is an E. And in ARM machine language, and I mean old timey ARM, this is ARM 6 before they added the thumb instruction set. In the old timey ARM instruction set, most instructions in a large program will begin with an E because ARM has conditional execution. When you do an if statement, rather than have a branch in ARM, you also have the option of skipping individual instructions based upon the comparator results. And that E is visible from even this distance, which is how we figure out what those bits mean. There are tools for working with these. Um, today I'm presenting you a new tool for converting the photograph into the physically ordered bits. After that, it is a separate problem to convert those bits into logically ordered bytes. And that will only be loosely covered in this lecture, but is covered in other areas such as John McMaster's Zorom project. All right, so to quickly review, um, Flash ROM and EEPROM are both, you know, even though they have ROM in the name, they are writable. And they're electrically writable. A and these are great for code that changes a lot. When you want to make an embedded system and you want to make two copies of your own homebrew game, Flash ROM is excellent for that. It's also excellent for storage in your cell phone. When you take a photograph, nobody else on earth has that photograph so there is no need to make it cheaply mass producible. Mask ROM is the total opposite. It is programmed at the semiconductor design stage in one of the masks that forms the microchip. And making those masks is horrifically expensive. So that ROM will not be unique to that chip. Your minimum orders will be in hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And you will have nothing unique to an individual device. 
But this also makes it cheap for doing very high quantities of things that are absolutely identical, which is what we do in mass production. And because they're valuable there, it's a very good target for reverse engineering. These are used in smart cards in order to store the ROM that runs like the lower level operating system of the card. These are used in video games. If you're making a bajillion Mario cartridges, you might as well use a mask ROM rather than uh, reprogrammable memory because you're never going to reprogram that cartridge. Um, the other great thing about these is that we can photograph them. We can chemically process the chip, understand what's inside of it, see the ones and the zeros, and then extract them. And this gives us a rather direct way to reverse engineer even very different targets. Um, we don't need a software bug. We don't need um, a backdoor that allows us to read the memory. Um, we don't even know how to talk to the chip, and we don't even need the chip to work. This works on broken chips. And that, that makes it great for getting the software out of these targets. Um, here is a photograph of one of the ROMs that we'll be covering today. If I zoom in a little, um, you can kind of see that there are these spots that are blue. And those blue spots indicate a bit. And if there's no blue spot, then the, there's no bit there. So what my software does is it converts that into uh, marked bits. So wherever you see a blue or a red square, my software has identified that at that location there is a bit, and the red ones indicate ones and the blue ones indicate zeros. The little green one is me correcting a mistake in the software. Like any form of computer-aided drawing, you wind up with mistakes in your annotation, and it's very important to figure out how to effectively deal with those in order to get a clean or hopefully perfect image. Um, there's, shit. Okay, everybody look at the left screen. There we go. So there are a couple of different tools for, for doing this sort of work. The first one to be published was Rompar by Adam Lorry. And ROMPAR allows you to mark a uh, grid, and then within the grid, it identifies all the bits. Um, Bitracked by Chris Gerlinski works in a similar way. And my tool is a replacement for those two projects. Um, there are also tools required for converting the physical bits into logical bytes, because the chip manufacturers are not putting these in the same order that you would write the bits with pen and paper. And we have to correct for that. Uh, Zorom by John McMaster is probably the best tool for this. It's a Python library that allows you to solve for a decoding if you can guess at some of what some of the bytes are. Um, Bit Viewer by Chris Gerlinski is an interactive graphical tool that allows you to sort of mark up your beliefs about the chip and see what the bytes would be until they begin to make sense. Um, all right, so let's dive into the chemical side of things and see how these chips are reverse engineered. The first thing you need is a big old jug of nitric acid. This is 65%, which is rather easy to acquire. Um, it's a bit faster if you use red fuming nitric acid, but it has some, um, some disadvantages, like uh, it will detonate if you mix it with isopropyl alcohol, and that's bad. Um, it also has this problem that it really loves to eat through bottle caps, including the black bottle cap that you see on this bottle. Um, I don't think that this vendor sells red fuming nitric anymore. Um, so we start with two chips. This technique works on through-hole chips, but through-hole chips have a lot more plastic on them. So you would really prefer to do this with the surface mount version of the chip if you have an option. Um, I take my 65% nitric acid, I put a little bit of it over the chip in a beaker, and I heat the beaker. The green that you see here comes from the ground plane of the package, the little ground pad on the very bottom dissolving. Um, the metal then buffers the reaction, and if you have too much metal, this will slow down or take forever to run. 
So if you're doing a through-hole chip or even a TSSOP with the legs coming out, you want to clip them off in order to have less metal to deal with. Uh, boil it for a while, and then eventually I get the glass out. I drop the glass into acetone, and then I shake the acetone in an ultrasonic jewelry cleaner. Um, this knocks all of the crud off, and then I can clean it again with isopropyl alcohol to get my bare dye. And the bare dye here is teeny tiny. Like, these things are very small, both for manufacturing and for yield reasons. You really want to be able to make as many of these from your wafer as possible, and you want any defect in the wafer to be contained within a single bad chip, so you try to keep your chips being as small as you can possibly design them to be. Uh, I then put that in my handy-dandy microscope, and on my handy-dandy microscope, I can see the surface of the chip. This is a metallurgical microscope, which means that the light comes down through the column and through the lens, and it also means that the lens needs to be ground in a way that the light will pass through it twice. Um, a given photograph might look like this, and then I'll take many of them. I slide the chip, and I get a second photograph and a third, and for large chips or high magnification, I need a lot of these photos. It's not uncommon for me to take more than 100 of either a chip itself or the ROM that I'm trying to extract. After I have them, there's this trick of aligning them. Um, if, you think of have, if you think of the one chip followed by its successors, right, or the one photo followed by its successors, they kind of overlap a bit. So the first one is followed by the second one, which is followed by the third one. And then I can stitch all three of those together in order to get a large panorama photo in which all of the details are clear and crisp. Um, the software for doing this is called Huggin. Um, it and a few scripts make it rather painless as long as I do not have a target that is photographically repeated. Um, this is important because many of these system-on-chip devices will have multiple copies of the same organ. For example, we'll look at a cryptographic chip later that has uh, a lookup table in order to do the cryptography. But it has one for encryption and a separate one for decryption of the same table in order to be able to perform both operations at the same time in full duplex. Um, there is no way for the computer to know that a high resolution photograph of the left copy of this organ is different from the right copy of this organ. And so those sometimes have to be manually marked up by uh, overlapping features, which are these little colored dots that you see. And at the end of this, you get a complete image of the chip or of the ROM. Um, the next trick that you need to do is called delayering. So that photograph was at the very top of the chip. Unfortunately, very few ROM images are visible from the very surface of the chip maybe 20% of them. And all of the rest, you need to delayer the chip and sometimes even stain the difference between P-silicon and N-silicon in order to get a working photo. Um, the chemical for doing this is very dangerous. It's called hydrofluoric acid, and if you speak to any professional chemist, they will tell you to stay the hell away from it. You can also buy this at Lowe's as a rust stain remover. I love living in America, by the way. In Europe, all of this stuff would be a lot more complicated. Um, one of the complications of this totally safe over-the-counter rust stain remover is that it dissolves glass. So you can't use a glass beaker or the glass itself will dissolve in the chemical acid. So you have to use a plastic beaker. Um, and this being like the surface photo of another chip, if I zoom in on it, there are all of these little filler patterns that kind of hide what's in the background. And that's the sort of stuff that I'm trying to get away, uh, trying to get rid of. I'm trying to get rid of the top few metal layers. I'm trying to get rid of everything that obscures vertically the piece of the chip that I want to photograph. Um, so this being the surface of the chip, if I run it through one bath of hydrofluoric acid, most of that top is gone, and if I do a second bath, it's now completely gone, and I can see details of the chip that were previously hidden. And this is at low magnification. When you're very close in on the chip, it, it, it hides a lot more. Um, in particular, if you have a transistor 
and the metal that connects the transistor is above the transistor, which is how chips are normally laid out, then the metal will also cover the piece of the transistor that tells you whether or not it works. And a mask ROM is very often built in what's called the diffusion layer by either putting in the, the little piece that makes a functioning transistor or leaving it out. And all of the broken transistors are zeros and all of the working transistors are ones. But the metal covers it and that's why we need to do this delayering operation. Um, so when we do the extraction, um, prior tools had this concept of a grid. And the grid was built up because the CAD software that designs these ROMs, in many of the ROMs will place everything on a perfect grid except that some of the columns are unused. And then um, your sampling software can then pre-process the image. It can maybe do edge extraction or color conversion. I do mine a little differently. My operator, the, the human operator running the program, will draw row and column lines. And wherever the lines intersect, that is a bit position. And the lines themselves can be freely moved or deleted or edited. Um, so if your pictures are imperfect, if there's a bit more of a gap than there should be, if there's just a little bit of stretching or tearing, my software is pretty resilient to that. Um, the tool will also help out with making sure that this work was done correctly. So in my tool, I specify a color threshold that tells me the difference between a one and a zero because the ones are, are darker. Um, so I have design rule checks that look for things that are too close to the threshold. As in, if, if I say that anything with a green value of more than 127 is a one, well, Anything that's at like 128 or 129 is probably too close to that to be trustworthy. So the software can warn me of that and I can go to that part of the photograph and correct that part of the photograph maybe by moving the line a little or maybe by looking at it myself and saying, software, I know that you think this is a one but I can visually see that this is a zero with some dirt on it so I'm going to force it to being a zero. Um, the software also takes care of importing bits from other projects. So if I have 130,000 bits and I need them all to be accurate and I have like a 0 0.01 error rate, that's still pretty high, but I won't have the errors in the same bit positions. So I can take three chips and I can do the chemical processing on all three, I can photograph all three, and then I can combine those three photographs not by merging them photographically, but by annotating all of the bits in each of them, loading up a project, and then asking which ones are different and adjusting them until they all agree. So here is the first chip that we're going to reverse engineer. Um, I was inspired to buy these by Ken Sharif, who does a lot of microchip reverse engineering. Um, this is a greeting card microchip from 1988. And uh, this would also be used in like cheap doorbells. And the idea is that um, this chip only has three pins. You give it power and ground, and then it gives you a pre-recorded melody. Uh, in the case of this image, it is for release by Beethoven. And if you look closely at this projector, you can see all of the ones and the zeros on the right side of the chip. And you could even take a photograph with your cell phone and then reverse engineer it from the cell phone photograph. We're gonna zoom in a little bit. Here are some of the bits. And you can see that there's this grid of uh, like green lines. And then wherever they cross, there's either like um, a square with two blobs on the side or there's a rectangle without blobs. And the squares of the blobs are the ones. So what we can do is in my CAD tool, I draw a line. I draw first horizontal rows through all of the bits. And then I do the same for columns. So if you look at these crossings, at each crossing point, you in your own head should either say there's a blob there or there's no blob there. As we go down from the top, we have 0, 0, 1, 1. And the software can then identify those bit positions. And it could do this for all of the bits within the ROM. 
we're telling it where the rows and the columns are. It's telling us where the bits are. We then call up this little dialog, which gives us a histogram of the bits. And in this histogram, in this histogram we see that blue does not have a very big gap between our ones and our zeros. There's just one mountain top in blue. In green, we see two mountain tops with a little gap between them. And in red, we see two mountains with a very big gap between them. This tells us that green is not the color that we want to interpret. And blue is definitely not the color that we want to interpret. It's probably red. So first setting the threshold in green, I'm now saying that green is my difference. If it is darker than 91, it is um, a one, and if it is brighter than 91, it is a zero. But if you look at this arrow, we see a red dot where there should be a blue one. It has misidentified this bit. And if you look around a bit, it does this a lot. And the reason is that the, um, the green color channel is not a great way to separate these things. So if we then move to the red color channel, we see that all three of those bits are now correct. The zeros become blue and the reds become one. We all, yes? Yes, so as I have my dialog box open, I set the threshold by dragging a slider. And as I drag the slider live, I see all of the bits readjust themselves. And so visually, I will pick out a couple of bits that I know need to be zeros. And as I slide it, I wait for them to flip over. Or I'll do the same for ones. Um, and doing this visually, I can get a pretty good check for the majority of the bits. Where this will go wrong is where a bit of dust comes in or maybe my chip is damaged. Um, I'm not doing the chemistry in a clean room. I'm doing it in what used to be my upstairs kitchen. And so the dust gets around. Not everything is perfectly clean. So I also need the software to help me out with design rule checks. So this is where it goes through and it, it tells me that there is a problem whenever a bit is too close to the threshold and has not been forced. Forcing is where um, I use a key combination to tell the software, look, I know you believe this is a one, but I'm a person in my opinion matters more. It's actually a zero. Uh, or I can tell it like, hey, you think this is a one. You're telling me that it's too close to the threshold. I'm telling you that you got it right and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, it also looks for inconsistent row count. So I have all of these bits and they're in columns and rows. And I wrote this algorithm that kind of sorts them by their X order and then their Y order and figures out how they line up. Um, if that algorithm ever goes wrong, then the number of row, uh, the number of columns in a given row will be different from the other rows. And so we can highlight that as an error to tell me that I made a, either I made a mistake there or the algorithm got confused there. It also looks for overlapping bits. If I place the same, you know, I'm, I'm placing a lot of these lines and I'm kind of doing it on autopilot. My, my crosshair tilts to show me where it's going and I'm just moving my mouse down and I'm tapping the space bar in order to mark these things. As I do that, if I hit the space bar twice instead of once, I will have two rows in exactly the same position, which means that I will have um, two rows with exactly the same bit positions, which visually I will not notice, but the software will recognize that for me and warn me about it. Um, here is the design rule check feature where the software warns me about the bit errors. So here it's telling me that this particular bit is ambiguous meaning that it's very close to the threshold. And we can see here that even though the rest of the bits in this photograph are identified correctly, that one bit is mistakenly a zero even though it should be a one. Um, and for each of these bits, it will, the, the display will then bounce to the local position so that I know which one the software is talking about even though I have 130,000 or something to choose through. Yes? Great, great question. So the question is, am I looking at that exact position or am, am I averaging for a region? 
By use of class inheritance in C++, I can change the behavior later. So I began a lot of this with the fastest thing to implement, and then I filled in the pieces that gave me trouble. Like my alignment algorithm was initially very slow. I had a project that you'll see later that was taking half an hour to compile uh, by alignment to extract the bits. And so I rewrote that algorithm in order to make it fast. In the same way, uh, at some point, I will probably move to a strategy of, if not averaging a lot of pixels, at least taking like a, a group of four or something. Until then, I found that doing a single location has been pretty good for accuracy. Um, I'm not finding that I need to pre-process the image or that I need to add the OpenCV library or something expensive like that. Um, I found that just looking at the pixel position, grabbing the red, green, val red, green, blue triplet, and then uh, picking the threshold there has been rather accurate. Um, one trick that I do, though, is that I have infinite resolution. All of the coordinates that I use in the software entirely and without exception are floating point rather than integer. So uh, my lines can have a, an angle that is sharper than the pixels would allow. Um, this allows me to very carefully choose where the given uh, values are sampled. And this also allows me to see that, um, you know, very often I'll, I'll see like errors in a row and then I know that the row line position is the problem rather than the individual bit values or positions. Um, and as, as I correct these, my design rule check violations go away and then eventually I have no violations within the project. Um, I also uh, support exporting this in a number of formats. So I can take this thing and I can convert it to ASCII art, which is sort of the standard protocol for sharing MassGrom data. Um, going back 20 years, you would have a text file with just one and zero letters along the row and matching the physical layout, and then you would write a script that would convert it. I also support comma separated value because I often work with students and students have this weird thing where people are poisoning their minds and telling them to use MATLAB. And comma separated value is very easy to import into MATLAB. You can also do um, like JSON if you wanted to like graph out the bit positions or do a poster or something. Uh, you can do a Python array and you can do um, like a high resolution screenshot even though you could never have that much resolution on your screen. Uh, with all of the objects rendered in the right positions. Um, I've also begun supporting a couple of different ROMs that I'm working with. Um, Mark IV is a four-bit architecture by Atmel that was in Adam Laurie's initial uh, publication of his ROMPAR tool. And because that's like an easy chip to get started with and does not require delayering, I added support for it so that you can begin playing with this at home without dealing with the chemicals that will rot your bones. Um, only the ones that will burn your skin. Um, I also support uh, an ARM6 chip that I'll show you later. Writing these decoders is never hard after you know the ordering of the bits, but it is frighteningly frustrating before you know the ordering of the bits. John McMaster has been trying to solve this problem with his Zorom tool in that he has a solver where you can tell the tool that you have these bits extracted from, say, my, my tool, you've got the bits, and you think that the first byte is C0 and the second byte is 0, 0, and then it will run through and try every different way of flipping the image and of rotating the image and of decoding it in different ways and trying to, to find an ordering that makes sense for the data that you provided. This works for about half of chips, and it's possible that with a bit more work it could handle a lot more than that. Um, the ASCII output looks like this. Um, again, if you have these bits, you should be able to play for release by Beethoven in like a shitty synthesizer style. Um, all of this is photographic, so all of the data is available within the photographs. Um, here we have the here we have the ROM from a Game Boy. 
Um, all of the bits were marked on here in a matter of minutes, and every one of those bits was accurate when I decoded it. Um, the MD5 hash is exactly the same as the hashes from when others have extracted the same ROM. Um, a couple of design tricks. The, the rows and the columns are just lines within QT's graphics framework. Um, the bits are just rectangles, and this allows me to use all of QT's performance advantages. Like, I can switch this over to rendering in OpenGL by changing very little code. Um, the rendering is also very fast. Even though I have a very high resolution screen, even though I'm, I'm sliding around this thing, I very often ha hit pauses or have it slow down on me. Um, my alignment algorithm is that I take all of the bits and I sort them by their x-coordinate. And when you do that, you get the very leftmost column, you just get those bits out of order. Um, and for any given row, you should see the first one before the second one and so on. Um, so by sorting them in this order and running through it quickly, I'm able to make this uh, align the project in milliseconds rather than in minutes. And that allows me to very quickly run my test cases, export to files, without interrupting the operator or having to put like a please wait for me dialog up. And the, the speed of the operator and the re reducing the frustration of the operator allows you to get these bits out a lot faster um, and with a lot less hassle. Um, and, the most important, and the most important decision I made was that I, from the very beginning, I supported both a GUI and a command line interface which means that I have a make file with test cases for every one of my projects. And as I change things about the project, I know that they continue to work. Um, this allows me to run all of the design rule checks. This allows me to do all of the importing and the exporting and the comparison. Everything that you can do from the GUI, you can also do from the command line. Um, I'm going to show you two last chips in my, um, remaining minutes. This here is the MYK78, which is the Clipper chip. In the 1990s, the Clinton administration decided that they were going to be cool and they were going to allow us to have cryptography, but they wanted a government backdoor in it. Um, Matt Blaze did a ton of work with this back in the day. He found out that a successor to the Clipper chip called the Capstone that we'll talk about in a minute had a cryptographic problem that allowed you to fake being a part of the key escrow network while not actually revealing your key escrow packet to the authorities. Um, this is the clipper chip. If we zoom in a little, there are these two organs in the bottom left. These are wrongs. We zoom in on one of them, we can see the bits. It's got like a little wiggly thing and it's either, there's either a dark spot on the top or on the bottom of each row. Those are our bits. And we can mark them and we can extract them. And when the Clipper chip came out in 1993, it used an algorithm called Skipjack that was not declassified until 1998. So nobody knew how this algorithm worked or how to be compatible with it or how to re-implement it. It has since been published and this is a great situation because we can see what was secret compared against what five years later was no longer a secret with full documentation. And if you take these bits and you shuffle them in the right order, you will find that they are the F table from Skipjack that was classified at the time of the chip's distribution. So it was possible to learn what later was revealed, but at the time was secret by reverse engineering this chip. Uh, another valuable thing to have is something called the family key. In the clipper chip key escrow style, if I make a call to say my buddy Ozzy there, and I say, hey Ozzy, let's do a secret phone call. I hit the button and that means that my device is responsible for giving our session key to the authorities. We do our little uh, key sharing dance. We then have a session key. And I encrypt that session key with my own um, device key that the authorities have a copy of. So the government can decrypt it, but uh, Ozzy can't, none of the rest of you can. But Ozzy needs to know that I gave our 
key to the authorities. So I wrap all of this up in the family key, which was not published, but which Ozzy's device can, can decrypt. And by doing that, he can then look at a hash of our session key and know that my device is snitching on us. Now snitches get stitches, so let's see how this works under the hood. This is the Forteza card which contained the successor to the Clipper chip. Um, it's sometimes called the Capstone chip, although there might have been two. This is the MYK82. We then look at the die of it. The die is pretty cool. It's a lot bigger. It's a, a finer process. On the top right, we have an ARM6 CPU, which was very sophisticated for the time. You know, this CPU only came out in 1992. On the left, we have the main ROM, and at the top, we have lookup tables that contain the same skipjack tables that we saw on the Clipper chip. If we zoom in on the main ROM, we see bits. You've got the top ones, you've got the bottom ones, they're darker than the, the others. And if we zoom out, we see a whole bunch of bits. And if I go to the far right, you will see that um, on the far right side, the rightmost column is entirely dark, and the column to its left, the right side is dark, and the left side is bright. Imagine that backward, so the, the very most significant bits are on the right. That is one, 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 zero, which is an E, which is what most ARM6 instructions begin with because that means that the instruction is unconditionally executed. So knowing that, we can then look backward. We can figure out that all of the words are written right to left. We can write them down and then we can figure out their order based upon whether, like, when the output of one operation is consumed as the input of the next operation. It turns out that in the same way that the bits are written with right to left, the words are also written right to left. So on any given row, the rightmost bit is the first word and then the after that second. This allows us to decode the program, so we get all the 32-bit words out. Um, here in my code, you see the words for row zero and then row one, and it goes all the way down for 130,000 of these things. This is the C++ code that decodes it. This is Binwalk telling us that it's definitely ARM instructions, meaning that we did some stuff right. And then we loaded up an IDA Pro and we can reverse engineer an NSA design from the early 90s just by photographing it. If you would like this tool, the tool is available for free on GitHub. It will redirect you if you go to maskromtool.com. And um, that's my lecture and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm looking for advice here. Do we have time for a question or are we done? We have time for two questions. Yes. Oh, great question. So uh, the question is, as I'm delayering a chip, how do I know how far I've gone in order to stop the reaction and stop the chip at the right point? So there is a fancy science way to do this, which is that you preheat the acid to a known temperature, and then um, with the acid at the known temperature, the amount of time should create the same etching on a given chip. The complications here are that different chips that I work with are from very different generations. And being from different generations, they have different thicknesses. Um, so at the end of the day, what I do is I put five chips into the acid and I take one out every 10 minutes. Or I start the acid and I add a new chip every 10 minutes. And then when I get the chips out at the end, I can sort them by how far it's burned down in order to find the chip that is at the best level. Um, it's also a lot more forgiving than I ever expected. Uh, very often, I will just throw the chip in for half an hour and find out that I'm seeing the right layer. Um, this will, of course, become harder as technologies improve, and this technology does not work very well when the bits are smaller than the wavelength of light. And I'm done. Thank you kindly, everybody. I'll be around the conference, and see you there.
I started doing this when you had to reconfigure x11.conf on stage. Yeah. I'm just going to use the slides for a moment to. Is it working? All right. It would kind of like toggle. Yeah. this an appropriate height for me. <laughs> I'm good. I did bring power, but I shouldn't need, I'll do it. I'm Holt. I'm Trixie. I'm introducing you. Cool. Is there anything I should or shouldn't say? I don't remember what I wrote still? for this sheet. Okay. It's all accurate, so. <laughs> right on. I'm just going to check. Yeah. That should be sufficient. Is it okay Great. if I shift here first? Yeah, do whatever you want.
if I have time for all of that. <laughs> yeah, here uh, I'm also not thinking, so like you have plenty of keys to draw from in terms yeah. of potential content. I did it as an outline and I filled it out and I did a chalk based on the outline and it's now on the screen. Oh, Good afternoon, ShmooCon. Hope things are going well for you today. I'm Holt Sorensen, one of the Shmoo, and I have a pleasure to introduce to you just here in a minute, Tracy. Um, let's see. Please do continue to keep your masks on. Uh, let's see. And we also have more swag boxes and. Or swag boxes and other things at Reg. Um, Tracy, you can follow her at Hacker Pinup, is based in New York and is a security research engineer at Trenchant, formerly Azimuth, and she's going to talk to you about uh, cell phone networks. So I'll get out of the way because we've already taken a little bit of our time and let her get started. Well, ah, this is fun. So give me one second here and see what's up with this. So 
sorry, yeah, it was all queued up. You know, this is how live theater, live performance in general is just gonna go. So, uh, yeah, right? It says it right there. I knew something was gonna happen. Let me pull this over here. Yeah, but I need to see my speaker notes and they're not showing up over here. Well, and I don't have an external mouse, so I'm just trying to do this with the, could I use some assistance? No. Well, yeah, they unfortunately were. No, wrong way, is that what? Well, so the good news is we can just skip who I am, I guess, and jump into the network. All right, I'm just gonna take matters into my own hands. So, cause there's a lot to cover here. And I promise I'm not gonna just try and smush everything together. So, would that work? Absolutely not, cool. Awesome, okay. Well, it's only five minutes, sorry about that. I like the way she's sit thinking. Okay. Let's move this one over. Here again. Uh, awesome. That's much better. So I'm Tracy, and now we're friends, so that's cool. Um, and as you can probably see in my speaker notes, I was saying that I'm a little nervous because this is my first talk at ShmooCon. Um, woo! So I'm trying to think of it as just another opening, another show. So quickly, who am I? Uh, despite what this says, I'm not Jean Valjean. I know they already did an intro for me. I work at uh, Trenchant, formerly Azimuth. I've got about nine years of experience in telco, and I've split my time mostly doing reversing and embedded dev. I had to submit for ShmooCon this year because of the theme because my first degree is actually in theater performance with a vocal performance minor. So I was doing musical theater professionally for many, many years, and now I mostly do computer engineering. But theme was too perfect, I couldn't resist. So why should you care about cellular networks, right? I think it's pretty obvious. There's a lot of reasons, but really, mostly, you can't avoid cellular devices. We have them in our cars, we have them on our wrists and our pockets. Everywhere we go, we have to rely on cellular networks. So understanding them is gonna be pretty cool. I also need to say, disclaimer, is that everything here is public information. I'm not gonna say anything groundbreaking or anything proprietary. But one reason I wanted to give this talk is because like so many times, even in cellular network diagrams, there's just like a blob that's like core network. And you, not everyone knows what's in that. So in this talk, I'm actually gonna talk about things that are in the whole network, the whole architecture, as well as some known attack vectors. And again, all of the attacks are publicly known, nothing secret here, but now you might know what you're actually looking for if you wanna learn more. So what to cover? So this quote from Spelling Bee was too apt, had to use it. So we're gonna lay out, telegraph to telephone very quickly. Very quickly. <laughs> 0G and 1G, analog cell phones, mobile telephony circuit switched. I'm gonna cover all those terms. We're gonna go through 2G in terms of GSM, GPRS, 3G in the form of UMTS, LTE, 4G, and 5G. And all of those generations from 2G forward, I'm gonna cover some public attack vectors. So here is my favorite image. It's great and I, I unabashedly stole it from the cellular network's Wikipedia page. And you'll see here our path forward and what we're gonna talk about. So we're gonna start with NMTS, amps, and move forward. Uh, and you see how it's mostly on that line at the bottom. At the bottom below that, we have about a timeline. So you can see when these generations were actually happening. And you'll notice at the top, it says like 1G, 2G, 3G. And those are generations of cellular evolution, right? So 
this, you'll see that it's 1G, and then below that you have all these other acronyms. And those other acronyms are also specifications. So we have our generation specification, and then our implementation of a different specification for that generation. So let's cover some background first. Have you heard of the all-American prophet, Bell? So I'm gonna zoom through a lot of this, but first of all, we're gonna start in 1830, when the telegraph was invented. And the telegraph was like a huge deal because it could cover long distances uh, with, and it proved that we could send a signal over wire over long distances. Super great, but there was only one message per line. And so there were a bunch of inventors racing to get improvements on this telegraph because it, businesses are involved and they wanna get real-time communications, right? So here comes Bell with his background in audiology and musical instruments, and he's like, oh, well, we can just do multiple harmonics, right? That makes sense. So Bell invented this telephone, which is great. So telephone's invented, and then we have to have a network of telephones, right? So before cellular, we had our landline. So POTS is our plain old telephone service, and this is your regular old telephone, right? What most people think of when you hear the word landline. So it's connected over a local loop provided by some telecommunications provider. And POTS, the best thing to think about is that it is a service. So sometimes people use POTS and PSTN interchangeably, which is not quite correct. PSTN is our public switch telephone network, and it's landline network made up of copper telephone lines. Great. So we have our network, which is our PSTN, and the service that's provided on that network, which is POTS. So they're slightly different, but they really are related. And then I put this picture of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel because it's a wonderful show, but also because it's really um, helpful for me, at least, to really think about the term circuit switched, to imagine these old time switchboards where people would literally take the cable and connect from one place to the other. So when I say things like an unbroken chain or an unbroken line or circuit switched, it's really helpful to think about these old devices and physically changing that. So zero G, what does that even mean? So zero G is gonna be our like intro to cellular. We have things like push to talk, mobile telephone service, we have radio common carrier. So zero G, we have no singular standard. It's all over the place. Some systems are two-tone sequential paging, some are DTMF. We have like no one thing. So it's obviously not built to actually scale. So then we have 1G. I know we're racing along here. <laughs> so we have 1G, still analog. And this was a big deal. So we're gonna start talking about AMPS, which is Advanced Mobile Phone System. And this was also created by Bell Labs. So in the 1970s, this starts coming around and AMPS starts using multiple frequencies for the same conversation. So they start really implementing things like channels, which are really helpful in cellular. Um, and then this beautiful thing on the, I guess your left, is gonna be the Dynatac 8000X. And this is considered the first cell phone. And it's considered that, because technically there were other inventions, but this is the first time it's actually commercially available. So this is the first time just a random person can buy, oh boy, <laughs> can buy a cell phone. And this relied on the AMPS network, which is why I put it under the AMPS section. And these are old technologies, but they're still used fa until fairly recently. So AMPS was happening in North America, and at the same time, in the Nordic countries, we had the Nordic mobile telephony. And this was similar to AMPS, but it wasn't very popular. And some of you who are less familiar with telecommunications maybe need a refresher of what big vendors might be out in the Nordic spaces, and that's most notably our Ericsson and Nokia. So they're laying some really great groundwork for actual, um, more cellular what we think of today. So the cool thing, and cool from an attacker perspective, about the Nordic mobile telephony system, they had no encryption whatsoever. So you could just stand out there with a scanner and listen to people's phone calls. Um, eventually they started selling scanners with that frequency band blocked, but uh, yeah, that's pretty fun. <laughs> so 2G. 2G is gonna, uh, here we are in our timeline. We're just starting to be in the 90s. We've already covered NMT and AMPS, so we're chugging right along. So 2G in the form of GSM. And I, I know that I just said old tech matters. I even just referenced that in 1G. But a lot of things can fall back to 2G or 3G still to this day. So 2G still matters. 
This is where we get tec uh, texting and calls, and we finally have like some standards. Um, we have these actual global organizations that are getting together to discuss what's going to actually last and what's a reasonable standard. So let's talk about the network architecture. So we have our mobile equipment or our mobile station. And this is the device with, any, with the cellular functionality for 2G. This is what you think of that you're holding in your hand, right? You are the mobile station with this phone. Then we have our radio access network. And this is what most people think about when you think about like antennas and baseband units and radios, right? Our, our radio access network in 2G is the same as our base station subsystem. And the base station subsystem contains one or more base transceiver stations and then a base station controller. So you have your mobile endpoint, your mobile station, which then reaches out to this base transceiver station that does some, uh, that's what you think of as the antenna and has a usually like a little shed next to it to do some of the processing. And then that hands it off to a base station controller. Base station controller controls a bunch of different base stations. So let's look at what this looks like visually. We have our mobile endpoint and then that reaches out to a base transceiver station, which then reaches out to a base station controller. Sorry about that color. And that's all part of our base station subsystem. So that's the front part of our network, right? So that's the part before the core network. So I wanted to show you what these looked like so you had some sort of grounding. Uh, that's gonna be a 2G cell phone, a base transceiver station, and a base station controller. These things are very large. So moving from that front part of our network diagram into our core network, we're gonna have a couple more devices to talk about. We have our mobile switching center, which handles our call switching and uh, most of our mobility management, uh, handover, registration, authentication. And it does that. You see how it has those four blobs above it? What you really need to remember from this is those are all registers, which are really just big databases that contain specific information. So those are our home location register, which is a large database of information for local users. So that's gonna have our activity, status, location, et cetera, for non-roaming users. Then we have our visitor location register, and this is the whole, like we had home, now we have visitor, right? These are gonna be our roamers. We also have authentication center, where authentication in 2G is not so much a thing, but we do still have uh, verification of our SIM card, so this is where you keep your puke and your PIN and all that fun stuff. And then we have our equipment identity register, which is a large database of valid equipment on the network. So only valid IMSIs and MSISDNs can actually connect to the network because we have this register to check those devices. So again, I'm using the actual terms for these, but really they're just, a, just large databases of what should be connecting to this and so we know our home and visiting people. So when a device goes from an M one MSC's territory to another, the VLR, the visitor location register, and the home location register are gonna do a lot of communicating, right? Most of the concepts of cellular rely on the fact that you're gonna be moving around. So those two devices still need to communicate a lot and reach out to the remainder of the network so that everyone can keep track of who is where. And then the MSC is gonna hand off a bunch of information to our global mobile switching center, which is our last hop before that gets to the public network. So let's take a look at what that is. We're gonna go through step by step one more time. So a user would speak into your 2G capable device, that's our mobile station. Then that gets sent to our base transceiver station and our base station controller, which are part of our base station subsystem. That's then gonna go into our core network, which contains our mobile switching center and our global mobile switching center. And remember that our mobile switching center has all of those registers. And this is a mobile switching center. So uh, the scale of these things is pretty large. So that's 2G. So let's talk about some GSM attack vectors. So there's no mutual authentication. So GSM requires the handset, yeah, the handset to authenticate with the network, but not vice versa. So this is how IMSI catchers can come about. So what happens is, yeah. So you essentially an IMSI catcher is you stand an attacker standing up a rogue base transceiver station. So when an IMSI 
is broadcast. It happens from the mobile station. And MZ contains a bunch of information, including your mobile network operator, so your carrier, your Sprint, your whatever, uh, your mobile country code, and a bunch of other identifiers. So <clears throat> from this uh, a type of attack where you have, so a well, mobile station is broadcasting this MZ out, right, all the time. So it needs to connect to the closest slash strongest signal for base transceiver station. So if an attacker poses as the strongest signal, as the closest base transceiver station, they'll start getting that MZ broadcast to them, right? So because there's no mutual authentication in this network, what happens is an attacker comes in as a big, as a rogue base transceiver station and gets that information from the MZ. Now, an attacker can choose to just drop that, like in black hole it, and not send it on to the network, or they can choose to try and authenticate with the network by using like an, a location update request. So the actual base transceiver station requests some information from the mobile endpoint, from the mobile station, and all a rogue base transceiver station has to do is ask the mobile endpoint for that same information and then pass it right back on to the legitimate base transceiver station. And voila, you have a beautiful <coughs> person in the middle attack, lovely. So you can intercept outgoing calls, SMS, and the fun thing is that the base transceiver station is actually what determines the encryption scheme. So an attacker can just be like, oh, JK set it to A50, we're not gonna encrypt anything. There are also known weaknesses in A51 and A52, which are other GSM uh, encryption mechanisms. And there are some other fun things to do. So GSM is notoriously weak, so we're just gonna move right on to GPRS because it's probably my favorite. So here we are in our timeline, speeding right along. And this is happening in America at the end of the millennium. And you'll see that GPRS is like this weird cutout in this diagram. And that's because it really is 2.5G. And we're gonna talk about what that means. It's general packet switched radio. So until this, all the technologies we've seen have been circuit switched. And that means, remember, like unbroken chain and it's older technology, right? Now, in GPRS, what we're going to see is GSM and then an IP implementation slapped on top of that. So we have these two types of technologies working together at the same time in the same network. This is also where we get push to talk over cellular and MMS. So let's talk about the GPRS network architecture. And I left this image at the bottom here because you might notice it's exactly the same as what we had for GSM. Nothing new there. We still have our MS, our, our base transceiver station, our base station controller, our mobile switching center, and our global mobile switching center. So that part is gonna stay the same. Sometimes now our mobile station is going to be referred to as our user endpoint, and that's just a terminology thing, it's all the same stuff. Our BSS is gonna remain the same with our BTS and our BSC. And we're gonna have our MSC, which contains most of the functionality as before. So now we're gonna look at the newer parts, the shiny packet switched features. And you can think of the packet switched part as the internet-y portion. And the internet is really, really great. So for the whole front end, right, we stayed the same, but now we're gonna need support for GPRS. And those are gonna come in the form of GPRS support nodes. Now, this is gonna be our serving GPRS support node, which is referred to as our SGSN. And this is gonna do our location and security and access controls, most, a bunch of our mobility management. And it's gonna handle authentication and GTP packets, which I'll go into a little bit more in depth, which are our GPRS tunneling protocol packets. It communicates with other SGSNs, other serving GPRS support nodes, and other mobility management entities. Oh look, I have it there. And then we have our GDSN, which is our GPRS gateway support node or our gateway GPRS support node. I've seen it written in real documentation either way. It's another support node, right? It's our last hop before the PDN, before our public data network. And when I say a gateway, usually that's what we mean. It's usually the last step either into a certain network or out of a certain network and usually referring to the core network. So it assigns IP addresses for devices internal to the core network, and it is a, really thought of as a gateway, a router, and a firewall all in one. Usually, it's very often just referred to as a router. 
Oh, look. There are also other types of gateways often uh, depending on the actual operator's implementation, but we're gonna zoom through that and just take a look at our network. So again, you see that this whole top part looks pretty similar, except for those registers that we talked about are no longer just above the MSC. We now need our SGSN, our serving GPRS gateway, uh, our serving GPRS support node is gonna need to access our home location register and our visitor location register and our authentication. So what we're doing is taking this from just our circuit switch portion and sharing it between the circuit switch and our packet switch portion. Oh, uh, yeah, MS, BTS, BSC, all the same, right? So now we have that top part is considered our circuit switch portion just like it was before and below is our packet switched portion. And then you see how that uh, SGSN communicates to the GGSN, which then reaches out to the public network. So let's talk about some GPRS attack vectors. So you have that same rogue BTS flaw, and I am going to mention this company called P1 Security, and I have a soft spot for them because I took a training with them early in my career. Uh, but they do some really awesome research, and I'm going to reference them a couple times in here. So one of the things that they've done research in is GPRS, and they've found some actual implementations in the wild without any encryption. And this was most notably in Italy and Denmark. And this just means that, yeah, again, you can just do whatever you want in that network. It's lovely. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about this uh, denial of service on this Nokia GGSN. So do we remember where the GGSN sits? in our network diagram, it's a gateway. It's our GPRS gateway support node. So it's that last hop before the wild internet. So what happened was someone on the wild internet decided to send in a packet uh, to our core network that had, uh, I think it was, where'd it go? Yeah, non-standard IP options. It's not even like wonderfully crafted. It's just non-standard. And it took down the whole GGSN. Yep, lovely. So this whole cellular area just has no service for a bit. There are also GTP known weaknesses. So uh, the GPRS tunneling protocol has no encryption on, and on user plane or control plane. So GTP has, uh, it, there are specific protocols for the user plane, control plane, and charging plane. And GTP is uh, what actually sends the commands for creating and attaching PDP context, if you know what that means. Um, but both the signaling plane and the user plane packets are sent in the clear. So a compromised GPRS support node will allow an attacker to monitor and manipulate GTP traffic. So this has led to some documented infrastructure attacks over billing, which is not very well known to the uh, mobile endpoint, to the user. They don't usually notice that for a long time. And protocol anomaly attacks. So on to 3G. Woo-wee. So we have more internet functionality now. We have things like video chat, mobile broadband, and here is where we are in our timeline. So we just covered, we've covered NMT, we've covered AMPS, we've covered GSM, GPRS, and now we're on to UMTS. So the network architecture, we're gonna keep most of GPRS still. You'll notice along the lines, there are only a couple things get, that get modified in every generation, so we're just keep adding on. So now, our radio access network still does the same functionality in the network, but they have to slap a pretty name on it, so it's the UMTS Terrestrial Radio Access Network now. There's a lot of little subtle changes to names. Our mo ma mobile station now is usually referred to as our user endpoint or user equipment, but the MSC is gonna stay the same, uh, just as it was for our circuit switched operations. We're gonna have our node B now. So instead of our base transceiver station, it's gonna be referred to as a node B, and this term node B is gonna keep with us throughout the future generations. And we also get our RNC, our radio network controller. And our radio network controller is in charge of a bunch of node Bs. It handles our radio management, a lot of mobility management, adds encryption to user data, and it reminds me of the BSC, but better. So let's take a look at this actual architecture. So here's the network diagram. Looks a lot like our GPRS, right? 
We still have our mobile station or our user endpoint. And now instead of our base transceiver station, you see that we have our node B, which then reaches out to our radio network controller, right? The core network is going to stay the same. We still have our mobile switching center and our global mobile switching center and our so serving GPRS support node and our GPRS gateway support node. So the packet switched and circuit switched portions of our network in our core network are gonna stay the same, really just that radio access portion changes. So let's talk about these attack vectors. <laughs> so uh, Rogue BTS is starting to fall out of style, it's not very targeted, it's kind of annoying, but there are some cool attack vectors in terms of radio resource control now. So uh, radio resource control messages handle the control plane L3 between the user endpoint and the core network, right? Remember what our radio access and our core network look like? So most messages are integrity protected, but most notably the ones that are not are going to be our RRC, our radio resource control connection request, set up, and reject and release. So modifying these messages can result in a connection status change for the user without them actually knowing. There are also some remote IMSI attacks where, uh, let's see, yeah, integrity keys used between the user endpoint and the radio network controller. Those are actually generated in the core network portion of our diagram. So those are transmitted to the radio network controller unencrypted. They're also often transmitted between radio network controllers unencrypted, so that's fun. The integrity of user data is actually not defined. It's not part of our standard. There are a lot of things um, that are just slightly off in our 3G, right? We have a short time during signaling where signaling is entirely unprotected and can be tampered with. And there is also something called HLR overloading. If you remember what our HLR is, it's our home location register. It keeps all of that information about the home uh, mobile endpoints, right? So the mobile endpoint has to communicate with the HLR, but remember, in order to do that now, we have to reach through our SGSN, our serving GPRS support node. So in order to do that, uh, we have to go through that whole network. Now what can happen is an attacker can send that through, obtain a list, well, okay. So an attacker can essentially send that through and just resend that message over and over to overload our HLR, and then in that way, it'll affect the SGSN and take that down as well. So that's cool. There's a variant of this attack. Nope. Yeah, there's a variant of this attack where remember when I said that your IMZ contains your mobile operator and all of that information? So what an attacker can do is say, okay, in this area, I can see all of these IMZs that are specific to Verizon or whatever your provider is and send a list of those IMZs with this synchronization request to the network and the network will be like, well, yeah, these are valid users and it'll start, um, It'll start doing a lot of computation for some of the crypto keys and communicating between HLRs and CLRs and take it down that way. And the thing is that they're known values, so the network is gonna obviously prioritize them. The other thing is that then that prevents any other legitimate users from actually connecting to that device. So LTE. So the focus now is super IP based. Like before we were working with circuit switched and packet switched and then we are now like fully packet switched. And for <laughs> LTE, it's not really 4G, but uh, this comes up in the late aughts and it's time for long-term evolution. So the reason I say it's not really 4G is kind of fun. And that's because initially this global standard for RHEL 8 and RHEL 9 of 4G, LTE didn't apply to, right? Like this didn't actually fit the specifications. But then eventually later on, this international community was like, mm, okay, fine, it can be called 4G. So that's what 4G LTE really is. It's not really initially what 4G was supposed to be, which is why I don't have it in the 4G section. So this is our evolved packet core, and we get voice over LTE. So the term evolution is gonna keep coming up in LTE terminology, but let's take a look at what the actual network looks like. So we have still our mobile station or, or user endpoint. We have our E node B now. Gotta love slapping that E in front of things. Same device though. Okay, maybe there's slight frequency differences, but pretty much does the same thing. We have our mobility management entity. 
And this replaces our RNC. And this directs things to the appropriate SGW. It does bearer activation and deactivation, paging, authentication of user endpoints. And it directs things around appropriately. We then have our HSS. Now, remember all of those registers? Well, we're going to combine the home location register and the authentication one into our home subscriber server. Makes sense. We also have our signal gateway, and this routes and forwards packets. It looks a lot like our SGSN, doesn't it? It's in the exact same place. And then we have our PDN gateway, or a PGW. And remember our PDN is our public data network, and this device looks a lot like our GGSN did. It's for exiting, uh, for outgoing and entry into the cellular network. It does policy enforcement, LI, packet filtering, charging support, etc. And we have this, this mechanism for charging support in our policy and charging rules function, our PCRF, but really that communicates with the PGW. So let's talk about some fun LTE attack vectors. So LTE inspector, highly recommend you read this paper. It's pretty interesting, the things that are found out about LTE. And let's talk about some of the uh, authentication relay attacks they posted. Uh, they, you can impersonate a victim cellular device and reach to the core network without possessing any legitimate credentials, and they detail this in the paper. Can obtain information and mount DOS attacks, hijack page, the device's paging channel, and that can even lead to panic attacks. So your paging channel and is going to be what those warnings that show up on your phone, you're like, hurricane warning or like Amber Alert. You know how your phone just does those automatically? Well, your phone is reaching out to try and get those because they're top priority, right? It's constantly looking in the network for these paging messages and those are gonna pop up. So a panic attack is when a, <laughs> an attacker will have a malicious enode B that broadcasts out all of these messages and you have panic in a local area. Very war of the worlds, right? There are also bidding down attacks, and bidding down attacks are going to be when you can degrade service down to 3G or 2G, and those are gonna happen still. <laughs> those just happen. You can downgrade the services, and that means that those 2G attack vectors are still gonna be prevalent. So moving on to actual 4G, and this is often called real 4G, or LTE Advanced, or LTE Advanced Pro. And here is where we are in our timeline, getting closer to the 2020s, right? So let's take a look at this architecture. And what this change, this architecture looks pretty much the same, right? <laughs> so here we get IPv6 expansion, adaptive modulation, time varying channels, voice over LTE is predominant, we have carrier aggregation. And if you work in cellular, in recent cellular, you probably heard the term IMS, your IP multimedia subsystem. But same general architecture, right? We still have our user endpoint, we still have our E node B, and then that reaches into the core network consisting of our mobility management entity, our home subscriber server, and our SGW, our serving gateway, and our public data network gateway. So, some LTE advanced 4G uh, attack vectors. So we change our signaling from SS7 to, to diameter, but we're not gonna go into that because we could have a whole talk on some signaling stuff. There's also VoIP spit flooding, uh, which spit is spam over internet telephony. It sounds as gross as it is. Uh, there are a bunch of different types that you can go with, like SYN flooding and UDP flooding. And there, this is where it gets exciting for me. <laughs> I like to read about the actual router vulnerabilities that are found, right? So now we have an easier time for our researchers to be obtaining these types of devices and actually tearing them apart. So there are some really fun ZTE info link and uh, an arbitrary code execution bug found in a whole series of routers by a researcher called Takashi. Uh, parameters are not properly checked, so you can just run arbitrary code on them, love it. There are, um, there's an auth bypass in that same series of devices. And you know it's bad because ZTE actually admitted to it and changed it. It's a big deal. <laughs> there's also TP-Link uh, pre and post auth command execution. 
if you like follow these things on the internet, you've probably seen these come up. Netware for Netgear firmware encryption errors, and then some more fun topics that P1 Security has released. So there's a mobility management entity vulnerability that uh, they gave a talk on this and hack at Hack the Box and noted that this vendor just had the MME keys just hard coded. So if you know this vendor's uh, MME keys, you could just use it on any of their networks. Gotta love it. And then uh, they also found that there was an MML interface just exposed on the internet from their PGW. Very, so that means that a, an attacker on the wild internet could reach into this core network and just run some commands. We also have bidding down attacks now, but the thing is that voice over LTE is such a thing that that could be downgraded as well. Cool, I think we're going through this pretty quickly, so I'm gonna give you a second to digest our changes for 5G. So, we've gone over a lot, but mostly GSM is our circuit switched, and those devices are gonna mostly stay the same until we get to GPRS, where we add our packet switched functionality, right? From that, we're then going to go all packet switched, no more really circuit switched. So we're gonna change that structure a little bit. And now on to 5G. Oh, you know what? Uh, before I mentioned IMSI attacks, right? Well, IMSIs don't really happen in 5G. What we have now is Supi and Suki. <laughs> and I don't actually know how these are pronounced, but that's fine. So we have our subscription permanent identifier, which is a 15 decimal string, and then you have a subscription concealed identifier. So by having these two number, these two identifiers that are not just beaconed out all the time, they are trying to defeat IMSI catchers. It's not quite so simple as just having an IMSI. So 5G changes a lot of things. Now, it's now, right? In our timeline, 5G is happening right now. So now we realize that it's not just cell phones that are on our cellular networks. We have all different types of devices. So the way that these international standards are thinking of the designing this specification has to apply to a bunch of different types of technologies. The other thing that is a huge change for 5G is now we have network function virtualization. So we have a bunch of different functions just running on COT servers. We also have uh, management and orchestration. And previously this would happen in some different devices like our mobility management entities, some of our uh, serving gateways and things like that. But now it's actually part of the specification. We also have the new concept of network slicing. So this is creating logical networks over the same physical infrastructure. So this is because we can expect a car and a cell phone and like uh, medical devices. They all have different needs from the network and users have different expectations from them. So we can create a quality of service slice for that type of device. It's all about converging technologies. So yeah, smart meters versus voice calls. We're gonna expect different things. So we also, you know how we had that BTS that transformed into our node B, which transformed into our E node B? Well now we just wanna call it a G node B. Because. So let's look at this architecture. So this is gonna be our biggest change. We still have our uh, access and mobility management function. So this is gonna be similar to what we had in our mobility management entity. This does most of our subscriber mobility and registration and security. We have our session management function, which does our PDU management. It chooses a UPF and allocates IPv4 or 6 if it's IP-based, but not everything has to be IP-based now. We have our user plane function, which also would have been part of our MME, our mobility management entity. And it's our anchor point for something now called our NGRAN, because again, we just love slapping terms in front of other things. It's still the radio access network. It's still doing the same functionality as it was before, but now it's for new radio, so it's shiny. We have our unified data management, which does our access authorization, registration, more mobility management, data network profiles, and it communicates with our access and mobility management function and our session management function. And we still have to do charging, so instead of our PCRF, we just now have policy control function. 
And our policy control function also does um, dynamic policy decisions. So is there any network condition that will affect this user? So let's look at this network diagram, and I know that this looks very different from before. But we still have our user endpoint, or our mobile station. We still gotta have the device. And that still reaches out to our radio tower that does some processing, which now is our G node B. Then reaches out to our user plane function. So I haven't really covered planes, but uh, this is still all in the same level, right? At the end of this row, we have our mobility and quality of service flow and policy of enforcement. And those communicate with our access and mobility management function. Again, mobility, registration, security. Reaches to our SMF, which does session management, our policy control function, and our unified data management, which tells our access and mobility management function and our session management, oh, lovely, what's going on? Well, to be fair, that was the last network diagram, so. So the next, yeah, awesome. So the next image that I wanted to show you was if you remember all of those big devices that we had for uh, 2G, for GSM specifically, here's, I think, this is either Ericsson or Simmons, um, but this is their 5G kit. It's a very different in scale. So let's talk about some 5G attack vectors. Okay, so we have this beautifully detailed attack, which hopefully you can see the diagram. The radio access and the core network don't require authentication, so you can do this location sniffing attack. So what happens is, if an attacker places a tool near a target user endpoint, you, they can monitor for plain text authorization request messages. And this message, beautiful. This me message will contain a RAND and an AUT, right? So as an attacker, I can then create I can form this packet that has, yeah, beautiful, build an authorization request message using those two values. So what's gonna happen is I broadcast, as an attacker, I broadcast this fake message, and we have the MAC for our target user endpoint. All of the other user endpoints are gonna come back and say there's a MAC failure, right? But the actual target user endpoint is gonna come back with a sequence failure. So fun fact, from that, you could then, un an attacker could then glean whether or not a specific user endpoint is in a specific cell. So if all of the, me all of the messages come back as a MAC failure, it's not in that cell, if it comes back with that different message, it is. There's an attack request injection, let's see. Okay, I've got five. Uh, there's some battery draining attacks that are really neat because these are a lot of um, IoT devices on this network. We can drain those five times faster than expected, so that's fun. Uh, and AKA attack, which happens in the ring of keys. Yeah, we can still uh, send malformed packets and trigger crashes in 5G core networks. This is still not something that's solved. And then Deloitte gave a talk at RSA about network slicing vulnerabilities, where you can, because there is more public research on 5G routers, you can take a look and once you get entry into this network slice, you can navigate up looking for other vulnerable devices. Yeah, that's not so much like a real core network attack, so I don't find it as exciting, but it is pretty cool still. So, to review, we've zoomed through a whole lot, so thank you for like sticking with me. We covered 0G and 1G, our analog, and, uh, analog cellular phones, mobile telephony, circuit switch, moved on to 2G for digital t technology, voice and data, still circuit switched, but now we have our user endpoint, our BSS, our MSC, our GMSC. GPRS moved to both circuit and packet switched. We added our GPRS support nodes. Then we moved to 3G in the form of UMTS, which now we don't have our BTS, we have our node B, we have our RNC, and we kept our GGSN and our SGSN. Then we moved to LTE. We have our evolved packet core where we like to change things slightly and slap on an E. And 
4G in the terms of Volte, IPv6, IMS, all of the devices and architecture stayed the same. And then on to 5G, where we had a bunch of virtualization, network slicing, and now we call it a G-node B for some reason, uh, and functionality is generally split into functions instead of these large devices. So, that was a lot to cover, but I hope you understand a little bit more about uh, cellular infrastructure and these core networks and some of the fun vulnerabilities you can find out about them. That's my musical theater references and my actual like technical references. Um, and if there are any questions, we might have time. Yeah? Okay, I think I have two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Question. Right, so I didn't, I actually had CDMA 2000 covered in um, whatever that is, 3G, I guess, and, and I took it out. So CDMA, actually, I'll bring up the, we can have this talk. And then I think this, you can find me after if I don't have time for you. Sorry. Let's find an image. There we go. All right, so you see uh, where we have CDMA 1. What was that? Oh, repeat the question? Yeah. So the question was about CDMA. Hi, Gaston. <laughs> the question was about CDMA and where it fits in. And you'll see in this image, we have 2G, where it has CDMA 1, and then CDMA 2000 uh, continuously throughout that 2G. And then it also has CDMA 2000 in our 3G. So I was going to, I was planning on covering CDMA 2000 in our 3G section, but didn't quite have enough time, unfortunately. And I didn't want to quite inundate everyone with all of the acronyms, so I kept CDMA out. Why didn't it carry forward? I don't know it well enough for that. My experience has mostly been in the technologies that I detailed. I cheated a little, so. <laughs> cool. I guess that's all.
it. Yeah, sorry. No, no, this is good. I'm
breaks, and I said, I will uncuff this while I'm here. Okay, stand over my shoulder and observe the ridiculous. First, do I let the thing connect? Yes. Go over to audio, go over to settings, go over to audio, split audio, mic one, done. Mic one is now two mono channels. <laughs> I believe that uh, the connection is... Oh, you're speaking here now? Yeah, we, we were... Uh, okay. Yeah, that's great. I do not have a problem with that. I'm going to be sitting here messing with things, but I can definitely put my thumb up and tell you that it's actually showing up at our system. So with that, you now have a pair of audio mm -hmm. channels. They're pan-centered right now by default, which is where I fucking wanted them, but if I wanted to make them left and right, you can grab here and make it left and right. I have no desire for that. And uh, I think, come on, there's probably a way to get this to not suck, but I haven't found it yet. You can type in. Okay, so there's the pan-center. Okay. See the audio on left mm -hmm. and right picking out of the left yep. channel? Done. Oh, wait, but then why is there nothing on... How is it... <laughs> I'm not quite sure how it's solved, even though I see it solved. I pulled mic one to take it, rather than being a stereo pair, and consider each one a separate mono channel. At that point, panning is completely arbitrary. Got it, okay. Yeah. And the only one that's getting any signal is left side. Yep. And that's why it's showing both channels in there. Because input is left, output is the old mono. Yeah. Got it. Well, output is into the stereo trap, mono in both sides of the stereo trap is equal to 10. Which in this case is dual mono. Sure. The, the, that's accurate if you were actually doing pair. I unpaired the channels. Yeah. Now I have individual control. Yep. That any of us have the trouble seeing the channel correctly.
that sometimes we want to tether that in with the mix of the speaker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, all three of the mics are hot all the time. Okay. So <laughs> if, if one of you is sit standing there and you're answering questions, and it's somebody else's expertise or whatever, the other mics are hot okay. and you can kind of talk there. So sure. just be aware if you're sitting here, they're going to be able to hear you. And they're really loud. So the audience member can probably hear you. It comes across as a little sort of this far away, but this is pretty aggressive. Uh, have you seen any talks today? Yeah. yeah. OK. So the, the same basic idea, I've got some stuff to give away. I'll go over that with some purple earlier. Um, and otherwise, we get started in like, I've got a little bit of stuff to give away. We'll okay. try and get started right at uh, 2 o'clock to give you as much time as you need as you can. Um, so we we'll still end up at minutes or we All right, so you have, uh, let me make sure that I have you right on the schedule. Um, you have a full 15 minutes. Okay, talk. all right. Um, the rest of the talk slots for this hour are half hour to talk about, so you have a full 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, at 15 minutes, we want you to be, so you're going to get a, like 40 minutes of extra time. Okay. At 15 minutes, we want you to be back enough to be Okay, but does the 15 minute include the giveaway time? No, no, I want to be done before 2 o'clock. Okay, perfect, perfect. All right. Yeah. I'm going to get started with awesome. this, so you all can start right at, like, as close to 2 o'clock as possible. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, rather than, or, so you all have your own introduction slides? Yeah. yeah. So I'll just leave the title of the talk that I have yeah. and let you all introduce it by name. That's perfect. Uh, since you all have your own introduction yeah. slides, but otherwise, uh, good luck. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, good morning. Uh, streaming, are we good? Or good afternoon, sorry. Uh, good afternoon to Schmoot. Uh, welcome back from lunch. Um, before we get started, we, we have a couple of uh, announcements. You've probably heard these uh, before. We have uh, t-shirts that are available for a donate. If you give us a donation, we'll give you a t-shirt. This year's t-shirts, we still have a number of them that are available, uh, $15 donations past t-shirts in a number of sizes. If you're a double XL like I am, I know we have a bunch of double XL shirts, as, uh, a number of other shirts, uh, sizes as well. Those are uh, $10. Again, uh, those, that money goes directly to the nation. We don't take any of that cash. Uh, it goes direct, directly to charity. Uh, and we're just giving you the t-shirt as a thank you for donating money. Uh, in addition, past bags are available for $20 directly to the nation. Uh, as same as a, a a bag of crap. So the last year's conference, we gave away boxes of stuff. We added a bunch of cool stuff to the, each of the boxes. Uh, and again, that money goes directly to charity. Please uh, take advantage of that. Um, we've, you all have donated a lot of money to some worthy causes. Please uh, continue to do so. We'd re really appreciate that. Um, since we're running short on time because of me, I'm going to go ahead and just toss out the stuff that I have. I have a wonderful pair of socks. Does anybody have any cool socks on right now? Well, I'm going to throw it over here since nobody is. There nice. you go. Um, I also have a bag that I believe has a hat and a lanyard and something else in it that I can't tell. So. All right. And the last thing that I have also from one of our sponsors is uh, actually a pretty nice uh, stainless steel mug. But because you're sitting up, up front, I don't want to throw this. This will hurt. So you want to come get it? <laughs> All right. Um, so. Our next presenters, this is their first time presenting at Information Security Con, first time speaking at ShmooCon. Um, so please give a warm welcome to these three gentlemen that will be speaking on the Phantom of the Pipeline abusing self-hosted CICD runners. All right, thank you everyone for coming to our talk. We're so excited to present some things that we think is pretty cool and uh, we hope by the end of the talk you guys will agree as, as well. So our talk is fan of the pipeline abusing self-hosted CI CD runners but mostly GitHub in this case. Who are we? So my name is Adnan Khan. I am a lead security engineer at Praetorian and I'll let re the rest of the team introduce themselves. Hey, my name is Mason Davis. I'm also a lead security engineer at Praetorian. And I'm Matthew Joukowsky. Uh, again, a lead security engineer at Praetorian. 
So I'll, I'll start us off. Uh, just kind of some general, I guess like vocab, make sure everybody's kind of coming into this with the same set of knowledge. So as we mentioned, we're abusing in this talk self-hosted runners, and in this case GitHub. So this is really compromising CI CD, which is continuous integration, continuous delivery platforms. Um, for those who don't know what CI CD is, really it's just a way to automate building, testing, and deploying software. CI CD typically involves workflows that execute pipelines. Um, there's many triggers that can trigger a workflow, but one of the more common ones would be a push to a code repository. So looking at this diagram, you can see a developer makes a change to code on their local machine. They push that to a code repository. For the sake of this talk, we'll say GitHub. And a workflow is triggered, which this workflow then is picked up by a runner, which then executes that job, which can be many different things, such as updating documentation, building the code, et cetera. There's many different tools which implement CI/CD. Um, some of the more classic ones would be Jenkins or Team City, and some of the more modern ones being GitLab and GitHub Actions. So as I mentioned, GitHub Actions, GitHub is the focus of this talk, although this concept can be kind of uh, ported over to many other CI CD platforms. So, what is GitHub's implementation of CI CD? It's called GitHub Actions. If you go to any repository within GitHub, it will have an Actions tab, which is where all of the workflow information is. Uh, typically, these workflows are defined in YAML files found in the .github slash workflows directory. And these YAML files are broken down into jobs, which are then dispatched to runners. There are two different types of runners that GitHub uh, supports, or two different options. One is the ephemeral host, which are actually managed by GitHub. And then they also support the self-hosted, which are managed by the customer. And um, that's going to be the focus of this talk. So why do companies use or developers use self-hosted runners? Um, there's really a number of different reasons. One being cost saving. So with GitHub, each organization is allotted a certain amount of billable minutes within or on the uh, self-hosted ephemeral GitHub runners. But after you um, hit this minute limit, okay, thank you. So take a step back. One of the reasons we use self-hosted runners is for cost saving. Organizations are set a billable limit. And once they reach this billable limit, um, if they're using self-hosted, or sorry, ephemeral runners hosted by GitHub, then it begins to, the costs add up very quickly. Additionally, another reason for self-hosted runners is it provides more customization options. They can interface with hardware, GPU, et cetera, and they can handle a larger workload. You can make these things as beefy as you want. And then one of the more interesting things here is that you can host these self-hosted runners on-premise, meaning that they can access resources on your local network that you know, GitHub runners would not be able to do um, without any sort of proxy, et cetera. How do these runners work? So they're just a .NET core application. They run on Linux, OS X, Windows, et cetera. And by default, these self-hosted runners are not ephemeral. There is a way to configure that, but the setup is more complex. Um, and when I say not ephemeral, I mean the jobs execute directly on the host operating system. Of course, there is cleanup afterwards, but it's still executing on the host itself. The setup is very turnkey. It's just a zip or tar file. You extract it, configure it to sync with the GitHub repository or organization, and you run it. Before we go too much further here, GitHub does denote that these self-hosted runners can be very dangerous. This is straight from their documentation. So 
there is significant risk to the machine and whatever network that they're on. Um, GitHub calls this out as risks for initial access, sandbox escapes, persistence within a network, and even lateral movement, which is something that we will show <laughs> in a few slides. Now, one more thing that we want to go over before we get into how you abuse self-hosted runners is what is a GitHub personal access token? So we refer to them as PATs commonly throughout this talk. Essentially, it's just an API bearer token that you can authenticate to GitHub with. Um, they're associated with the <clears throat> account that uh, created the PAT. They can have many different uh, levels of permissions and are used for you know, creating, managing repositories, pull requests, managing issues, managing workflows, etc. cetera. Uh, additionally, these paths can be um, revoked at any time. So that's a great thing for developers. If a pat is ever uh, compromised, they can be revoked in the GitHub UI. Um, and I believe at creation, the standard is a seven day period that they last. However, this can be customizable to never expiring or uh, expiring in just a day. There are two types. Um, we'll get into this a little bit later, but there's the newer type, which is the fine grain token, which is still in the beta. And then there's a the classic token, which is what we'll talk about. So GitHub Actions, CICD, PATS, how does it all come together in an attack path? So the three of us are red team, red teamers, and we have been really focusing on CICD for about the last year. And this is an exa example attack path that we've executed on multiple uh, red teams over the year. At a high level, there's really six steps here. It's first, you try to socially engineer a developer or really anyone in an organization that might have access to some way to get a pat. And when I say some way, this could be, if they're a developer, somewhere on their machine in like a home directory or bash history uh, backup. This could be anyone that has access to artifacts within that network. Um, pats are very commonly pushed into artifacts or Docker containers and then kind of just forgotten. So we go through the social engineering aspect, we obtain a pat. The next thing we do is we can use this pat to enumerate the GitHub API to learn exactly what permissions are associated with it and we can begin to look for repositories that use self-hosted runners. At this point, once we identify a repository that is vulnerable, or is using a self-hosted runner and we have at least repo access to, we can push a malicious workflow to that repository, which is then triggering a workflow that's picked up by one of those GitHub runners. Now, at the end, at, during execution, um, after a workflow executes, there is a cleanup. There are many ways to kind of persist after that cleanup. In the case of this example, attack path, we just start a detached Docker container, which then persists past when the workflow has ended execution. So after we get that detached workflow running, um, it's profit. We now have C2 on that organization's local network coming from a completely external SaaS application. Some ideas for targeting uh, developers to obtain pats would be, you know, there's pretty common for developers to install tools with just a curl, some totally trusted domain, pipe that right to bash, and then lo and behold, we're trying to scour their system, exfiltrate cookies, and see if we can get anything from bash history, et cetera. Additionally, there's the phishing campaigns that are pretty classic to red teams, trying to get access to uh, Okta dashboards or any other SaaS applications. And then once we have access to this, we look through Slack or Teams or any other type of uh, messaging software. If we have access to logs or artifacts, trying to scour through, find secrets, 
and very commonly that's where we'll find a pat. For finding these secrets, you know, I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but it's really just secret scanning, home directory backups, git commit history we've had a lot of success with in the past, sensor logs, so if you somehow get access to EDR logs, that's command line uh, history that's right there, you can comb through that. Pats are very commonly committed to command line history. CICD artifacts, if you get instance uh, access to a unauthenticated JFrog instance, for example, you can start just dumping all of those artifacts and looking through there. Um, there's many ways to scan for this. One way that we commonly use is uh, we do work at Praetorian, so we uh, released a secret scanner called Nosy Parker pretty recently that we've had great success with. There's many options out there though. So at this point, I found a pat, now what do I do with it? So now we come to the time to start enumerating. And for that, I will let Adnan speak. All right, so once you've obtained a pat, at that point you don't know if it's valid or if it belongs to a user that has privileges that you could use to get a foothold within an organization if it is valid. So w once we, when we need to figure that out, we ha start by querying the GitHub API. So the way GitHub works with personal access tokens is there's a certain API endpoint you can query that when you re make that request, in the response, you'll receive a list of OAuth scopes associated with that token, as well as the authenticated user that that token belongs to. So with one request, you can learn if a token is valid and what permissions it has when the user created it. Additionally, there's more API endpoints that allow listing the organizations that, a, that an authenticated user belongs to. And the GitHub API is extensive, so we'll go into what more you can learn and how you can use that knowledge to gain a foothold on self-hosted runners. So towards the end of the talk, we're gonna be releasing an open source tool that automates the entire process, both enumeration and attack. Finally, what about fine-grained personal access tokens? This changes the enumeration process just a bit because unlike classic tokens, fine-grained tokens don't return a list of scopes associated with them as part of the API response. So GitHub token scopes are set on creation. They can be changed later, but typically developers create a token, set scopes for it, and then leave it at that. There are a numerous amount of options for scopes. There are organizational admin scopes, enterprise admin scopes, scopes for very specific actions such as deleting a repository or modifying a wiki, for example. For the purpose of our attack path, the important scopes that we're most interested in are the repo and workflow scopes. So the repository scope is like kind of a catch-all scope that GitHub uses for classic tokens that covers interacting with a single GitHub repository. So this is, covers things like your standard actions like pushing code, pulling code from the repository, as well as if the user is, 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 is an administrator on the repository, performing administrative actions on that repo, like adding a collaborator to the repo or uh, deleting branches and such. So the workflow scope covers permissions related to GitHub Actions. So if you want to make a change to a workflow, meaning the actual YAML file itself, and have that change reflected in GitHub so that when the workflow executes next, there's different code execution, you, you need that workflow scope. Otherwise, repo scope only allows you to make changes to the code within the repository, not the workflow. So one thing here is also enter GitHub Enterprise Organizations and single sign-on. So for organizations that are paying for GitHub's enterprise level plan, which is their most expensive plan, they are able to require developers to explicitly authorize pers classic personal access tokens they create to that organization. So developers would create the token and have to click an additional button to grant access to that organization and at that point, they will have to re-enter their two-factor authentication. Again, this is only once. After that, the token has access and it no longer needs to be re-authenticated to that 
enterprise. So this is not broadly used and not on by default. So a scenario is that a developer can create a classic personal access token for something they're working on on the side and not related to their employer's projects. However, because the token is associated with the user and if they gave it, say, repository permissions, then an attacker could take that token if they were able to compromise it, use it to enumerate that developer's employer's repositories and then perform malicious actions against that developer's employer even though that token was initially only meant for a personal side project. So there's an important distinction about token scopes. Scopes are associated with the user that created the token. So when, a, if a user is creating a token, they can create a token with every single scope, enterprise admin, org admin, even if that user isn't an administrator of anything. So from an attacker's perspective, we need to figure out what the user is actually able to do within any organization that may be a member of. So for that, we need to perform additional enumeration beyond just learning about the scopes. So this kind of leads into API-based enumeration using GitHub's extensive and extremely well-documented API. So with this API, pretty much anything that you can do on GitHub, with a couple exceptions, that you can do via the web browser or even with the, the pure Git command line, you can do using their REST API. You can do actions like downloading historical GitHub Actions run logs as zip files that you can extract later, and you can fork repositories, you can create pull requests. There's even very low-level API calls that GitHub exposes that allow you to directly interact with the low-level Git file structure that backs up a particular repository. Within this, there are certain API calls that return different fields depending on the actual permission that the user has to an organization or a repository. So, and this is the behavior we'll, you can use to figure out what level of permission the user actually has and then perform additional enumeration or attack operations depending on where you're going with it. So, this is an example of enumerating if a user is an organization administrator or not. So, if the user does have that administrative access, then a field such as billing email, which is something that only an administrator can see for an organization, will be present in the response. If not, then that field won't be present. And the screenshot might be small for some people, but they, essentially what GitHub even documents that where that it mentions that the type can be a string, but it can also be null, which means that's a good way to look for different responses within GitHub's API that could be used for determining what access a user has. So, and, and this is a, a technique that would need to be utilized to enumerate whether a fine-grained token has access to an organization and particular repositories because you can't learn about the privileges and also certain API calls like listing all organizations associated with the user might not work because that token might only be authorized to a specific repository within a specific organization. So additionally, the same technique works with discovering the privileges that a user has for a particular repository. So the scenario here is where you've obtained a token via a compromise, you've now listed all the repositories, and now you're trying to figure out which repository the user can actually make changes to to further your attack. So you, if you call the repository list endpoint, then, or you just query a single repository, within each repository object in the API response, you'll have a permissions field, and that'll let you quickly learn whether the user is administrator, whether they have write access, or, they're, or they can only read from the repository. There's additional fields like maintainer that'll also be present depending on the user's actual permission. Now, all of these actions, that created a lot of noise, right? You learned so much about an organization, you learned whether a user is a member of a particular organization, you, and you now know all of their repositories. Nope. With GitHub's current 
API, all of that does not create any noise, with some exceptions. So GitHub's audit log focuses primarily on state changing actions, especially administrative actions like adding a new user or deleting a repository. A lot of the actions that are commonly associated with normal usage of GitHub don't generate audit log events. There's also no way for organizations to know when a classic token associated with the user was last used to access their resources. So, kind of looking more into these blogging blind spots, the majority, the vast majority of GET API requests do not generate any audit logs. That this includes when it works and when you get a 403. The, there are one exception that would be commonly used by an attacker is downloading a zip archive or a tarball archive of a repository. That does generate an audit log event. However, GitHub has other API endpoints that allow you to directly get the repository contents and get the git blob and from raw git blobs, but those don't generate audit logs. So you, an attacker, attacker could use API calls to do the same thing and bypass that particular log event and get the same knowledge. Git clone operations, which is directly using the, uh, the git command line and git protocol to interact with the GitHub rep repository. So git clone operations, git push, uh, and git fetch are not logged unless an organization is paying for the enterprise plan, which again is their most expensive plan. And even then, to access those logs, that enterprise needs to ingest GitHub's REST API and pull down those log events because the normal log UI for audit log events won't show the Git clone logs. Additionally, events like when a workflow is created are only logged and queryable by enterprise customers. And again, they need to use the REST API to get that audit log entry. So an attacker that pushes a workflow and and that executes on a self-hosted runner won't actually be visible to an organization unless they're actually ingest specifically ingesting that event. And uh, uh, some other things that are present. GitHub has a lot of uh, defaults that are not enabled that you need to make sure as an organization that you're actually setting. So logging IP addresses associated with audit logs is very, is very important, but by default, and this is likely due to privacy reasons in different countries, you need to actually go in and, and enable IP addresses to be include, included in GitHub audit logs. So by default, if someone compromises a token and performs an audit log generating action from another country, the organization won't have insight that that action was performed like from Russia or something like that. So this kind of leads into something else. If you want security, pay up. So in a scenario where an attacker compromises a developer's personal access token that has the repo and workflow scope for a smaller company that is only on the team's organization, but they still need to use self-hosted runners, that attacker can use that token and gain all the knowledge they need to figure out what repository to exploit and then push a payload that gets them command and control, control uh, implant execution on a self hosted runner, and now that organization's network is compromised. This will generate zero audit log events from GitHub. The only insight that organization would have would be things ha on that runner itself. So, you know, so I, was, I think it's, I don't think it's a very radical idea, but you know, pe people have different opinions, but uh, you know, I don't think, I, I don't think offering a feature and then requiring you know, the most expensive plan to be able to fully secure it is a good idea. So why does this all matter? If an attacker compromises a sufficiently privileged GitHub personal access token, then the first detectable action is malware execution on a self-hosted runner, which will then and very likely lead to privileged escalation attempts lateral movement, and that is already a significant security incident for most organizations. 
So with that, I'll hand it off to Mason to talk about enumerating for self-hosted runners. Thanks, Adan. So how do we actually find where self-hosted runners are being used? So they can be applied at various levels at an organization. They can be applied in the enterprise, at the organization itself, or just at specific repositories. Now, listing for where these runners are present does require sufficient privileges. So you have to be an enterprise or org admin to look at those levels or be uh, an admin to the repository to check for a specific repository. Alternatively, with just read access, uh, any user can download the run logs for historical actions, executions, um, and check for self-hosted runners there. GitHub actually explicitly denotes whether a self-hosted runner was used or one managed by GitHub. So how can we actually go about attacking these self-hosted runners? So by default, as we mentioned before, the GitHub self-hosted runner application provides very little security for the organization. In fact, it's 100% the responsibility of the organization to secure those runners. At minimum, we need a token scoped with the repo scope to conduct an attack. So what will these attacks look like? Now again, this depends on the scopes of the token. If we have the repo and the workflow scope, then we can just push a malicious workflow or updating an existing workflow to run whatever commands we'd like on the self-hosted runner. Alternatively, if we only have the repo scope and are unable to edit the workflows directly, we can just look for cases where code inside the repository is called by the workflow. For example, if a script is present and called by the workflow, we can edit that script or maybe even edit unit tests. Now how can we turn this execution into persistence within the network? So one of the most common tasks, as we mentioned before, is, is doing Docker builds or pushing up Docker images inside of your GitHub action. We can leverage this as a persistence mechanism. So this will give us first a really easy privesk since Docker can, is typically running as a privileged service on the system. Additionally, we can just run a detached Docker container and when the workflow completes, we'll maintain persistence on that system. Alternatively, if Docker isn't present, um, we can actually just run a detached process. Now by default, GitHub actions will uh, clear up any processes spawned by the action, but there's actually a really simple environment variable you can set uh, to an empty string, and any backgrounded processes will not be cleaned up uh, when the job finishes execution. So we've mostly talked about um, obtaining unauthorized access through classic tokens, but what about public repositories? So we found in many cases, GitHub's stern recommendations about not using self-hosted runners isn't followed. In fact, we use the code search API to find a large number of repositories that are public and using self-hosted runners. So to attack these repos, um, we have to think about things a little bit differently. So by default, um, if we push, if we open a PR for a public repo and, and update a workflow, this isn't going to execute. We can set the on pull request trigger in the workflow, and again, this still won't execute. And that's because GitHub added uh, some additional controls for PRs for repositories. The execution is blocked by, until a maintainer or someone with the sufficient access to the repo goes in and approves that execution. Now, by default, this is only set for first-time contributors. So a really easy attack path in these situations would be to get a simple documentation change to a readme or something of, th of that sort merged into the repo and then performing this attack. So to automate all of this, we've developed a tool called Gato, or the GitHub Attack Toolkit. This is written in Python and runs on most Unix environments. It's also released under the Apache license version two, and we have three core modules, search, enumeration, and attack. This is available on GitHub now. So the search module is used to find public repositories where self-hosted runners are being used. The enumerate module is used to identify repositories that might be vulnerable. And finally, the attack module is used to automate a full end-to-end -end attack chain on these self-hosted runners. 
And so from here, we'll give a quick demo of that tool executing. All right. To start off, we're going to look at how the code, the, in, the search module from Gato can be used to search for self-hosted runners within public repositories and then perform a deeper enumeration of those repositories and learn things like the name of the self-hosted runners, the host name of the self-hosted runner, as well as the contents of the YAML files that those runs use. So Gato has a pretty straightforward command line interface. It supports HTTPS and SOX proxies. And in this case, for the code search module, we just take a single, sim a single parameter, which is the target organization. And this part of the tool is just a lightweight wrapper around that code search API that was mentioned earlier. So to use the tool, you just have to give it a personal access token. For the search module, you can give it a token with zero scopes because it doesn't actually need anything to, r for, to run. In this case, we've ran it on the Microsoft GitHub organization and obtained 16 repositories that have the string self-hosted within the workflow files. So just going to quickly write that out to a text file and then use the enumerate module to enumerate every single repository in that list. So after s starting that command here, so this one's going to need a personal access token with the repo and workflow scopes because those API calls require that. Again, since it's public repositories, you can just create your own personal access token with those scopes to use th this feature. So in this case, we're going to run it on those 16 repositories and also set a flag called output YAML. What this will do is every YAML file that it discovers that uses, that has the on self-hosted uh, trigger, it'll just save it off so you can look at it later. So this part of the video is sped up a bit, and, but essentially what it's doing is it's performing a clone of every single repository, but it's using a sparse checkout, so it only gets the .github directory, so it's a lot faster, and you're not downloading hundreds of megs of other content from the repo. It's also downloading historical actions run logs, extracting the zip file, and then parsing out the machine name and runner name of the self-hosted runner. So that'll tell you that it used the self-hosted runner in the last 90 days, and the name of the, the machine. So that could sometimes could be a host name or IP address, depending on how organizations have it set up. So you could develop a good target list using this. And then after this completes, just going to show that we've saved off all the YAML files. Again, it might be small for most of you in the audience. However, in this case, what I'm doing here is just opening up a build CI container YAML file and looking at the different steps in the jobs. So in this case, Docker is being used in this workflow, so it means that it means that if someone were to get execution on that self-hosted runner, then there's a good chance they could, that user is in, in the Docker group and they could potentially perform actions for privilege escalation. So with that, I'll hand it off to Mason to talk about the enumerate module in the case of a, a, theor a hypothetical compromised personal access token. Matt, actually. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. It's okay. Um, so the enumeration module of Gato also has a capability to, you know, if you're on a red team engagement or pen tests, et cetera, what do you do if did this thing restart? Space. Maybe it did, yeah. You might have to skip over. Yep, yep. One second. Um, is this? Yeah, we're doing. Okay. No, yeah, you'll skip over that part. Yeah. Yeah. You're good. Yep, right okay. There. All right. Excuse the technical difficulties there. Um, so the enumeration model of, module of Gato also has a um, self-enumeration module flag that essentially if you come across a compromised pad on a red team or pen test, et cetera, or you know, whatever, you can start to enumerate what permissions are associated with that pad. It will go through and tell you the 
username that that pat is associated with, the organization, and it will then um, look at the scopes that are attached to that pat and all the repositories it has write access to. So we can see here, well, it's a little small, but you might be able to see here, um, the authenticated user here, Shmukon demo, the scopes that are associated with the pat that we pass to the tool are repo and workflow, and this pat, or this user, belongs to the Shmukon 2023 demo organization. Once it's identified this, it then starts to enumerate the repositories within this organization and it finds four of them. The most interesting one being this Shmukon 2023 demo pr private repo two. It notices that we do have push access to this repository. Um, we do have workflow scope assigned to our PAT and it has by looking through workflow run logs and looking at the workflow YAML file, identified that it is using a self-hosted runner. So after it identifies all this, it suggests to the user that you have the workflow and correct permissions on this repository to execute a custom YAML payload and execute, or essentially shell this self-hosted runner. Um, when it finds repositories like this, it also downloads the workflow file, in this case, this demo CI YAML file. That way the user can look through this before continuing with the attack chain. And to show the fun of the attack chain, I'll let Mason take over. Thanks. Yeah, so um, once we found a vulnerable repo, um, we can actually go about attacking it. And so we've built in um, a number of different options for automating this attack. Um, you can set things such as the, the name of the, the branch that you're going to push to or the name of the file or just any, even the command that you want to execute. And so here we will um, execute a, an attack targeting that same private two repo that we identified with the enumerate module. We're specifying the execution to run uname and to cat out Etsy password. We're also setting the commit message and specifying that the workflow file should be called evil. And so once we execute this, um, we'll see how that attack flow works. Um, so it's a bit hard to see, but you'll see quickly that um, we push up a malicious branch and then we wait for GitHub Actions to queue our execution. So once the self-hosted runner picks up, we'll wait for that execution to complete. And just a few seconds later, the execution will complete successfully and we've downloaded the run log for that execution. Now we can unzip that and take a look at the logs themselves. And we'll see, once we get this open, that both the uname and the cat Etsy password executed on that self-hosted runner. Now, if we hop over to the GitHub side, we can take a look at what that looks like in the web UI. So if we pull up that private repo two, go to the actions tab, you can see our execution is in the logs. Now, by default, this won't get deleted, but we did add the option to delete this execution log as well, so that there's no trace that the attack executed. Anyone can go in and take a look at what executed and, and what the output was, so keep that in mind when attacking repositories and dumping sensitive information. Additionally, anyone can look at the actual workflow file itself if this isn't deleted. And that's all we have for a demo. So to wrap things up, um, we just wanted to quickly note that these concepts aren't just applicable to GitHub Actions um, and, and really can be extended to a number of different CICD platforms. Personally, we've targeted GitLab shared runners in a similar fashion this year. Now GitLab does, GitLab does add a few extra um, uh, controls and some you know, better defaults in some cases to prevent this from happening as well as some, some good documentation around that. Uh, but it's not always the case that GitHub, GitLab shared runners are secure as well. Additionally, there's other classic targets 
such as, such as Jenkins and TeamCD and, and a number of other CI/CD platforms that people have been exploiting for years. Finally, I just wanted to quickly shout out um, Marcus Young for his work on the, the Zucker Punch stuff uh, last year as well as uh, Git Guardian's GitHub Actions security cheat sheet as those were both useful to us uh, when, when doing research for this talk. And we'll end with any questions. Sure, so the question was um, how does GitLab, or sorry, yeah, GitLab shared runners work on the logging side? We talked a lot about the gaps on GitHub side. Do you know the answer to that, Virginia? Uh, I'm not sure, we're not sure off the top of our heads, uh, but yeah. we'll definitely look into it. Yes? Sorry, say that again? Yeah, so the question was um, if the network is already secure and we compromise a GitHub runner in this case, w what is the risk there, right? So there's a few things. I, it's definitely up to the organization if they secure it correctly. You can secure these correctly. It, it's not out of the question. It's, from what we have seen, kind of rare. There are cases where the, let's say the thing is completely isolated. What we can do is, if we have privesk on that box, and we, let's say it's running Linux and we get root, we can start to look at um, process environment variables and dump from memory to see as other jobs are executing, we can start to dump secrets from them, et cetera. So if, if it is properly secured, it, it is properly secured, but that's not what we've seen in most cases. I think there was... Yeah, so in this case, we did not share anything with GitHub. The, oh. yeah. So the question was if we shared any of this research uh, and, and discoveries with GitHub and if they had any reactions. So in, as far as sharing anything with GitHub, so nothing that we cover isn't already publicly documented by GitHub. Some of the documentation isn't very clear, especially regarding the fork pull request behavior. So this is just kind of going over stuff that's already public. So there's, we're not disclosing any vulnerabilities in this case. So no, we did not have any communication with GitHub. Right, so the question was if, 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 make sure I'm remembering correctly, the question was is if we can know, restrict the usage of a fat based on the IP where it was issued, and what was the other part of your question? Right, so it, regarding limiting the lifetime of a personal access token, so upon creation, the expiration window for that personal access token can be set. Regarding the limiting where it was issued from, so GitHub does not have that restriction in terms of like IP source for issuing the personal access token itself. However, fine grain tokens, which are in beta right now, have a lot more granularity when it comes to what resources they can access, and organizations also have more insight into the fine green tokens that can access their assets, and they can actually revoke just 
access to a particular repository, so the fine-grained token is still valid, but it can no longer be used to access that organization's repositories. So the question was, if an organization has moved away from personal access tokens and is just having developers use SSH keys to interact with repositories, could similar attacks be carried out on self-hosted runners? So again, it, the a API actions can't be done with the SSH access. However, the one way something could happen is if an organization is using self-hosted runners and that SSH access is used to push code to a repository that already has a trigger that would allow code to run on a self-hosted runner. And as we discussed with being able to modify code that's checked out and then executed as part of a build that's on a self-hosted runner, that could be used to conduct a similar attack. It did. Um, nice to see you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think one of the big differences too is that with the PAT, you can do a lot of the enumeration where you can understand exactly what your permissions are, what repositories there are. To my knowledge, at least with the SSH keys, I don't know if there's a way to enumerate repositories that you have access to. Is there? No, you, so, you'd have to learn it from other contexts. Yeah, so it, it definitely limits the context. So I, I do think that's probably the more secure option, but it does limit the functionality. I believe it is, yeah. I think the, the runner registration token is one-time use, and then um, it's really easy to acquire new ones, but the, the token for the runner itself is one-time. That's definitely, so the question was, um, would you ever want to register your own malicious runner? Um, so there's definitely some opportunities for, for grabbing secrets that way. Um, uh, you would definitely need uh, sufficient privileges to the repo to do that, and um, you know there, there might be some other interesting attack paths that you know, you, that would kind of fall out of that already. But um, it still definitely is an interesting option for for getting secrets. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. No, uh, going for work. They paid for it. I'm shocked. Uh,
I'm not, I'm not doubting, I'm just saying you're very lucky. Yeah, no, I, I, I recognize it. One of my favorite pieces of swag. Come on. Ah, patches. I suppose I could plug in. That might not be. Yeah, I was going to say, you're not actually plugged in the HDMI yet. <laughs> is that, uh, is that? That's live. That's live. All right, very good. Be extra safe. Is that? Okay. Well, it's not. It's not live, so. We were up for a moment, for a split second. Oh, there we are again. And you know what? It's not the end of the world. It's not like I'm running a damn Zoom call. You want to destroy a batter and a Mac faster than get on Zoom. Hmm? Yeah, but then I'd be on a company piece of equipment. Barely, in fact. <laughs> Eli's taking pictures.
there's three total trucks not talks yeah, not being recorded. Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, welcome back to, to ShmooCon afternoon. Um, a couple of uh, quick announcements and uh, stuff to give away. Uh, first off, we are sold out of bags of crap, or boxes of crap. We have lots of past uh, ShmooCon bags, so if you want some of our previous bags, we have those. All of the money for that, all of our, the money for our past conference t-shirts or our current conference t-shirts, all of that goes directly to donations either to Broadway Cares or to EFF. So please go make a donation and we'll give you uh, either a bag or a t-shirt as a thank you for donating to charity. So please uh, take advantage of that. Uh, if you have any feedback about the conference, things that went really well that you'd like to see again, things that maybe we struggled with or things that, were, that, were, that we could improve on, please let us know. Send us an email, feedback at schmoocon.org. We take every piece of feedback and we, we take it to heart. We want to, we do this uh, for the community. We're all part of the community. Um, and we want to make sure that we are doing what we can to do the best thing for the community. So let us know, feedback, feedback at schmoocon.org. Um, I have a couple of things to, to hand out. So first and foremost, uh, a nice schmoocon book. Since you're actually up front and this would hurt to throw, and you're taking actual physical notes. Thank you very much. All right, from one of our sponsors, I have a nice hat. I'm going to toss this this way. Good throw. And then uh, a deck of Shmukon cards for those of you that are going to play. The, you want it? Would you like it? Come up and get it. All right. Um, so our next presenter has been part of the Shmukon family for the almost this is, yeah, like 20 years now. 18. And you know. Uh, this isn't their, this is their, uh, they've presented at ShmooCon before. Um, they have been part of our family for a very long time. Uh, we've worked together on and off for 20, more than 20 years. So um, I'm really enthusiastic about this talk. Um, so please give a warm welcome to Carson, who will be talking about how to save your sock from stagnation. Hey folks. Thank you. Um, I am excited to be here. Uh, who here works in a sock? Some of you, who here is here by show of hands? Who are here is here? About half of you. Okay, so by that, my control group suggests all of you work in socks. <laughs> this talk is for you. Um, come on, trackpad, there we go. So let's say you work in a sock. Just, we're gonna make that assumption for a moment. Um, this is what your life probably feels like. You're overwhelmed, your alerts suck, your data sucks, your processes suck. In fact, everything sucks. And to make matters worse, nothing is getting better. You feel like this guy, right? We all have in the last three years. So you have, you might feel like you have two options. Rage quit or, or just give up, right? But there's a better way. Um, in this presentation, assuming my clicker works, in the next 18 minutes, I'm going to give you seven tools to make this suck less. And in the process, you and your fellow analysts and engineers and investigators and responders will learn constantly, feel heard, grow your careers, and translate your problems into action. The ultimate purpose of all of this is that you need to achieve, we all need to achieve, more effective and efficient analytics investigation and response. So I'm not saying you have to do all seven of these things, folks. All what I am saying is, is do one or two of them if you're not doing them already. If you're doing two of them already, do two more. And make them first class citizens in what you do as part of your business. 
Um, a little bit about me, I have been doing this too long. I've come by every gray hair on my head, honestly. This was this little patch right back here, that was solar winds. All right, this was log four, Jay, this one back here, I can't tell you about that one. Um, if, you, if you haven't ch already checked out uh, my book, I did write uh, a book on security operations eight years ago. That was actually my first ShmooCon presentation was on that book 10 years ago. Please don't pay for it, it's free. Uh, the second edition, 11 Strategies Here, came out uh, this past March. You can download that at link there. So I'm gonna go over these seven tools to make your day-to-day -day and your long-term feelings better. The first one is Detection V-Team. Now, we're gonna have coming into the SOC all of this stuff. We have our customer engagement, we have proactive hunt, we have our incidents, our pen tests, we have ideas from our, from our intel and our partner SOCs and from the vendors in the community. And, and all of this stuff is going to land as a set of ideas that we have. And what I would encourage you to think about doing in this first one is on some kind of routine basis, not every day, maybe every couple weeks, maybe once a month, whatever makes you happy, bringing together different people in your SOC, the people who are doing triage, the people who are doing detection authoring, your hunters, and your data wranglers, and talk about it in a V-team. And the idea is that this V-team, you, you organize all of your detection ideas in some way that, that makes sense to you. Maybe you prioritize them or stack rank them or something like that, and then you federate out execution. Maybe you use Agile, maybe you don't. Maybe you use 10% of Agile, maybe you don't, whatever. But the point is, is that you're getting together so that the engineers, if you have a separate engineering org, you might not, have line of sight to, to what and why and what are we doing and all this fun stuff. All right, so tool number one, detection V-team. I've seen people doing this for 20 years and it's really, really cool because they get a lot of ideas and then they turn those ideas into detections. Oh, don't forget, test your detections, folks. If a detection hasn't been tested, does it work? No, hell no. <laughs> All right, tool number two. So now we're doing our investigations. And by the way, the stuff in green is what you're probably already doing. These are the SOC processes that you probably already know about and seem very routine and familiar to you. Right, you have a new case, you investigate it, you're, maybe you respond, and next case. First thing I would add to that mix is something called a technical hot wash. What this is is that the end of every case that seemed interesting or different or new or big or awful, do a meeting of how did they do it. Meaning the people who are doing the investigation and response do a hot watch of the queries, the analytics, the detections, the data sources of how they figured out what they figured out. This is a training opportunity for the rest of your SOC because I'm guessing there's probably a few people in this room who have a training budget now that is smaller than what it was six months ago. Shot in the dark, right? This is training, and you build it in, and here's the thing, there's no prep. Come with your courage, come with your data, show us what you did, that's it. You don't have to write a 20-page PowerPoint, and you don't have to get on a plane. Now, from all of this stuff, you're gonna learn all these things. And some of this is gonna sound obvious, and some of it not. All right, so let me go through the list of all the things, and I'm, this is building to something, so just bear with me. You've got your data curation, better ingestion, better parsing, right? So from all this stuff, you're gonna follow work items. Maybe you're gonna do those immediately, maybe you're gonna do those in a year. But make this a first class citizen of what you do. You've got better um, decoration for your events, for your alerts, for your cases. Come on, PowerPoint. Improving your analytic notebooks writing better queries or functions or code. In fact, here's a thought. Your queries don't need to be perfect before you commit them to your code repo. Your queries actually might suck, but even if they suck, they're better than nothing. It's a way of bootstrapping your, your friends. Have your good analyst put their awful queries in the repo and then improve on them, even if they're not perfect. Or if, if you do wanna go um, into greater detail, you know, you've got your data source documentation. I'll talk about that in a uh, slide in, in just a second. And then your partner and service Rolodex, right? All of the major business owners, business units, services, 
IT infrastructure, keep that in a Rolodex. Are there anyone here who does not know what a Rolodex is? <laughs> it's a thing where you keep all of the names and addresses and telephone, I mean email addresses, of all of the people that matter to you, all right? So paper format. So every major, major incident you have, you should be doing this. Every say, major incident should yield one of the boxes in blue on this slide. And this is how you build in that improvement. And it doesn't have to be big. Now, let's talk about some of the data source uh, stuff for just a second. In the SOC, particularly for the investigators, anyone doing analysis of data that they're getting, they're traversing this evolution from top to bottom. That they go from the status of they don't know a data source exists, through identifying it, through one person doing a drug deal to get access, through having maintaining um, persistent access for the rest of the organization, documenting that, and then actually finally being able to depend on it, either by ingesting it themselves, parsing it themselves, or having some kind of data contract with the people who own it. And what I'm telling you is, is, is don't just make this drug deals, though that's gonna happen. And don't just make this one analyst. Write it down in a spreadsheet, an AD repository, a JIRA repository, whatever makes you happen, some structured format, because you're gonna accumulate dozens or hundreds of these. In fact, some of the best socks I've worked with yeah, they've got great seams, and folks, I've clocked thousands of hours in front of seams, but the best socks I've worked with actually control less than 10% of their data estate, meaning they are accessing dozens if not hundreds of data lakes outside their control. And this is why you've got to turn this into a routine process. And a routine process, you build structure around and documenting it. I digress. Tool number three, response automation. A bit of, of uh, motherhood and apple pie here, but um, watch for the fun stuff. All right, so you're going to do your investigation response, your, your responders, your, your analysts, whatever, they're going to say, I need to do a thing. You're going to have some response from work. In fact, you might not have only one. Maybe it's a sore, maybe it's not. I don't care. And you're already thinking about acting on machines and IPs, right? We all think about blocking IP addresses. Is that the only thing we can do to stop an adversary in an incident? No, right, we've got other options. Anyone throw out ideas? Hash, yeah, what else? Accounts, what else? All kinds of stuff. What I'm, the first thing I wanna encourage people to think about is, is think about those other levers you're gonna pull, right? Experience socks that I work with will have dozens of different ways of responding and different, dozens of different systems they can potentially act against. Here's one thing you not, might not be thinking of, your commerce and billing systems, particularly if you are a service provider, or provide anything in the cloud to someone else. So when we're doing this, when we're just getting started, um, I'm gonna steal a page from JHU APL, who came out with a really nice framework, I'll put up a link in just a second, that talked about how do you decompose the problem of SOAR, and what do you do first? And what they talk about is what I recommend as well, and that is, is focus on high benefit, low regret. The things that if you screw up, you're not going to be in trouble or your vice president's not going to call you or you're out of a job or in what I call a resume generating event. In fact, what I would encourage you to start with in this area is people are usually like, oh, I'm going to shoot laser beams at the cyber adversary. No, you're going to automate ticket creation first more likely, meaning create more rhythm, repeatability, efficiency, and effectiveness in how you're talking to other people with the following caveat, don't become a spam cannon, right? Don't create a ticket storm for another team. And there's different ways to do this in different frameworks, right? So the point is, is if we're thinking about response automation and you haven't yet done an actual eviction action, think about instead starting about taking all that ticket filing you have to other teams and automate that first, because it's gonna get you um, some experience. I'll take questions at the end. Um, all right, let's talk about Hunt. All right, everybody talks about Hunt. Let me first talk about what I don't mean when I say Hunt. Do I mean ordinary alert investigation? Hell no. Do I mean wandering around aimlessly in data? <laughs> Hell no. All right, when I say hunt, it's a hell of an overloaded term, folks. 
I'm talking about proactively searching through all of our stuff to look for malicious and suspicious activities that evaded detection, that's routine, all right? And I adapted this definition with Trellix. Thank you, Trellix. All right, so let's, let's decompose Hunt and talk about um, how do we make that more awesome. Now, we all think about Hunt as a proactive activity. Usually, it's a good time. So you're getting all this stuff in and you're creating your Hunt. All right, so think back to the detection B team I talked about in tool number one, same idea. You're getting people together and you're talking about your ideas for Hunt. Here's where it gets more fun. Come on, PowerPoint. You're going to prepare in your get data and you're going to set in your hunt traps. Now your hunt traps probably feel a little bit like detections, don't they? We're not quite there yet. All right. Go back to that previous point where I talked about most of your data estate is data you don't control. One of the things I would encourage you to think about doing in your hunt is don't feel like you need to pull it into your sim. That could be expensive. Use a framework to execute query on timer and give you those results back. It's, you're gonna achieve so much more with so much less effort via feeling like you must ingest it into your own seam. So have some automation framework native to whatever makes you happy, perhaps your cloud, perhaps not, to do a query on timer because the results are your hunt traps. From there, that comes to your reporting out, right, and your detections. So, and this one, uh, one more click. Now, if during a hunt, a very smart person finds random bad stuff, does that mean that they proved their hypothesis? No. One of the most important things I see about proactive hunt here is helping people differentiate and have the discipline to know the difference between random bad stuff and I proved or dis disproved my hypothesis. In fact, every major hunt I'm involved with, they're gonna find random bad stuff, right? So we wanna have a way of dealing with that. I'm gonna show you a method that um, and we can handle that in just a second. Tool number five, standard operating procedures. Now, uh, in literally everything we do, new case types, major incidents, we've got new better tools, we've got our hunts, we screw up, there's reorgs. Any of this stuff is going to trigger changes to our playbooks, our SOPs, whatever you call them. And I'm again gonna conflate them because to, in this context, it doesn't really matter. Here is my message to you. Updating and using SOPs is the responsibility not of one person or the leads or PM or a tech writer, it's all of your responsibility. And it's the number one way you defend against turnover. I've been doing this for 20 years. How often do you think I read SOPs? I'm serious. I've been doing this 20 years. How often am I looking at an SOP? Anyone? Pretty much every day. Because I can't keep track of the literally 100 SOPs that is in my organization because we have so many different incident types. So what I'm trying to tell you is no one is above this. And anyone who says to you that they're above this needs to check their ego at the door. So what I would encourage you to think about doing is make updating SOP the responsibility of everyone in the organization. And the vetting, I'm done with the slide, you can take pictures, thank you. Um, the vetting is gonna be commensurate with how big of an update is that? Like did someone fix a typo? Does it need to go through the boss's boss? No, of course not. But if we're gonna write some new SOP that had, could have major implications, like some new response thing, we're turning stuff off, and if it went bad, a VP is gonna get a call or, or the president or whatever, yeah, then that's gonna require more vetting. Everybody's job. Number six, post-incident review. This is my, this is a fun one. All right, when I say post-incident review, I mean the set of processes that are involved in capturing what went wrong and then tracking that to its resolution. So when I say PIR, I'm referring to, you know, a thing that we go and fix, all right? So you're doing your incidents, you know, you're doing response, and then here's the first thing. As soon as your incident starts, you write, start writing down what goes wrong almost immediately into what I'll politely refer to as the slop bucket. 
And it, every time you write down a slot PIR, that should take you less than 30 seconds. No complicated forms, no questionnaires, one sentence in a spreadsheet or on a page. Think of them like rough notes. Oh, I didn't have the data I need, Sally screwed up, you know, Mark, Mark bailed over there, I couldn't get a hold of Dave, whatever. Whatever went wrong, write down one sentence in the heat of the moment right there, what screwed up because you're gonna come back to it later. After this incident is over, you have what I'll refer to as your slop grooming session. Very, very high end right here, folks. You take, you take everybody's slop and then you make real PIRs out of them because I guarantee you all the stuff that happened during the incident, if you didn't write down the slop then, you forgot about it. And it was probably the really bad stuff that happened when you were busy and completely overloaded because you're getting crispy on an on 8 p.m. on a Friday because that's when all incidents happen, folks, right? So from there, and then this is the other piece, is assign someone in your SOC or around your SOC or something like that to be generally responsible for tracking this stuff. Maybe you sign out, assign them out to other organizations, maybe they're internal, whatever. But the point is, is that you have that focal point or a couple focal points to track this stuff. Maybe it's analyst, maybe it's a PM, maybe it's an engineer, maybe it's lead, whatever, right? But the point is you're tracking them to resolution. I have three minutes, I need to hurry up. Tool number seven, this is my last one. Stronger together. So when we have incidents, we're gonna engage other parties. Was that you? How did this work? Is this bad? I don't understand, all of that stuff. And they're gonna help you understand, you know, the whys of the prevention, detection, et cetera, right? Here's what you're probably not thinking about as much. Number one, you might be thinking about having some kind of onboarding program for new services, new organizations, new acquisitions coming in, and onboarding to security generally, or maybe the SOC itself. And that's gonna help you support hygiene and patching generally, right? Here's something you might not be thinking about, and that is, is, is not just using that engagement for them to know who to call when bad stuff happens, but think about um, them participating in your hunt and your detection writing, because they're gonna know more about their businesses than you will. And rather than being, them being your noisiest detractors, actually have them come in, play by a set of rules, that they sign or whatever that make sure they don't do dumb things like escalating to the wrong place or being becoming an insider threat, right? We have to have some guardrails against that. Democratize this. Now, um, I have one minute left, so I'm gonna wrap up and say, you're also probably thinking at this point, how do I make all of this happen? I don't have time to do any of this. To a degree, if you start doing this, you're gonna make more time for yourselves. I would argue we feel like and we get um, in a rut and oftentimes think about or lose sight of what the things that we're doing that we feel are required but aren't. So talk to your lawyers, talk to your compliance people. I bet you you're doing a lot more than you necessarily need to and you could just stop, just stop. So with that, um, you can implement any of this. Don't feel like you need to go from zero to 100. Don't feel like you need to go from zero to all seven. Socks of all sizes and ages are doing or not doing this stuff and I'd encourage you to do more of it. If you're doing this right, your analysts will want to make time for this. They will, people who normally feel like it's a nine to five job or whatever hours your on-call rotation is, may feel like they're gonna put more time in and they're gonna want to do this, and that's how you start burning down some of those other problems. And then finally, if you're doing this right, that's gonna give them capacity, so that the next solar winds hits, or whatever major incident comes down the line, they've got time, because they're gonna stop doing this momentarily, and focus on the incident. So with that, I've got the seven techniques. I think I'm gonna get about to get booted off the stage. Why don't I take questions on the side? So. Thank you.
was happening. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Oh, that's great.
All right, uh, welcome to the 3.30 talk, running a couple minutes late, sorry about that. Please continue to keep your masks on throughout the conference. We have available in registration uh, boxes of old stuff uh, that you can buy and we'll get out of the way so that Christopher can talk to you about his subject, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I've been attending ShmooCon for well over a decade now, and this is the first time I was convinced to submit to the call for papers. So I'm happy to be here to present about fault injection. And just to quickly elaborate on the presentation title, the lowering of a theater curtain signifies the end of an act or performance, and I think you'll find this is really a fitting metaphor. I found it frustrating while researching this topic because resources mostly fall into two categories. Tutorials on well understood targets, or advanced academic papers typically covering specific techniques. So I hope to fill the gap with a case study documenting my process of exploring a new target from start to finish. If you're watching this, I assume you have at least some basic prior experience of microcontrollers. However, I speak from the perspective of a beginner to fault injection, as this was my first complete success using these techniques. And so, this story begins much the same way as many of my hardware reverse engineering adventures. A late night impulse purchase. Anticipation as it slowly transported from a different, uh, distant country, then the frustrating realization that it doesn't work quite the way that I want it to. Subsequent sleepless nights in pursuit of a workaround, and finally, at least in this case, a satisfying conclusion. The device that caught my attention this time is this RF transceiver module. It is a small, castellated, postage stamp style board with an integrated two watt power amplifier targeting either VHF or UHF. You can think of it as a walkie-talkie on a chip that you can add to a design for less than the cost of a ticket to the cinema. The product photos, unfortunately, don't reveal a whole lot of detail. The bottom of the module has labeled pads for surface mount application, while the top is completely obscured by a metal shielding can. The four unlabeled pads on the bottom are for a programming interface, but I'll explain this later. Now here's a block diagram illustrating how the manufacturer intends the product to be used. You can see that adding just a few additional components results in a complete and functional radio design that you could use to communicate with other analog, frequently modulated radios. And this is a compelling use case on its own, but I personally find digital radio modes to be a whole lot more interesting. So what will it take to get this module to support other modes like DMR or P25 or the more recent community effort, M17? Without getting into too much detail, these modes all use four symbol frequency shift keying mod modulation which would likely get destroyed by internal filtering. Now let's take a look at the command set. If you've ever experienced the joy of working with a dial-up modem, this might look a little more, <laughs> look a little familiar to you. The module implements a haze-like command set exposed via a serial port. A small number of attention commands provide a mechanism for configuring various parameters. Unfortunately, I had already heard reports that despite having options to disable filtering, it wasn't sufficient. An inconvenient workaround is to open the module and completely bypass its internal mo uh, microcontroller for direct control. So after removing the shielding can with a hot air rework station, we get our first glimpse at the internals. The upper left section includes the part that exposes the command set over serial port. The chip module, or the chip marking indicates it's a 0C002. There's no vendor marking. So great, I've never heard of one of these before. The entire right side of the module corresponds to the integrated power amplifier and supporting circuitry. And in the bottom left, there's the actual RF transceiver component. And this is the chip used at the heart of many radios, including the notorious Pofeng UV5R. It's also used in many other radios, including the MDUV380, the HD1, the GD77, and so on. So it really is a walkie-talkie on a chip. Now many of the radios that I mentioned are DMR capable radios supported by OpenRTX. OpenRTX is a custom from scratch firmware replacement for digital amateur radios, primarily supporting the M17 digital mode. Conveniently, it includes a driver for our transceiver component. And most importantly, the authors discovered that an undocumented register needs to be poked in order for the transceiver to work well for digital modes. If I ever wanted to build something at scale with these modules, removing the shielding can and bypassing the microcontroller sounds really inconvenient. So the next step is figuring out if it's possible to either patch the microcontroller's ex existing firmware 
in order to support this setting or outright replace it with a new one. Through various part inventory websites, I found that this might be the Renaissance R5R0C002. If you've never heard of them, you might be surprised to know Renaissance is consistently one of the top suppliers of microcontrollers in the world. You would never know this by looking at popular parts using hobbyist designs. And like many other semiconductor companies, Renaissance is really several other semiconductor companies in a trench coat, including NEC and the chip units of Mitsubishi and Hitachi. But unfortunately for me, Renaissance doesn't even acknowledge that this part exists, and it seemed impossible to locate the correct data sheet. So I continued digging to try to find more information on this part. And by the way, if anyone knows the name of their strange cartoon fish mascot, I'd really love to know. <laughs> Forum posts like this one suggest a couple of compatible part numbers that I could use as a starting point. And this is certainly better than nothing. These part numbers are for microcontrollers using the R8C tiny architecture belonging to group 1B. As far as I can tell, the group designation is an attempt to classify the dizzying number of capacity and peripheral combinations. And thankfully, there are actually data sheets available for these parts. So here's a quick overview of the architecture. The R8C product line was designed to be a cost-reduced subset of its parent M16 family. The internal data bus has been shrunk into eight bits, and there are 89 instructions with eight addressing modes. There's also a simple flash programming protocol, and there's support for flash memory protection. So let's look at this protection scheme a little more closely. This is the fixed interrupt vector uh, table, which resides in the last page of the microcontroller's flash memory. The high bytes, however, are partially reserved for an ID code consisting of seven bytes. In programming mode, the boot ROM uses this ID code as a password to unlock access to the memory flash pages. Keep in mind that this ID code has nothing to do with the interrupts. It's just where the manufacturer decided to store this sequence. And product designers can optionally configure the sequence to protect their firmware from tampering or theft. Since reading, writing, and even erasing the flash memory is impossible without first unlocking the boot ROM with a valid ID code, theoretically. I tried to implement the flash programming protocol, but I couldn't get a response from the chip. So I kept searching, and eventually I did locate the correct data sheet. Apparently this is a further cost-reduced part that was only ever offered to the Asia market segment. And it turns out the specific programming mode that I tried is not supported. Now once I switched to the mode that's actually supported by the boot ROM, I was able to get a response. Ordinarily, a device with an ID code of all once is automatically unlocked by the boot ROM, and this is a requirement so that blank flash cells in a new factory part can be programmed. That's definitely not the case here according to the status register, so I had to find a way around this. I wasn't looking to reinvent the wheel, so I immediately went looking for any known attacks against this protection scheme. I stumbled across this presentation. It's not specifically about R8C, but knowing that it's a descendant of the M16C architecture, I figured there might be some important lessons to learn. So Serge and Mikwa identified a textbook timing attack against the boot ROM used by an embedded controller in a Toshiba Portage laptop. A pin on the microcontroller uh, is used to indicate boot ROM activity, and it actually leaks information while processing an unlock request. By measuring time deltas, the ID code can actually be guessed byte by byte. Unfortunately, my part has no such pin, but maybe this information could be found through a power analysis side channel. I really wanted to get a better understanding of these techniques anyway. Now, while prototyping my attack, I used the Chip Whisperer Lite. I primarily wanted to take advantage of its Python framework and Jupyter notebooks in order to get up and running quickly. And this is far from the only option, though. You might be better suited using an oscilloscope and a microcontroller dev kit that you already have. For fault injection experiments, don't forget to add a fast switching end channel MOSFET. Here's a schematic diagram for my device under test. In order to isolate the microcontroller from other components on the RF transceiver module, I removed it using hot air and placed it onto a breakout board. The four pins used are the same ones exposed uh, through the unlabeled pads on the bottom of the module. Now some of the supporting components in this uh, diagram changed over time such as removing the capacitors for glitching, but this was a good starting point to, to see how the beha behavior uh, was on this module. So using the setup, I was able to collect some power trace data uh, during unlock requests and ignore the missing axes labels for now. But what stands out most is that with incorrect attempts, regardless of the number of bits or bytes correct, the plot shows seven evenly spaced segments corresponding to the number of bytes in the ID code. 
This suggests that the boot ROM is comparing in constant time and that it's not vulnerable to the same type of attack. Additionally, on a successful comparison, seven more segments are present. And I kind of speculate that this is a secondary validation, maybe as a mitigation against fault injection attacks or some other unintentionally successful comparison. Either way, it would be significantly more difficult to successfully land a glitch twice with the correct timing. So during boot ROM execution, this microcontroller is clocked by an internal reference running somewhere around eight megahertz, and that's further divided by 32 to present a system clock of only 125 kilohertz. While this makes for a slow moving target, it introduces a whole lot of jitter. You might be able to see the signal shifting side to side uh, between frames of this animation of successive unlock attempts. The Chip Whisper API includes some interesting pre-processing techniques for dealing with jittery traces, but I think in this case my traces are just too far gone. So over the course of several days, I collected hundreds of thousands of power traces of unlock attempts. I tried plotting the data in various ways of hoping to find some indication of ID code, bits or bytes leaking through power consumption. And here you can see in these two waterfall plots, there's uh, a pretty drastic difference by introducing these pre-processing techniques. There's significant artifacts due to the excessive jitter. I also attempted a correlation power analysis, which is a very interesting and, and successful side channel attack, primarily for leaking keys from cryptographic implementations. But in this case, the ID code verification is significantly less complicated, and I think there just isn't enough information embedded in the, the power trace data. Even after enlisting the help of a few friends, it looked like there was really nothing more to be gained on this front. So onward to fault injection. The <clears throat> the classic fault injection attacks are clock and crowbar glitching. And both can cause microcontrollers to behave erratically, but crowbar glitching is really the only option of the two for this target. With a crowbar glitch, the microcontroller's power supply is momentarily shorted to ground. And this, this can cause instructions to be skipped or modified, register contents to change, and this sounds like a good approach for my problem. But the, the real important question is when. I got very fixated to the idea that I either needed to glitch the actual unlock attempt or otherwise be able to modify the status register reported by the lock state. After several nights, I had nothing to show for my efforts. So I did what any reasonable person would do and I gave up, at least for a few weeks. <laughs> Revisiting the problem with a clear mind, I decided to ignore the ID code unlock procedure completely and just directly try glitching against flash page reads. It took some trial and error to find a good parameter range, but I settled on this functional glitching routine. It's important to keep the loop as tight as possible by avoiding any extra commands or resets in order to reduce the time per iteration, since this could require thousands of attempts to get right. However, a successful glitch during a flash page read while locked causes the microcontroller to emit a 256 byte page of data instead of nothing at all. This doesn't necessarily mean a valid ID code, but it's quick to slice it out of the expected offsets and then verify it through an unlock attempt. And so the culmination of this effort leads to this exciting moment, a tool to extract the ID code from a protected flash and dump the full contents. As it runs, glitches are swept over flash page read attempts. Occasionally, various pages of flash are dumped and possible ID codes are extracted and tested. This can take anywhere from a few seconds to a few hours, depending on how lucky you are. Until finally, a successful match. So now we can unlock the boot ROM and do whatever we want to the flash memory. Here I've saved a copy of the contents for analysis. And maybe I can patch it once I get some more sleep. So in the end, I learned that fault injection attacks really aren't just a hoax by big infosec to sell more glitches. These are practical attacks that are within reach. I would also like to make a desperate plea that if you find yourself motivated by a piece of hardware, please save all of the relevant data sheets and tools that you can find before they disappear forever. And of course, if I don't miss the publication deadline, be on the lookout for the full write-up and code in the next issue of POC or GTFO. And one last thing, thanks to Travis Goodspeed and a bottle of fuming red nitric acid, we can see what's really inside of this chip. Hopefully you had an opportunity to see his presentation earlier today. So the part number there belongs to components in a completely different group, and this is evidence that the die is shared by multiple parts in the same family. 
and also check out that date code from 1995. That's a really long legacy for a part that you can buy in a uh, product sold today. And this is the end of the story for now, so thank you. <laughs> Do I have time for questions? No time for questions. So if you want to chat about it, find me around the conference. Thank you. You're up on both of them. <laughs> Did your slides have any sort of audio in them?
Testing, one, two, three. All of the underlying technology to do. Okay. Yeah, like one of the things with the vulnerability class is that we're supposed to give you know Microsoft specific guidance and like you know, okay, well Microsoft says to do this, that, and the other thing for your code, but then also use our platforms for fuzzing, use our platforms for static analysis, that right, kind of yeah. stuff. That'll be the kind of guidance I'll have to get like after the fact. Like I'll have the baseline material, but then like what do you want the prevention, detection, mitigation guidance to your developers to be? Like, yeah. Most of that is open. It's just like making sure you get all the right guidance documents and whatnot. Alright, so. we got three minutes to go, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started so we're not in your time. All right. Uh, welcome back, Schmoocon 2023. Uh, a few things to give away, a couple of announcements. Again, we absolutely take every bit of feedback that you give us to heart. So if you have anything that you've loved, anything that you think that we could improve on, send us feedback. We, we read every single th email that you send us and we take it to heart. So feedback, feedback at schmoocon.org. Uh, please let us know what, we're, what things you think we're doing great, what things we, need, we could do better. Um, we don't have anything else uh, to announce, and I know our next speaker is going to be pressed, pressed for time. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and toss these out. Is somebody, is there anybody drinking water today? You're drinking water. Would you like a water bottle? This is going to hurt if I throw it. So why don't you come up and, all right, are you all right? I'm going to throw it past you. Is anybody actually taking notes with a pen and pencil? You're taking actual physical notes? You can come up and get a notebook. I'm not gonna throw this. This will damage the projector if I screw up. And the last thing I wanna do is uh, screw up a projector because that'd come out of my paycheck. All right, we still have a number of t-shirts that are available, uh, uh, no more bag boxes of crap. We still have a number of uh, past conference bags. Again, all of the t-shirts, all of the, the uh, past conference bags, those are available. Uh, as a reward for donating to charity. Uh, so for Broadway Cares or for e the EFF, you come give us some money and we give you a reward uh, as a thank you. Um, so please uh, donate, donate some money to charity and we'll give you a reward and say thank you for that. Um, without any further ado to give uh, our next presenter uh, as much time as possible, uh, our next presenter has been at the forefront of uh, open source security training for a really long time with some absolutely wonderful content that's freely available. Please give a warm welcome to Zeno, who will be talking about Open Security Training 2. All right, hello everyone. Uh, happy to be here. This was me back in 2012. And uh, thanks to low lighting and the magic of blurry videos, you can see that I haven't aged a day in a decade. So what was I talking about back then? I was talking about OST1, as I now call it, OpenSecurityTraining.info. And what that was, was basically, at the time, functionally a hobby project. So minority of my time. But the basic idea was I was working for MITRE at the time, and they had an internal training program. I wanted to make sure that my classes didn't get stuck inside of MITRE and then died after I left, because I knew it wouldn't be there my entire life. So they had one of those policies that says, we own everything you do, even outside of work. So I had to navigate through the public 
public disclosure process and get my internal training released. And once I had figured that out, then I could get a bunch of other MITRE employees' internal trainings released. And so that was OST1. And so basically, you know, up until I left MITRE, that was maybe 10% of my time maximum, just kind of hobby project on the side. I left MITRE, did a startup. Uh, the startup magically and mysteriously ended up at Apple. And I went into that knowing that if I go to Apple, I can't do anything with OST2 or OST at the time uh, because Apple's very tight-lipped and I didn't want to bother with all of the navigating their public release process. But I also knew that if I did that, then when I left Apple, I would be able to spend all of my time on this. And that's exactly where I am right now. So at this point, OST2, the new relaunch that happened in uh, summer of 2021, this is a proper 501c3 charity. Uh, this is to help differentiate us from the plethora of uh, paid for-profit training companies. It's my full-time job, like I said, and I see it as basically a way for instructors, people who want to be teaching, want to be skilling up other people, I see it as a way to basically maximize their impact and teach thousands of people instead of dozens of students at a time. So I'm gonna to talk to you about the tactics and the strategy. We're gonna start with tactics. Uh, how are we gonna build out this nonprofit over time? The tactics is that we start by having an emphasis on quality. Whereas OST1 was basically best effort, you know, even if there's only slides available, let's just throw it up on the website, something's better than nothing. Well, this time around, uh, the basic idea is, let's make sure that these are exactly the same quality of classes that you would get if you were attending a private training, if you're attending you know, a corporate training. And so those instructors who want to do private engagements, they can continue to do that, they can make money that way. I'm at a point where I don't really want to do that and I turn down things, but I still do actually do some uh, conference training specifically to show other instructors that you can actually put your stuff available completely for free online and people will still show up at your trainings at conferences. And my, uh, you know, this is counterintuitive, the whole, you know, why buy the cow if you can get the milk for free. Uh, my recognition based on seeing the way that things work with real engineers, you know, as they um, mature and evolve into their uh, career, eventually you get too busy to do a lot of stuff, right? You don't have the free time. You have, you know, family obligations, you have work obligations. So the people who are the typical audience for paid in-person training, they have more money than time, whereas the people who are the typical audience for free online training, it's your college students, it's your junior engineers who have more time than money. So it's a largely disjoint set but uh, you know each set appreciates the availability you know of the other options okay so I've budgeted uh, one minute per class for myself to give you just a flavor of like the depth of these classes just to say these are not like intro classes of like let's spend 30 minutes showing you how to use Metasploit or something like that these are deep classes the the minimum requirement is a day of class where a day could be you know six hours eight hours somewhere in there because in practice paid trainings you know a day is maybe uh, 68 hours. So we're going to start with the symbolic analysis class by Tyus from Intel Storm. So this class, she talks about symbolic analysis, so satisfiability uh, problem and, you know, how you can represent things in Boolean logic, uh, how you have theorem solving, stuff like that. And basically then first she starts with covering things like how to use Z3 in order to represent assembly language in a way where you can do constraint solving on that to find uh, you know, what particular conditions would exercise particular constraints in uh, some assembly language. Then she moves on to using tools like Anger. Uh, and so she does her class a little bit different from other instructors. She doesn't do slides. Uh, she does Jupyter Notebooks and uh, basically use the Python directly in the, the class. She'll give you a binary. She'll say, okay, here's the binary. The binary expects some sort of input. Now we're gonna use Anger. We're gonna use the, the Python APIs to figure out what are the expectations of this binary. So in this case, a little crack me that expects some magic password in. And so a normal reverse engineer would have to just eyeball that, read all the code, figure it out, and then learn Learning tools like Anger for symbolic analysis let you go ahead and do all of that in a much more automated fashion, save yourself a whole bunch of time, solve CTFs way faster. She has a bunch of other stuff she talks about, again, don't have time for it, a symbolic memory. Uh, Binary Bomb Lab is the thing in our assembly classes that we use. It's uh, based on the, the CMU Carnegie Mellon Binary Bomb, and in our assembly class, we use the Binary Bomb and we say, here's how you're going to learn assembly. You're gonna read a bunch of code and that's how you'll reinforce your learning. She covers in her class, here's how you don't have to read a bunch of code, just learn how to use the tools to automatically solve these sort of problems. All right, then we have a C++ reverse engineering class by Gal, 
And in her class, she's looking at, you know, take some tool like IDA, Interactive Disassembler, and if you're reading some code that happens to have been programmed in C++, then there's going to be things like C++ objects that are going to be in play. And the better that you understand the objects and the class hierarchies and stuff like that, the better you'll be able to apply semantically meaningful things to, you know, okay, well, this is actually a name field of an object. This is an age feed field of an object. She covers things like inheritance, and there, you know, the point is, uh, in object-oriented languages, you have uh, child, children and parents, and a child will inherit uh, members and functions and stuff like that from its uh, parent. And so she covers things like V tables, which are virtual function tables. That's the particular instantiation of, um, of a function inheritance in C++, and then cover things like virtual function uh, table, uh, virtual function calls. And all of this really gets to just the point of you know, if you're a reverse engineer, there are C++ isms which you may not necessarily know if you're not normally doing C++ reverse engineering. I do reversing, mostly on firmware stuff, mostly not written in C++. So I liked this class because I took this class as a student and it's like, okay, I don't know these sort of things already because that's not what I normally encounter. And now I feel much more prepared if and when I encounter C++ in, you know, for instance, uh, kernel for, uh, for instance. Again, other topics I don't have time to cover, uh, C++ templates and the so forth. Uh, I have a class on Intel firmware attack and defense, and basically in this class I cover things such as uh, how you can access the Intel spy flash memory map IO interface. So they've just got some little memory region and you've got to learn how to read their documentation. And if you have that, then you can say, okay, if I poke these memory locations in this order and I have particular things, then magic happens and now we have spy flash reads and writes. This could be used uh, defensively if you're doing firmware forensics to read out a spy flash. It can be used offensively if you want to break a machine. There's a, you know, yeah. I was going to say, there's a, there's a talk uh, tomorrow about UEFI and firmware breaking and stuff like that, but, you know, I have a full other class that talks about why, you know, you can potentially make it so that they're not bricked because we look at things down at the hardware level. But the Intel firmware attack and defense class is really all based around um, uh, threat modeling of what sort of defensive mechanisms that BIOS vendors need to apply and if they don't do this, then everything is vulnerable. And so I expect that tomorrow's talk is very much about this. The green is a defensive mechanism. The red is a countermeasure that the attacker, you know, counters the defense. And so it goes green, red, green, red, back and forth. If the BIOS vendor doesn't do every single green thing in this chart, then it's automatically going to be an exploitable BIOS where they can infect it, break it, and so forth. And again, other things, threat modeling for SMM, sleep-wake attacks. Uh, we have another instructor, Piotr. He is then building on top of this firmware. Like that class was a x86, like firmware agnostic kind of thing. It's just how x86 hardware works. Piotr introduces things like UEFI. Now, at this point, I didn't know how to show his videos because uh, it's mostly like a slide per video kind of thing. So I figured I'll show you, you know, very quickly like what it looks like to actually run around in a class on OSD2. So it's videos, it's forums where you can ask questions, get them answered. You can track your progress. Uh, you can go do exercises. Uh, you can answer questions. So again, this is just to differentiate from OST1 where it was literally slap up some PDFs, slap up a YouTube video, call it a day. So now it's like an actual proper like reinforce your learning sort of environment. But then I did figure out how to make some videos and so here's just a quick like one second per slide kind of thing for Piotr's class. It talks about the basics, background of UEFI, the history, how things evolved, how the interface is used by modern firmware on basically uh, every, other, every x86 system that you're using out there, and so on. And then, interestingly, Piotr and uh, the 3M Deb crew, Michal as well, uh, they are big open source advocates, so they're, they're big into Coreboot. Coreboot is an alternative firmware uh, instead of UEFI, where basically it's fully open source. This is used on all uh, Google Chromebooks because the, the founder of it works at Google. And so this is just sort of an alternative for those of you who are, you know, big emphasis on open source and visibility into your firmware. Instead of having to reverse engineer things, you can start to just look at the source code. And it goes through, you know, the, the different boot stages and how that differs from UEFI as we cover elsewhere. All right, and my final, like, uh, one minute through thing is the Vulnerabilities 1001 class. 
Uh, this has a very generic name because it actually has two different audiences that we're trying to serve here. This is both a secure development class, so it's called C family because we're saying this is vulnerabilities in C, C++, Objective-C, not PHP and Java and other things. And it's implementation vulnerabilities uh, because we're not talking about logic bugs, we're not talking about uh, command injections, we're talking about your traditional memory corruption implementation vulnerabilities that you would find in C programs. So Casey and I uh, teach this class and basically uh, I taught this internally at Apple to basically say, dear developers, stop making the same vulnerabilities over and over again. My recognition from having worked with some extremely good vulnerability hunters is that over time, how do they find vulnerabilities? And my theory is that it's really just advanced human pattern recognition. So basically, they've looked at so many bugs over so long of a period that they can tell when something seems sketchy. They just know there's a pattern there. So I call this the exploity sense, and what I'm trying to do is teach vulnerability hunters and developers you know, to develop their own exploity sense and recognize the recurring patterns that occur over and over again. And so this is secure programming as you've not seen it taught by anyone else. This is basically focus on pattern recognition. So we cover a bunch of different examples, over three dozen examples covering stack overflow, heap overflow, integer overflow, and so forth. And it's all about sort of breaking down some of the barriers to psychological acceptance by developers. And of course, the, the vulnerability hunters just want to check it out anyways. But barriers to acceptance are, for instance, if you're a firmware developer and I give you an example that's a browser bug, you're going to think, ah, that's a browser bug doesn't apply to me. So we're trying to like split it up and show server, desktop, mobile embedded, user space, kernel, virtualization, firmware to say, you know, look, us security people we know, a buffer overflow is a buffer overflow, but it helps the developers to say, no, here's one that's really close to you and your code base. Furthermore, all the places that have little uh, moon icons, those are actually zero days that were caught in the wild so that they don't think like, okay, well, is this ever really happening? Do, do people actually exploit these? And then finally, the things with the little ninja next to them, this is again, developers in particular, they say, uh, I don't think that's exploitable. Like that seems too complicated, too obscure, too abstract. And so one of the big things we focus on is walking the people through the code. We show an attacker controlled input acid flowing through the code, propagating through, leading to under copies, or sorry, under allocations, overflows, uh, leading to actual exploitation. And so we walk people occasionally through the actual exploit because this is not an exploit class, but it really helps developers for their psychological acceptance if you can take them step by step by step, assuming absolutely no knowledge of assembly and say, here is exactly how an attacker would exploit this vulnerability. And then they say, okay, yeah, I get it. It's just a different type of engineering. All right, so just an FYI, if you're interested in that kind of thing, we have a beta test of the next class coming up in the next month or so. So check out these links. If you're a developer, you can go there. And if you're a hunter, you can go there. The, the vulnerabilities 1001 is stack overflow, heap overflow, integer overflow, that kind of stuff. These are the new types of vulnerabilities that we cover in this next class. Uh, and again, it'll be starting in about a month or so. All right, so stepping back, that was tactics, okay? Take a breath, tactics. Now we're gonna talk strategy. So the strategy here is, okay, we've got a bunch of really technical classes, what are we gonna actually do with those? So the most important thing is to build out learning paths where we take the classes, we sequence them, we figure out what the right ordering of prerequisites to follow on material is, and we say, what is the collection of classes that leads to a capacity to work in a particular job role? And furthermore, this is really important to me, I really hate when I see this wasted effort of people reinventing the wheel and like every reverse engineering class teaching a little bit of assembly at the beginning, every vulnerabilities class teaching a little bit of assembly at the beginning. We need to break things up and figure out how can we reuse material to get the maximum bang for the buck here. So if, for instance, I'm trying to get students to like an architectural type role, like what I used to do at Apple, I gotta say, how do I actually get them there? So I start with, okay, you need to know some assembly because you may need to step into a debugger at some point. Uh, if you're gonna learn assembly, I consider the best way to do that to be able to read C source code and then look at the assembly for that source code and that'll help reinforce it. Then if you're gonna have to look at binaries at some point where you don't have the source code, you need to have a debugger in your pocket, whether you're interested in Linux, it's GDB. If you're interested in Windows, WinDebug. Then you cover things like operating systems internals for a particular platform, x86 in this case, but it could be ARM. We can build parallel versions of this for ARM and MIPS, everything else. But that covers the things like segmentation, paging, interrupts, port IO, all Intel specific things that virtualization, firmware, and operating systems people need to know about. But to actually do that as hands-on, you need to kernel debug your way so that you can look at a model specific register. So we cover a more advanced kernel debugging class as well. 
Then if you want to get into that firmware class, well, that depends on some of that OS internal stuff that I mentioned, but we also need a simulation environment because there's things in firmware like system management mode or the reset vector where like the CPU actually starts at the zeroth instruction. Uh, you need a full system simulator for that and Simix happens to be exactly the one that Intel themselves use for pre-silicon validation. And that finally gets you to the point where, okay, now I can say you know something about firmware. Maybe you know also these other firmwares, UEFI and Coreboot. Now I can take you up a level, abstract it, and say it's not just about UEFI, it's not just about Coreboot. What are the design paradigms that everybody makes the same mistake over and over across all sorts of different firmwares? And, you know, that's the kind of thing where I've been uh, lucky to have that sort of visibility. Now, that was build a system security architect. I've already got all of these classes built where I can now start building reverse engineers. Reverse engineers need to know assembly, of course. Uh, so we start from that. And then there's some classes, like Tyus's class on symbolic analysis, where that's it. That's all of the prerequisite that you have. You know assembly, you can go start doing anger, and you're good to go. Now, what a lot of people think about when they think about static analysis is they think about the tools and learning the tools, things like IDA, things like Ghidra. And so we're going to be teaching these a little bit different here because the first assembly class, like I mentioned, we have a binary bomb lab. That's how we reinforce uh, how to learn assembly. But I want to allow people who know they're trying to become a reverse engineer to immediately right from the first assembly class use Ida, use Ghidra. So we're going to be using those in the context of learn Ida, but also learn it, uh, how to use it as a debugger. And this is not exactly what a lot of people do necessarily, but it gives them the opportunity to immediately use it in the assembly class so that essentially I had to learn in the hardware things, hard way, things like GDB are not exactly user friendly. I'd rather have people learn it an easier way with better tools like Ida right from the get go. And the same thing for Gijo. Classes like Gal's class on C++ reverse engineering, they have dependencies on things like Ida. She just assumes it away. She says, I assume you know Ida. If you don't, sorry, can't take the class. Similarly, she assumes you already know reverse engineering basics. She's just here to teach you C++ reverse engineering. So this is just to show that a, uh, a instructor can like jump ahead, build a really advanced class, and we can worry about the backfill of like what classes do we need to get someone from zero to that class. But for everyone else in the meantime, if you've got background skills, just jump right in and learn some new high skill. Like I said, I know reversing, I know IDA, but I didn't know C++, and so I could just jump right in, and maybe you can too. And again, this just then lets us build out more advanced classes. You can imagine in future worlds, we build things that are operating system specific reversing, language specific reversing. And now final point, uh, we've got a capability for reverse engineering. We can start building vulnerability hunters and exploiters. So we've got the vulnerability classes. We need a exploitation class, which is gonna depend on something like reverse engineering so that you can look at, you know, as you're trying to make your exploit, if you can't work in a debugger, you're not gonna be able to make an exploit. But then we can build more advanced classes, like my colleague KC, he's gonna build a class on end day exploitation. So things where it's already patched, but you wanna build an exploit for it. And then we have another person who's working on a class for Windows kernel exploitation. And this is an interesting case because he already had the class. He was already teaching it internally at NCC group, but we said, okay, well, I wanna take some of your material and break it up so that I can reuse your operating system stuff that you have to teach your students. And I wanna reuse that class later on for other operating systems and systems architecture architecture teaching. All right, so we've got a bunch of different learning paths where we can differentiate people and we can give them different skills. What are we gonna do with that? Well, this is again where the long-term goal of open security training is figure out, you know, what are the job requirements? What are the skills and how do they actually map to different job recs, different names for the same job that every different company has? So I'm gonna very quickly uh, cover just an example of this for something I know well. Like when I was at Apple, some manager somewhere made a job rec to work on the team that I was on. Uh, if something is in red, that's not something that we teach at open security training. Something like C programming, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. There's already college classes on that. There's already a bunch of other free stuff online. So you can find that elsewhere. If it's in blue, that's something that is in scope. So firmware, firmware, peripheral firmware, firmware. Uh, those are the kind of classes we have for that. Then it calls out EFI specifically. Okay, we've got UEFI classes. I uh, calls out secure boot. The 3M dev folks already have a secure boot class that they're working on adapting for us. There are other things that might be on a job rec that is in scope for open security training, but we don't have an instructor for yet. That would be things like real-time operating systems. Uh, so if you know real-time operating systems, you know, hit us up. 
Uh, things like balancing tight priority, tight, uh, concurrent priorities on tight schedules. Sorry, we're not teaching that sort of soft skill quite yet. Giving you a bachelor's, we don't teach that. But systems kernel programming and operating system internals, we have all that kind of stuff. So again, like I've done a bunch of these. I don't have time to go over all sorts of different ones. But this is just validation to make sure that the kind of stuff we're teaching actually is going to give someone a capability to, in this case, do a very high paying job. But I know that my bias is showing here. I'm a firmware kind of person. Uh, I want to be clear, we're not only interested in all these system security type things. We're interested in everything. You know, it's, I, I started in network security and then moved to malware and moved to other places. Uh, so like we're interested in everything. You know, don't take my particular biases to, to mean we're not interested in mobile or crypto or anything else. All right. So. Future, here's some chickens. I don't want to count them because they haven't hatched yet, but these are the kind of classes that we do have instructors specifically working on right now. And the final point, uh, I think I'm over time, is basically if you're interested in doing these kind of things, oh, well, apparently I have five minutes, so I guess I'm going to get questions. Uh, if you're interested in having a bigger impact than what you can do as one engineer doing one engineer's worth of work, you should uh, consider teaching a class. So the, the thing that's like kind of crazy to me and the thing that made me feel that this is such a valuable thing to do that I wanted to leave my high paying job and like do this for the rest of my life is like once I started doing OST1 back in the day, every security conference that I would come to and like talk at in like 2013, 14, 15, I would have people coming up to me saying, hey, I really appreciate OST1, that really helped me, it got me a better job. Every single instructor right now that is an OST2 instructor, there's someone who said OST2 or OST1 helped me so much that I want to pay it forward and I want to teach a class now. So like, I'm literally just building political capital in the background as I sleep and I see that as like very valuable. Like, I'm, I'm helping out a bunch of people and you know, someday those people might help me out. Uh, and so, yeah, it's just, you know, if you do the math, like the math to me is very clear. I can do one staff year worth of work every single year, or I can improve a thousand people's work by even 1% over 10 years, and I've still done more improvement to the world than me doing just one engineer's worth of work. So, uh, pleasantly ahead of schedule, not according to my thing, but they gave me a little bit more time. So, I uh, appreciate all of your time. I guess I do have maybe a minute or two for questions if anyone wants to ask. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, so I have been trying to start a community around something, and a lot of people are, I think, only interested in that thing when there's a commercial entity or a vendor really involved in it behind it. And you seem to be a person that really does something that I respect and is going to have a long bearing. But how did you move beyond like, what I see is a lot of people going to it for so and so? Okay, I, if I understood the question, you said you have a particular thing that you're trying to uh, promote, and like, so I think you're sort of in this last thing. Like, you've got something where there's a commercial entity that's doing like a lot of, uh, you know, training on a particular topic. You're trying, are you trying to promote the thing separate from the commercial entity? That's kind of what you're saying? Okay, so a non for profit is making a thing, and the commercial entity is also promoting the thing, and the question is, uh, how do you move beyond like the commercial entity sort of training? Um, uh, short answer is I don't know. <laughs> so I, I think like when I put this last, this second to last bullet here, like my feeling was essentially when you put the classes out there, like I was thinking people who have open source projects, people who have a particular technology, you know, you've got a little hobbyist board and stuff like that. You know, everyone has a new little hobbyist board. How do you break through the noise and stuff, right? And so like we've got, you know, an audience of almost 10,000 people who are already signed up at the site. So they're already at OSD2 for other classes. This gives you sort of a built-in audience where like people who might not otherwise have seen your project or your platform or whatever, they can see it and now you can like start to, to involve more people. But but yeah, I'm, I'm out of time, so again, just uh, hit me up around the con, just shout Yo Zeno, and I'll turn and look. Thank you.
Ooh. <laughs> yep. So I'm open. All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and, uh, and get started before our next talk. Uh, again, more stuff to give away, some more announcements. Um, like I mentioned, you might have heard earlier, we're not doing our traditional uh, party this year. Instead, we're going to have a gathering down here. We'll have board games and all that stuff uh, set up, uh, places where you can, can congregate, but in a much more COVID-friendly, well, COVID-safe friendly environment. So uh, the requirements for coming, you still have to come wear a mask, and you'll also need a badge. Uh, it'll be 9 o'clock on this floor. So come down like you're coming to, to a talk to this floor at 9 o'clock. Uh, but you got to have a badge, and you need to have your mask on. Um, uh, again, feedback. We take every single piece of feedback that you give us to heart. Uh, we try and improve year after year. So if there's things that you thought that we did really well that you'd like to see again, let us know. If there's things that we could improve, also, let us know those things as well. We active, we're part of the community. We all do this as a volunteer gig. Uh, we want to make things better, so please let us know what we, how we could improve. Uh, feedback at schmoocon.org. Like I said, we read every single thing and take it all to heart. Um, I've got a, a couple of things to give away. So this is going to hurt if I throw it too hard. So. Um, I'm going to throw it in that direction. You all are paying attention, right? You're, you're all good. Good catch. All right, and this is not going to hurt. Um, this is, so that was a water bottle from Schmoocon. This is a hoodie from one of our sponsors, from Sublime Security. Congratulations. All right, uh, because this is a short, uh, time slot. I'm gonna, not going to take any more of your time. 
Uh, streaming, we're up and, get, up and running. All right, so please give a warm welcome to Jonathan, who will be presenting from, keyboard, from the keyboards through the walls. Get, got implants for you all. All right, anyway, please give Jonathan a warm welcome. Before we begin, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to the con and especially for coming out to my talk and giving me this opportunity to present my research to you guys. And with that, can I get a show of hands how many people here have heard of or seen USB rubber ducky, USB samurai, hardware implants like that? All right, terrific. Leave your hands up if you have used these in an op or plan on using them in an op in the field. <laughs> All right, for those of you with your hands up, I would love to meet up with you guys at um, LobbyCon, get your thoughts and experiences, ideas. Um, but yeah, with that, we'll kick off my talk from the window, or from the keyboards through the walls, got implant shells for y'all. My name is Jonathan Fisher. I have over six years of experience in the InfoSec community. All of that has been on the offensive side of things. Prior to that, I had just over a decade where I implemented, designed, and programmed industrial control systems as well as off-highway vehicle control systems. Besides that, I'm a hardware RF and IoT security enthusiast and the co-creator of the Injecto Hyde project. Uh, a little bit of a disclaimer here. All the views, opinions, and research expressed here are my own, not that of my current or previous employers. And with that, I'd like to introduce you guys to my NFT sales presentation. Who here wants to buy an NFT? <laughs> uh, no, just kidding. Here is the Inject the Hide project with a high level layout. On the left, you'll see the uh, keyboard that connects to our implant, which then connects to a target computer. On the implant itself, we have onboard memory, a uh, micro SD card in this instance, and we communicate to a C2 via radio over RF to uh, corresponding radio. Now, as you would expect with our implant, we have some standard features like uh, key logging, uh, live keystroke sniffing, as well as keystroke injection. We have what we dubbed insomnia mode, so here think mouse jiggler. Uh, we pull the devices for status updates, so remotely we'll see which modes are active, like keystroke recording, um, insomnia mode, and we do something where we pull the device to see when the last keystroke packet was detected, so we can kind of tell how long it's been since it's been used to get an idea of whether or not it's an active keyboard. We do remote memory management from the C2. So here we will push injection skips remotely. We will delete um, files as we see fit, as well as pull keystroke recordings remotely. And finally, we have what we call a go dark mode. So if you're in operations and you think that you are going to be detected, you can put it in a go dark mode, which will delete all the files on the SD card, as well as put it into a passive mode where it'll just let keystrokes through, but it won't respond to any commands. Now, you can wake it back up with a uh, different operational command and go back and push your scripts again, but at least then, if you feel like you're going to get caught, you're going to leave as little evidence as possible, or even if you're just going to leave it in place for a long period of time and don't feel like leaving your injection scripts and key recordings behind. So that's pretty standard what you would expect. So what makes us unique? Well, when we started designing this, we really had the idea of doing a covert and scalable network. And as you would expect and hope, we added authentication and encryption to it. But we decided to build this on mesh networking. So as you know, with mesh networking, the more devices we have, the larger the network we can get. We can shape it to go around barriers that might inhibit our reception. And we can really get it to a spot where we feel comfortable with the C2 uh, to interact. So be it in a coffee shop around the street corner, or in a car in the parking lot. Um, you know, use your imagination here. We use the Digimesh RF radio uh, frequency and the uh, IoT radios from Digi International right now. They're a pretty common IoT radio, so that's why we, <coughs> excuse me, that's why we settled on them. 
we can globally broadcast a message to all devices at once saying start, stop, um, do whatever, right? Or just one targeted device at a time. And the documented ranges on the radios are 200 feet to ideal conditions up to two miles. So you can really get the idea of where you can go with this. Uh, in my basement, just off USB power with the smallest radio, I was able to reach into my garage where then I could put a repeater and then go a block away and still connect. So I got pretty good distance out of that. But again, use your imagination, right? If you're in the top floor of an office complex doing this, throw one on a drone if you have the resources, right? And build it out that way, so it leaves your options open. How do we interact with this? Well, we have a custom C2 we built with Python 3. It has two non-standard libraries. The first is the Digi library, which helps us interact with the radio. And then the second is the Blessed library, which um, allows us to build up the terminal that we interact with our reverse shell on. And speaking of the reverse shell, this is one of the things we do really unique here. Uh, to give you an idea, when we plug in our implant, we mount as a generic head device, which is what you would expect, right? If you're injecting keystrokes, you have to be a head device. But we also mount a COM port. And this gives us a second presence on the device. So what we do is we launch a PowerShell session in the background that attaches to that COM port. And with that, we're able to redirect all the traffic back all the COM port through the implant over the RF into the C2. So now we have a reverse shell on the device that exists outside of the target infrastructure completely. And while that sounds great, let's actually watch it in action. Is it working? Lose the monitors now. And this is why I didn't do a live demo. Which, by the way, my intent was to do a live demo, but due to uh, time constraints, I won't be able to do it. But I did bring my setup, so what's better than live demo is hands on demo. So feel free to find me in LobbyCon, and I'll have it all set up for you guys to play with. So let's kick off the reverse shell demo. So what you're gonna see here on the left side is going to be the C2. On the right side is the target uh, PC. So what we're doing here is we're picking the option to launch our attack from script. We're gonna pick the address of the radio that we wanna act, uh, interact with, so the C, or sorry, the implant. And then we're gonna pick the reverse shell script, which is gonna launch, and what you just saw on the right is the keystroke injection. So now we have the PowerShell session in the background. So now we're gonna to choose to attach to that session and launch uh, interactive terminal. So what's nice about this is that we can attach and detach from different sessions so we're not just locked into the one we launched and we can come back later if we want. Right now we're um, enumerating the desktop looking for juicy files. And what you'll see here is that we're gonna come across a file called loot.txt which is on the right side of the screen as well. Now we really have two options. We can use the reverse shell if we want to extract this information, but now we know the file path, so the other thing we can do is uh, data exfil it through a similar ma uh, manner with another reverse script. So that brings me to our data exfil script. Now this is in PowerShell as well, and it's gonna operate in a similar manner. It's gonna go through the COM port, but in this instance, we're going to look for the specified target file and we're gonna save it as the name that's given when we launch the script. But in the background, what we're gonna do is inject the keystrokes to build the PowerShell session. And the PowerShell session is going to um, base64 and uh, gzip the file. Then it's gonna send over the bytes through the RF, through the COM port, and then over to the C2. Here you see some debugging information as we receive the packets. And now that we know we got the file, we're gonna exit the C2 and look at our local file system for the actual document, which will pop up here shortly. And there you see, we have the phrase, this is treasure repeated, and that's what we put in the file. All right, so that covers 
the reverse shell and the data XFIL script. So what's new for Shmoo? Well, that's cool and all, right? We can data XFIL to the C2, but what if we want to keep doing something? Large files take a long time to transfer. So we built another script that's going to operate in a similar manner. It still uses the COM port. We still base64 encode and gzip the file, but in this time, uh, <coughs> sorry, this instance, we're going to save it to the SD card instead. So now we can set it, forget it, go back about our business, interact with other uh, implants, and come back later when it's on the SD card. And then this way, we can either retrieve it via physical means and get the implant or the SD card itself, or we can retrieve it again later with the C2. And as the other Data XFIL script works. We can do this with uh, code through the reverse shell if you don't want to launch a separate script, or you can just run this, excuse me, this option as well. So we covered the new Data XFIL script. What else is new for Shmoo? Well, we have keyboard parsing scripts built now uh, for the US keyboard encoding. And the way we operate our implant is when we record those keystrokes, we leave the packet data raw and we extract it later and then parse it. And the reason we do this is because we don't want to take a guess at the encoding of the keyboard or even like if our logic's messed up, right? And we interpret those keystrokes, but we find out later the parsing script's wrong, we just lost the integrity of the original data. So we leave it raw and we, uh, we use our parsing scripts instead. So as an example, on the left side of the screen is the raw keystroke packet. You'll see that it's indicated by a K followed by a bunch of values. Now, the values, unless you're doing this every day, really don't mean a whole lot. So we need to break it down to a more verbose, um, readable script. And that's what our parsing script does. So we take the packet, we leave it on the left, and then we give you the verbose output on the right. So in this instance, you'll see a left shift, a left shift plus a T, then the T's are released, leaving with the left shift, and then all keys are released. So this gives you a capital T, but it's a lot of information and it's not very readable if you're trying to look for things like file pass or credentials, right? So we developed a second script to break it down with all the logic so you get the readable output. So this will help you more quickly <coughs> Sorry, identify the targets you're looking for. What else is new for Shmoo? Well, in the original release, when you did injection script transfers over the radio, you had to keep the line lengths to 70 characters or less, otherwise the buffer would overflow and the radio would go into an air state and drop the entire packet, as well as the rest of the uh, injection script. So we now auto trunk all the data. So if you wanna write a uh, thousand line uh, one-liner, we'll just auto trunk it for you, it doesn't matter. And now we also have default values in the uh, repo for all the files. So when you download this from our uh, GitHub repo, it'll all just work. You don't have to do any additional setup. Originally, we didn't do it that way because we didn't want people to reuse the same passwords and leave this in the wild, but uh, we just made it something benign. So there's a lot less setup, so people that just wanted to play could play. And we've spent a lot of time since we released this updating the uh, GitHub as well as the notations in the code. So hopefully it's more self-explanatory. You guys can pick this up and run with it. If you have questions, feel free to get a hold of me directly. I have no problem answering them. I do it all the time. As well as uh, reach out to us on our Discord channel as well. So that's what's new for Shmoo. But what are we currently working on? What's coming, right? When we design this, we didn't want to be inline. We wanted to be a small targeted uh, implantable implant, right? So we had a radio picked out. Everything was great. COVID hit. Chip shortage hit. Bye-bye radio. So we opted to uh, pivot and go to something workable inline. But now we've sourced a different radio that will fit the footprint we need. So we're back on to the targeted implantable design again. The big ask that we got in Las Vegas last year at uh, B-Sides and DEF CON when we released this was LoRa. Do you have LoRa? Well, we do now. We have the code done. We have the proof of concept done. Now we just have to put the finishing touches on a prototype PCB and that will be re released to the repo shortly as well. We are updating how we handle the memory in the implant. Right now we initialize the SD card upon boot and 
if you have a bad SD card or it's not plugged in, what you're gonna see is that it, the project's just gonna hang. It, you're not gonna get any interaction. So we're gonna move that to a per function basis so that you still get limited functionality, right? You can still do things like live keystroke sniff without a memory card. So we're moving it that way to get more functionality. And on the flip side, we're also worried about what if you can't get a radio? We've seen people not be able to get radios due to the chip shortage too. Well, without the radio, there's no C2, no interaction. Well, with default boot modes, uh, we're looking at adding things like uh, just kick right directly into key recording. That way you can drop it, record keystrokes, and move on without a radio or a C2, go back later and collect your implant and at least get some usable information. Finally, back to insomnia mode, and the reason we didn't name it um, a mouse juggler to begin with was because we knew we were gonna expand on it. So insomnia mode doesn't have to just be a mouse juggler. If you're worried about heuristic detection, why not throw in things like benign key presses as well, like a left shift, a right shift, a double tap to a num lock or something like that, right? Uh, randomized timers, things like that. So we're working on expanding that as an option as well. And finally, I'm gonna leave you guys with like our vision of where this can go and where we're currently, uh, one of the directions we're currently going with this. On the left, you'll see a common keyboard. The back's taken off and you'll see the PCB in the keyboard. If you squint real hard, you'll see that there is a header connector on that PCB as well. On the right, you'll see our mock-up of our footprint of our prototype implantable PCB. And now where we're going with this is going to be a fully plug and play implant where you can unplug that header connector into our implant, attach it to the existing PCB and just put the case back on. And away you go. There's your true head implant right there. With that, I'd like to thank uh, my co-creator for the implant, Jeremy Miller, the EFF for working with us for responsibly disclosing our research as well as Soldier of Fortran and Redfish for mentoring us and helping us with our project as well. If you're interested in learning more about it, you can get a hold of our uh, public repo on GitHub. If you go to just injectile-hide.com, it'll redirect you. You'll find all of our documentation there, um, all the source code, all the hardware schematics, all the PCB designs, all the walkthroughs, it's all up there as well as the injection scripts we have for the uh, reverse shells and the data exfil. We're on Twitter. We're working on getting on Mastodon right now. And we have a Discord channel for anybody that wants to ask questions that way or wants to uh, contribute to the community. With that, I'd like to thank you guys for coming out and open the floor to any questions. Yes? Right, so the question is, are there any keyboards out there that don't exist or that don't work with this currently? Right now we haven't come across them, but we are just using our standard keyboards. We haven't gone crazy as far as gaming keyboards. Um, my co-creator Jeremy has gaming keyboards and he was able to use them as well. So in theory, no, they should all work because it's just a keyboard packet, but in reality, maybe. But um, to that note, like hardwired keyboards work. I use mine right now with a wireless receiver and I'm able to intercept that off the USB of the wireless receiver as well. So wired or non-wired doesn't seem to affect us either. So any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the only thing that I kind of have a question for you guys is if you're looking into any other way to make that X fill a little bit quieter, because the second I'm in the sauce, I'm actually basically before coding a shower shell, is there you go, right? Right. So it's a reverse PowerShell script right now, but we're kind of leaving that open to your imagination. Um, that's the nice thing about the injection script, right? We're looking at porting it over to different scripting languages, different OSs. Oh, sorry, the, the question was, are we looking at doing anything else besides Base64 encoding or gzipping it? Um, right now we're just doing it because it's simple. But yes, we could uh, look at other 
inf uh, exfil tactics, and uh, we're not limited, but we're not currently working on that, but that's something we can definitely look into and would love um, feedback on as well. So thank you for your feedback. All right, with that, it looks like I'm getting the signal. So if you guys have any more questions or want to play with it, or even want injectile hide stickers, come find me in LobbyCon, and I'll be more than happy to talk your year off. All right, thank you guys.
No words. Say you. <laughs> I am doing great. I am not prepared. I don't use this laptop very often, and um, I have, I don't know, I'm trying to download my presentation right now. Yes, it is. With updated numbers, I think. That's okay. Bob's running back to um, Reg. He's going to... I don't know if they proofread it. It might have the right years. At least the title is correct. You want me to keep Are you on the network? I'm not on the network. I, I, there are very many broken things right now. Thank you. I am doing not great. Um, I am doing great. It's been, is everybody, how are you doing? That's what I care about. Good. Good, we're gonna get this fixed shortly. I have no freaking idea. And yeah, nothing's going to happen with that. I know. I'm not. I'm not actually on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. But, okay. But there is a status bar that's sitting there. Here comes Bob. Here he comes to save the day. Mighty mass is on the way. I'll stop doing what I'm doing. Maybe. Replug in all the things. Turn off the Wi-Fi, maybe. Okay, you you start. You try. What oh wait. Oh, Frank's here. Boom. Yeah. There you go. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, I just need. I need to edit. Actually, you want to download it first. I do. Well, because you got this plugged in, so you want to plug in the. Number two, you have the. Give me a second USB. <laughs> Can, okay. you, can you step up okay. for a chair? Like, do your thing. <laughs> to do this? Well, you can do your edits before you Oh, yeah, screen. I should edit the thing. Hang on. Somebody might have brought me, like, a bourbon that was, like, this tall just a few minutes ago. Uh, and you'll know yeah, it's, you want to know gone. where that is? It's gone. I am the John Madden of color commentary and cybersecurity. Does anyone have a turkey I can borrow? A few Madden fans in the room, I see. That's good. 
Yeah, we have mooses. I gotta stop a chicken inside of a moose, so. Okay, this is not working. A moose ickin. A moose duckin? A moose duckin, yeah, I guess it's like a chicken and a duck and a moose. A moose duckin. Oh. It's so large that it rounds to just a moose. If it's a moose duckin, you need like eight ducks. Yay! That kind of looked like I, was, I knew what I was doing, but I didn't really know anything. You are doing great. I am doing great. Thanks, Matt, who was supposed to maybe come visit today. All right. Welcome to Own the Con. How many of you have joined us for this session before? Awesome. How many are new to this session? All right. Do you know why you're here? Shenanigans. It's, it's like couples therapy 101. Um, it is, actually. This, I can't. I, Bruce, I can't. I can't. I can't do this. Um, so this is where we tell you about all things ShmooCon. Um, you'll see that we have, uh, this is on the con number 17, but this is the 18th con. So it just kind of explains itself on the slides, right? These slides are an absolute mess. I actually don't know what order they're in, even though I've been working on these slides for about a month. It'll be just as much a surprise for Bruce and I as it will be for you. It's random, it's confusing. If you have questions as we go along, please ask them. I think the numbers are correct. Eh, we'll find out. Anything to say, Mr. Potter? Let's do it! Look! There's still, There's some, still left. some left. It was like it was like a three-finger pour, by the way, so. It I ate today, serious. it's okay. It's okay. I'm gonna turn off my radio. We have radios in the room, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Does anybody have eyes on Heidi? Okay, we're good. All right, you can do this one, it's boring. Yeah, sorry. I was arranging something else. Um, I hope it's dinner. It's actually what it was, so indeed. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you in the room that just texted about dinner, uh, it's about dinner. And those of you that didn't, uh, you can't eat with us. So, um, womp womp. Womp womp. So, a couple things. As we pointed out in the opening, we are not a 501c3, we're an LLC. Uh, we do that because we want to stay sane. Uh, this is our way of giving back to you, the community, so you know what we did and how we do it, uh, just like you would with a normal nonprofit, except without all the tax forms that are incomprehensible by mortals. Um, it's interesting to watch other events organize and see what uh, types of communications they, they have and how they, uh, um, you know, meetings and that kind of thing. And I know there are some meetings, there are some uh, conferences that a year ahead of time are having nearly weekly planning meetings and Zooms and all that kind of thing. Um, Heidi runs most things just via email uh, with a little bit of Slack but not much and a couple of Zoom meetings right before the end. Um, part of that's because we have very little turnover in volunteers and people kind of know their roles. Uh, but part of it's also that um, there's a lot of stuff that when you have this organizational structure, there's no board. It's just Heidi like making decisions. She gets input from people and she'll call them when she needs them and whatever. Um, but there's not the shenanigans of having to build consensus and that kind of thing. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. I think there are plenty of events where the consensus is important. You're trying to bring together people. Um, the scale that we operate at, um, and, and the way that the events run, um, Heidi's worried I'm going to say something wrong. No, so. I'm just going to point out that there's a lot of slides to follow this. So. Well, you had me talk to it, so this is the chaos that you invited. Okay, like, keep going. It's good. It's good. Anyway, we do most of it via email. Any questions? <laughs> Brevity is... Not your middle name? Oh, I like this slide. So this is a new slide. See, it says new slide, new slide. There's three new slides this year, everybody. Um, so this, is, this was born, I put on, I still use the Facebook, sorry. Um, I posted on the Facebooks about a couple weeks ago and I was like, what do you, what, what do you wanna see in, in OwnTheCon? What, what, what other things do you wanna see? And um, I can't remember who asked this. I think it was Amelie, but I'm not, not entirely sure. Um, but the question was like, why do we do what we do? Why? Why are we here? And there's a, a lot of reasons, okay? And those reasons kind of started here. They've kind of ended up over here. But I think originally, um, this started, I think, in a bar. The idea started in a bar. I think the original notes were written on a bar napkin. 
right? I wasn't yeah. even there. No. It was Bruce and Beetle and... That was pretty much it. Bruce and Beetle yeah. in Vegas. Yep. And the original reasons were kind of like, um, well, there's nothing like it on the East Coast. They can do it. I think we can do it. Um, well, why not, right? And the next thing we knew, we get back. Well, Bruce got back. I wasn't going to Vegas at the time because I think I was, I don't know. Probably pregnant. Probably pregnant. Well, to be fair, and I think I've said this a hundred times, I've been pregnant at DEF CON twice. Okay, I think that's like, I mean, maybe not a record. I didn't get pregnant at DEF CON. I was pregnant during DEF CON. I don't know how to say that. It's a um, lot of detail that is not required. <laughs> I just wanted to be very clear, okay? Um, the first year when I was there and I was very pregnant, I got offered a lot of drugs. It was kind of strange. Yeah, it was weird. What, where, what hotel was that one? That was the one that got totally torn down. Well, they all get totally torn down. No, it was before no, the No, way before that. It started with an Jeff A? Con five. No, before that. I never, I never went to the AP. The Aladdin, wasn't it? No. Yeah. The Aladdin, Aladdin yeah. yeah. A lot of drugs. A lot of drugs. I didn't do any, just to be clear. Um, so I don't know where I was going with any of that, so who cares? <laughs> so there, there is a historical point that's a, of interest, is that um, I didn't start the con, and I don't run the oh, con. Oh, yeah, the point was we got back. Yeah. And like next thing we know, Beatle's sending out a message. He's like, yeah, so um, I didn't tell my wife, but I put a mortgage out of my house. David's back. Hello, David. Hey, David. Everybody applaud for David. David's back today. <laughs> We love you, David. So, um, so yeah, and he's like, I didn't tell my wife, but I took a second mortgage out of my house, and so now we have funding to do this thing if you guys want to do it. We're like, oh, okay. So we, we, right then and there, we kind of had to commit to making something happen so he could pay back the second mortgage on his house before his wife was, like, going to find out. Right? Yeah, that's, yeah. If Bruce had done because that to marriage me, counseling. I would have had some words, but she's a nicer person. So, um, so yeah, so it happened the first year. Um, yeah. And Beetle, Beetle was the point for what the first two, two I think years. two years, yeah. um, and then I and then I kind of took over. But uh, I think the reason why has sort of changed. I mean, obviously that was the the reasoning in the beginning. Um, now we've continued to do it because we've built a lot of community around this crazy little thing called ShmooCon. Um, we like the the conversations that come. We like the projects that we see that come out of coming together. Um, the relationships. I mean, certainly personally, the relationships we've formed with so many of you. Um, but just, you know, we have, we get emails throughout the year. I get emails throughout the year saying, hey, I just wanted to let you know, I think there's marriage proposals. I mean, there's mentorships, there's job opportunities, there's people getting hired, you know, people finding a career path that they, you know, have settled in. It, it's, it's pretty phenomenal to watch over time what happens at these types of events. And I kind of jokingly say have it, but there's, there's, kind of just some momentum behind doing this. Like, you get used to it, right? And so it just keeps kind of happening. Um, the other question that came up in kind of the same vein was how do we keep it fresh and how do we stay motivated? Well, the only real answer to that question is because of all of you, right? This is where you are where the inspiration comes from, the ideas come from. You want to say something really emo and like totally <laughs> shock them with your feelings and stuff? Well, thanks for putting me on the spot. Christ. Um, no, I mean, it's, therapy, it's, it's super, what? Nothing. Okay. Um, <laughs> it is very rewarding to do this. And, you know, honestly, Ooh. we appreciate all the feedback we get from everybody. Um, I broke it. My emo broke the internet. Um, you know, it, it, we honestly take all feedback we get, right? And we take it very seriously, even if you don't tell us to our face, if you, it's passive aggressive on Twitter, we still read it. And uh, <laughs> um, we might know, have words in our head, but we yeah, don't but, say them out loud. You know, it's one of those things like, and, and it's the, I mean, partially the genesis of the schmoo ball, right? Like if you're thinking something and you throw the schmoo ball, like it, it was amazing in the early days, how many times 50 others would fly behind it, right? Because so many other people were having the same thought. And if something happens here that's valuable, and we hear about it from one person, it probably means 50 people thought it was valuable. And if some bullshit happens that rubs you the wrong way or makes you uncomfortable or whatever, probably 50 people thought about that too. And so we're very careful to treat every individual feedback as potentially feelings and emotions that the community is having at large. And we spend time trying to understand why, right? 
what can we do, what can we improve, what can we do better. Um, and, and Heidi spends a lot of time focusing on, on those issues kind of in the off season, right? Because when the rubber hits the road and you start having to do, you don't have time to course correct. Um, you know, this is an event that once the machine is moving, there's no stopping it, right? Like there's things like, especially like take a week from today, like every day is regimented. There is no time for anything past, different to happen. A week in the past, not a week in the future. A week in the future, I'm going to be asleep. Yeah. But honestly, it, it you know, there, there's no, ShmooCon today exists because of all the things that happened in the last five days, and not much was going to change it. Except, I mean, we were like, God, I hope we don't get COVID this week. That was like the biggest thing in our personal life, was finding ways to minimize our own exposure, knowing yeah, our that family's if both of us were down, legitimately this, this would be on very, lockdown very for the different. last month. Yeah. Um, short of the prep parties we had at our house, but at our house, like, we had the windows fully open. We were running three air purifiers. We had air monitors in the house. Like, we were taking it very seriously because running this from upstairs, like, in my room would have been... Difficult. Yeah, we would have done it, but it would have been hard. I would have had a telepresence robot. I don't know how you were going to handle it, but I was going to have a telepresence robot. Oh, that little thing on the Segway? Yeah, or actually, yeah, just have Jenny carry me around on an iPad. Oh, that would have worked, too. Yeah. Jenny, my enforcer, would make some shit happen. Well, if you get Jenny, who do I get? Frank. <laughs> Excellent. The, the teddy bear enforcer. I'm Can so you please? excited. That's, yeah, that's kind of my speed. All right. <laughs> Frank's like, I don't know if I should be offended that I got called a teddy bear. Aww. <laughs> We are providing so much value right now, dear. We should stay on this slide forever. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about our staff because they're really why this all happens. I don't know. <laughs> um, so on site right now, we probably have about 90 of our on volunteers on site. There's probably closer every year to about 100, including like our review committee and then just people who come and help. Um, Jenny and Jocelyn are examples of that. They come and help us roll t-shirts and stuff bags every year, but they're not officially on staff, right? But they're amazing volunteers who help us out. So we have other people in the community who do that as well. Um, I'm going to look around the room, but honestly, my glasses are really dirty, so forgive me. I can't really see right now. It's all those mask hugs. Um, but we get an army of support from the community. Um, we'll talk about the shirts in a second. We've already talked about that on stage at the opening. But just here's kind of a rough delineation of how we break up our staffing. Um, I'm not going to read all of that, but you can see it's a lot of different departments. Um, the last line has kind of grown. We had the Potter children for a number of years. It's grown to the Potter children and their significant others. I now have a daughter-in-law. Hello. And now I have a daughter-in-law in the future. My future daughter-in-law is what they keep calling her. So... Um, Daxton is no. 12. I hope that that one's got some time, but... Um, to be clear, the future daughter law, they're not engaged, but that was a lot of pressure in that sentence, I by know. the way. Like, she seemed okay when I said that, and we'd like to keep her, that was just a very to be Southern very clear. kind of passive aggressive kind of way. Like, I, that was, I like her, it's good. That was good. It's all good. Um, I like her. So I will say, like, for most of these departments, there's like a lead, um, and I think that. I'm the lead of the Potter children. Yeah. Um, yeah, right? I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, I'm, right? I'm the chaos agent of the Potter children. Um, but every one of those groups has like a lead that Heidi can hold accountable, sometimes co-leads. I think that, that we found over the years of running a volunteer-based organization that if you can get two people that work together well as co-leads, you get to deal with the ebbs and flows of personal lives and people getting sick and the kids and work and whatever. Um, and, and as long as they can kind of continue to, to stitch together and, and get the job done uh, 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 correctly, that co-lead thing has worked very well, especially for um, very important roles, taping and streaming, uh, security, things like that, that require a ton of coordination. That's provided, um, I think, yeah, a, a, a lot of Yeah, that's a decision I made um, probably over a decade ago, um, just to put, put two people in charge of every department. It's worked out very well for us. And I think it takes some of the pressure off of those departments as well, I think, so Yeah, it's as long out as they well. don't just point fingers and say, I thought you were doing that, and it turns into Laurel and Hardy. Um, that Laurel hasn't happened yet, but don't give them ideas. Laurel Hardy was a pair back in the early noughts, by the way, if no one knows who Laurel Hardy was. All right, we won't... We Sorry won't. for that reference. <laughs> David's waving his hand. We won't go over this one too much. Um, this was something that was asked uh, to, for us to be added to the slides um, a number of years ago, and actually when I posted on Facebook, somebody asked again about how much time goes into planning the con. 
um, I'll just let you take a peek, but um, it's a lot of hours, um, not only on my time, Bruce's time, but on our volunteers' time, depending on what their role is. A number of our volunteers, you know, they just show up and then they put the time in over the weekend, but that's still a lot of hours, right? I mean, you all know if you volunteer for something, once you show up and you put in your shift time, it could be, you know, five, six hours a day. But some of our volunteers are here putting in those five or six hours a day or more, um, but they put in some of our volunteers hours and hours and hours prior to the con, like our review committee, um, David with ticket sales, um, Bob certainly helps me work all the contracts with Encore for all the um, AV equipment that's up here, Frank helps me with some of the website stuff and, I don't know, keeps me sane on some of the other stuff that goes on. Um, I mean, there's just, there's a number of people on the staff who put in hours and hours prior to the event that happens here today, not, and they don't just show up. So, hi, cousin. Hey, sir. How are you? So, it's a lot of time, um, and if you've ever been involved in running an event, you know what that feels like, so, ta-da. Well, I, I think if you haven't, it's, I mean, it, it's important to frame, um, like, how spiky it is, right? Like, there's periods of time where there's not a lot going on. But starting about m five, six weeks before the con, um, Heidi's basically full throttle, like gets up, sits at her computer, works, you know, stops for meals and a few other, like, you know, go shopping, you know, get some groceries or whatever. But um, that's pretty much all she does. And then about that same time, every hour that I'm not doing my day job, I'm helping her out. And there are things that we've chosen um, actively to do ourselves rather than outsource. Like as an example, we have a large format uh, vinyl printer, and we print all the banners ourselves. And part of that is financial, like over time, it's cheaper to do it, um, but part of it's also, it allows us to do things like on-demand print new vinyl. Like we had speakers drop at the last minute, we were able to print new banners, I didn't have to like call a shop and like hope that they were open and could squeeze me in. But on the flip side, that means we have to do the art, we have to prep it for production, we have to print it, we have to cut it, we have to mount it, all that kind of thing. Katie's laughing at you. Yeah, luckily this year, Katie and Bobby uh, were able to uh, handle most of that production in the past years that's been me, but you know, that's like... It's nice when your children get older. Yeah. We believe in child labor. <laughs> so I, I will say like there is an awful lot of um, flexibility that we have that how we run the con and the decisions we make, but we pay for it with time. And so if you run in an event like this, you can outsource it and spend less of your time. But, but you also spend more money. You spend more money and you have less flexibility. So we like to have the flexibility. We also are, are lucky that we have the space and the resources in our, in our home to be able to manage it. <laughs> um, not everyone has that. <laughs> like there's literally like a workshop in the garage that's all the production facility. It's got the laser cutter, the vinyl printer and cutter, um, you know, a huge workspace to work on and that kind of thing. So we're fortunate that we have that. Um, so if you're in an apartment and you're trying to do this, you don't have those options. You have to outsource this shit. Anybody Speaking of logistics, <laughs> I'm sorry, I stumbled into the next slide. You did, quickly. but it was a perfect segue. Um, there's a little joke at the top. Um, Shmukon Logistics, uh, and also spelled wrong, Logistics. Um, for I don't even know how many years, that's what, that's what was on the bank account, was Shmukon Logistics. Um, it took us, I don't know, kind of like the badges, it took me like six years to catch it. Corrected it eventually. Amusingly, I have an Amex card uh, that had it spelled wrong and just has my first name. Bruce. Um, it doesn't have my last name. And we were, ba we were back at the Wardman Park Marriott, and they wouldn't give us our car after uh, ShmooCon one year because we hadn't finalized the master bill, because you don't do that for weeks after the event. And I'm like, well, we're not going to wait weeks to get my car back. So I gave them the corporate Amex to pay for it to get the car out of hock. Which was idiotic to begin with, first it was, of all. It was like, super idiotic. That was not but happy, then they're Heidi. like, this just has a first name. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, we can't run this. I'm like, why don't you call Amex? And they called Amex. It's like, does he have the card? Is it signed on the back? Does it match the signature? Then run the damn card. Like, Amex was just like, this is not a problem for us. Run the fucking card. So we did. And I eventually got my car back. And I think that was actually the last year we were at the Wardman. It was really well, a glorious Well, we left the Wardman exit. for a number of reasons. We yeah. just won't get into it that wasn't, right that now. That wasn't the reason we left, that but is, it really did it was kind of It was kind of like, you know, what do they call that? The cherry on top. Yeah. Um, so somebody asked, like, okay, you talk all the time about what goes into planning the con, but, like, what really goes into planning the con? Okay, this slide is, like, the most top-level high-level list of things I can give you. But you, what you gotta imagine, and I don't, I don't, you know, the, the project management stuff, like, you know that software you can get that gives you all the, like, the spidery hands that go off of every single one of these things? 
Just imagine that. You can tell Heidi head. hasn't worked in corporate America. She doesn't know the term. I don't know the Gantt terms. chart. Thank you. So. I knew there was a term. I just didn't know the name. No, it's good that you don't. You haven't oh. been scarred. Yay. Like, <laughs> Go no me. No one has hurt you. Yay. Well, I mean, I thought it was actually powerful if you could name your nemesis. Oh, yeah, that's true. Know your enemy. Yeah. yeah. So chart. I don't know. Have I been hurt or not hurt? Superman I don't know. versus the Gantt chart. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, me too. Anyway, so this is kind of like so just the second a, season was a little boring. Excuse me. Sorry, sorry. Are you talking or am I talking? It's, de it's debatable. It's debatable. <laughs> Let's just talk at the same time. That could be fun. Um, <laughs> we want to go get the puppets. The puppets are here. Oh, we're just okay. <laughs> It's called duplex, but two people can talk at the same time. But so we should supposed just talk at the same time. We're really time. supposed to say the this same thing. This is a good idea. We should both talk at the same time. <laughs> All right. So anyway, this is like a high level thing. This is like the most high level. I've probably forgot like 100 things because I don't really, I don't know. It's all in my head. Um, and not everything on here is stuff that I do. This is just a lot of it's stuff I do, but a lot of it's stuff that volunteers do as well. But it's kind of, it's kind of a list of things that need to get done for the conference to happen. Did I miss anything, Bruce? I don't think so. We've been over this list a bunch. Um, do you want to talk about any of them directly? Uh, um, I, no, do you? Sure. So, um, <laughs> so honestly, um, how many people have been involved in running conferences like in, in their day job? Like, not, not like volunteer, like B-sides or whatever, but like help running day job type conferences. So I, I was as well, like in a past life, I worked for a defense contractor and we ran some events for the federal government. And I remember like we ran like a 300 person event um, out in Seattle. Uh, shouldn't be? Question mark? Thank you. Okay. Um, and there was like six contractors dedicated to run a 300 person event just for the federal government. No sponsors, no swag, nothing, just six people dedicated for months to get 300 people into a hotel for two days in Seattle. And I remember thinking like, you can do this with a half a person in three weeks, right? Like you do not need all of this shit. And, and then you realize when you look at it, like the, the what ShmooCon has to do, like managing the sponsors, right? There are big name sponsors out there. There are huge companies, they have expectations, they have requirements for the logos, requirements for how they're gonna engage, they all pay differently, some ship chickens, some are sending <laughs> eagle, like it's ridiculous how they all pay differently and you have to balance all that, right? And so that's like a thread that gets worked. And then there's a thread that gets worked about swag. And like her swag guy knows about every goddamn bag for sale in the United States. And, and it'd be like, I have this bag for sale, there's 400 in Piscataway, there's six in Nebraska, and there's about 1,500 of them in Las Vegas, except they're blue. And you're like, <laughs> how the hell do you know that? He's like, well, I just, I just know these things, right? Um, and then for weeks, random boxes show up at her house that don't weigh anything because they're filled with like one squishy ball, right? But they came <laughs> overnight because he wants us to be able to make a decision whenever we're ready. So we get all these bags no, in the box. No, it's because I want to make sure they're not going to hurt if they hit you. Well, there's, yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah. yeah we, literally like you think. We throw them at each really, other. Yeah. We have our ways. But then, you know, we've got all, the, once you choose the swag, you have to get the graphics together and, and get it sent out, and it has to show up, and then we have to inventory and all that, so the swag's its own thread. Like, all of these things require attention to detail to make sure that they land and they're all doable. <laughs> but you know what? If like we go somewhere and Bruce is like, did you see that thing? I'm like, no, did we turn left? What? That's me. I don't pay attention oh, to anything. Oh, she doesn't pay any attention at all to like her environment, right? <laughs> She's totally like um, any, you know, Walt, not Walt Disney character, but like Looney Tunes character. They'll like walk across the skyscraper and like the shit's all going everywhere. And she's like, la, 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 la. So that's my impression of you, by the way. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> God, he still Anyone chose needs me, me I'll be know. outside in the dumpster. <laughs> All right, can we keep going? Do you have anything else to say? Nope, I'm just okay. going to shut up. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, here's your sneak peek. Who cares? Oh. Here we are, everybody. <laughs> you do not want to give me these. It's going to get fun now. Oh, sure. This ends in a marriage. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, wait. No, no, no we're good. I'm, this feels awkward. 
That just feels <laughs> this awkward. This does not end well. I don't even know how to proceed right now. <laughs> like. just, just own it, Bruce. Okay, here we go. So. <laughs> You're so cute when you turn red. I mean, the puppets are cute, but Bruce's is better, right? Yeah. He's so angry looking. I don't know. I, like, it's loose here. Yeah, it's loose. Have you tried turning it off and back on again? No, I have not. <laughs> All right. The, 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 this, this slide that's going to appear at some time just talks about how the dates move. The most important line is the third line. That's your sneak peek. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just you wait, my friend. Yeah. You think that's early? Yeah, we're not going to talk about that yet. Just you wait, just you wait, Henry Iggins. Just you wait. Anybody? Thank you. Yeah, but Henry Iggins is only in My Fair Lady. Except um, that one night when he showed up, <laughs> and it was really awkward. <laughs> Hamilton gets shot, and Henry Iggins shows up, and it's like, ah! And it was really strange. Okay, anyway, all right, so now we're on to CFP stats. Woo, wow, look at that. Um, everything on this page is online. Okay, so I posted a page or post, I don't know, a couple weeks ago about CFP stats. Um, this year we had 169 total submissions. Are you moving that mouth when I talk? Okay, this is Fuck going. You. Do you like hand puppets? Fuck you. Is this informative like you thought it would be? I would just like to point out that these live in a basement, live in the basement for the entire year, except for like an hour every Shmoocon, okay? I smell like mouse shit. <laughs> and black gold. I like this one better. <laughs> that one's not mouthy. I'm going home with this one. Okay. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> we should continue. Could you put me down now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that's probably, Okay. That's a good idea. <laughs> Could you put me <laughs> I love I need my boot. <laughs> my boot. <laughs> oh, you said boot. <laughs> Okay, okay, here. Behind Hold your Behind front. Behind <laughs> front. Oh, near far. I'm sorry. That's the Grover thing. Ah, there you go. <laughs> I don't have any idea what's happening right now. All right, we should just continue. Okay. He's in love with the boy. See you at Peace Stats. I don't, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I, I don't even know. I'm just going to read the slide because that's a sucky thing to do, but here we go. 169 total submissions. Normally in a normal pre-COVID year, we'd get about 200 to 220. CFP um, submissions are down industry-wide. That's kind of a thing everybody's seeing. Um, I was really nervous this year. We wouldn't make it to three tracks. The submissions were coming in pretty slow. Um, but the last two weeks before the call for papers closed, they started coming in and we were able to do, oh my God. <laughs> Avenue Q, after dark. We're taking the toys away now. Thank you, Frank. Frank's fired. <laughs> um, so I will say the numbers were down, but I think. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you now. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just trying to help you out. I'm just going to get this going again. You got to pull the cord, start the motor, and start going forward. Um, I, <laughs> Am I mowing the lawn? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I never mow the lawn. That sounded really bad. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Are you not entertained? I, I, I think I need to help her. <laughs> you got this? <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the CFP stats while she composes herself. <laughs> give her, give her a little, uh, little space. I'll just hide her for a moment. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I think in general, what we saw this year was uh, <laughs> um, actually pretty high quality submissions. Uh, <laughs> she just died under the podium. This is, this is a very small podium to hide behind, by the way. Um, we, we saw, um, I think, good quality submissions, which was actually, um, I think, a continuation of last year. We saw last year we were down a lot. Uh, we were up this year from last year. Um, but I think that uh, in, in general, people are putting a lot of thought into it. So it's not, I think, like the past where people kind of carpet bombed CFP submissions and they just went to a bunch of conferences and it was like the quality would vary wildly. I think in general, we saw people like following directions, uh, able to actually put together a cogent thought um, and that kind of thing, which was, um, I think, good. So anyway, you good? Okay. All right. Thank you. So the CFP sub uh, sub <laughs> process that we go through, I'm just going to keep going until you just jump in the middle and merge. It's like driving down the highway. She'll just like sync up and scoot here in just a second. <laughs> scoot. Scoot. Um, we use a piece of software called OpenConf. Um, and if you've done any software development, you'll recognize that is a really annoying name collision. Um, so yes, uh, but it's a, a piece of software that's used for a lot of academic uh, uh, conferences and getting CFPs together and that kind of thing. It mostly suits our needs. It's not perfect and we kind of bludgeon it to work the way that we want it, but it's okay and it's like, I don't know, $150 a year for licensing costs or something like that. And it's, you know, suits the needs, it's well, well, well worth it. Um, there's about 15 to 20 people on the CFP committee. They're in kind of a uh, level of um, commitment varies wildly. Uh, some people review just a handful, some people review all of them. Um, Heidi generally looks for what, four to five uh, to six types of reviews, and then that's enough that we can start to like get a consensus, right? Um, but I think, you know, once, what's interesting to me is we don't do blind CFP reviews, right? There's a lot of pros to that, but there's also a lot of cons to blind reviews. And um, what, uh, there's, there's two things that come up. One, we can put together a program that while maybe is the highest ranked talks, is not actually the engaging things that our audience wants to see. There's plenty of things that our CFP committee will look at and be like, well, that's pretty cool and they rate it high, but at the end of the day, you don't need three talks on the same topic. You don't need, um, you know, there's some topics that are interesting but maybe not appropriate uh, for, for the event. Um, but the other thing is you can, um, unintentional bias can get in the way of people's reviews. Language choice for people that are like ESL um, and they're not able to uh, necessarily uh, get their point across in the CFP process as, as coherently as someone who's a native English speaker as an example. Um, that's something that Heidi will go through uh, with some of the other program committee members and assess like, you know, what's really going on behind the scenes, what is the right program to put together, and they put together what they think is the right program for ShmooCon and the right program for the speakers, right? And so we'll often go pretty deep into the list of submitted talks to find that right mix that we think provides the opportunity for the speakers and the right content for you. And that may be a little controversial because I know some people run ones that just like top 20, get in, go. Well, I mean, but we, we have topic tracks, right? So we have well, to balance too. that yeah. too. So it's not just, you know, the top rated talks or whatever. Um, the, way, the way I kind of approach this myself is I, I read all the... I get submission receipts every time a talk gets submitted, and I, I read the abstracts that come in those submission receipts, but I won't often look at the papers until the reviews are done. And so once the reviews are done, I will go through and read like the top 75 submitted papers. Um, and that doesn't mean that anything lower than that doesn't get reviewed, but at least the top 75 are ones that I will specifically look at. But then I have to go back in, and when I look at the scores, you know, the way the, the program works, as you can see, the range of the scores, you can see like the, maybe a talk, somebody rated it a six and somebody rated it a one. Well, I like to joke that sometimes we get really happy reviewers and we get really grumpy reviewers. So I have to go in and look at why 
somebody gave that a six and why did somebody else give it a one? Like I have to go figure out who was on drugs that day, you know, or like who didn't have their coffee or what was going on because that can affect the scoring. The scoring's, you know, not the only component, I guess. So we have to kind of go through and you have to dig deeper to kind of figure out what's really appropriate. Um, there was a question at the bottom of that slide. Um, <laughs> still a little broken, apologize. Um, is there anything else you want to know about the CFP stats before I give you a bunch of tips on how to hack selection at any conference you're submitting to? Anybody? Yes. So that's an interesting, I mean. Repeat the question. Okay, you repeat the question. Uh, what's the breakdown between uh, talks that are highly technical and down in the weeds versus more abstract think pieces, touchy-feely? I don't think he used the term touchy-feely. That's my summarization. He said soft. Soft skills. Soft. Soft. Squishy. So squishy. <laughs> so squishy. <laughs> Sorry, I'm back. I'm <laughs> she's recovered enough, I can provide commentary. Like there's, I had to like back off a little bit and I'm back on the throttle we'll so to see where this goes. It's kind of an interesting question to me because um, I would say the track that we get the most submissions for is our bring it on track because it's like, it's the catch all track. So anything that's not highly technical, anything that's not specifically defensive, right? Gets submitted to bring it on. I mean, and, that, and so any, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to answer your question with any, like real data, because I don't know that we've specifically tracked that over, you know, over time. I can just tell you kind of like from memory. But um, I, will, I will say that um, we get a, a, a fair number of uh, technical talks around uh, breaking things. Yes. And we don't have a break it track anymore. Like we got rid of that a number of years ago. Um, people will still submit uh, things about you know, offensive work because it's a security con and That's they, true. they submit. Um, and we generally don't accept that unless it's like a generalized, um, you know, kind of talk where they're talking about like a class of attack or some new thing like that that has applicability to defenders. If it's like I found a bug in this thing and I'm going to talk about the bug, that doesn't make the cut. Um, and so I think all, the most of the tech, not most, but a large number of the technical talks we get are like, here's a technical breakdown of the vulnerability that's pretty much not going to have a chance to get on stage here. Yes, sir, Carson. Oh, he's going on the microphone even. Wow, check that out. It's not hot, it's not hot but it looked impressive. But could it was you ask, good could oh. you ask the other question that caused me to turn red up here a million years ago? No. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, here comes the mic. It's hot now. I'm just trolling you. Okay. <laughs> we, we can repeat the question. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> you got to turn it on first, oh, folks. Okay. All right, so my comment is, um, having submitted to a bunch of cons, my comment is, don't just assume that if you don't get into one con, you will or won't get into another con. People have these hierarchical hierarchies of cons in their minds. My comment is, that's not been my experience. Absolutely. So don't, don't make those assumptions. With that said, you know, you and a lot of other cons will ask um, submitters, where else are you presenting? Can you talk a little bit about why do you do that and how does that factor into your selection process? Absolutely. So um, part of the reason we ask that question is like any other conference, we don't want to be repeating something that's been presented, you know, 10 times across the country or something that's been recorded and is readily available already online. Um, that's not to say that we won't accept those types of talks, especially and most importantly, and we'll just file this under this slide right here, if you are submitting something to us that you have presented someplace else before and it has especially already maybe been recorded and is online, if you are submitting that to us, it better come with updates. You know, the, the key is it needs to be fresh, it needs to have updates, it needs to have something that bring, makes it new again. Now, does that have to always be true? Not necessarily. Sometimes a topic or, you know, your content is, you know, we deem it important enough or it's something critical or it's, you know, new enough that that maybe doesn't matter. But if you've presented it four other cons or five other cons before ours, and it's the same presentation you've given four or five times already, 
you know, what's the point, right? It's, it's already online, we can find it, somebody else can already watch it. So you need, to, you need to freshen that, you need to add new things, you need to give us updates, you need to tell us why it's different than what you've presented before. The core of the presentation can maybe be the same, but you should be bringing us something fresh. So that's part of why we asked that question. Um, anything else? Yeah, I think the, um, it's so easy to get information right now. Like if you're interested in a topic, you can go get smart on it. And I think we've all been through YouTube hell of like, I have something that takes 60 seconds to answer and I have to sit through 15 minutes of somebody, you know, saying a bunch of shit and, and whatever. Um, and you, conference talks are no different, right? And, and I think that we want to be able to look at a submission and understand that what you're gonna hear as an audience is going to be useful for you if you sit there and listen to the person for the proposed amount of time. If it's a 15 minute talk or half hour talk or hour long talk, um, you know, that the, there's enough content, it's interesting, it's new. And for people who, um, you know, know the topic area, they're gonna get something out of it. And people who don't know the topic area, they can still learn and follow along. Um, and that's tough, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a tough needle to thread but, um, you know, we think a lot of people do successfully thread it. But I think when you submit to a conference like, like us, you know, be aware of our criteria. But there's other conferences that don't have that same, same kind of thing, right? There are other conferences that overtly say, like, assume your audience member already has a topical knowledge of this subject. Go heavy, go at it, you know, go technical. So That's not really how we run this thing. Yeah, so let me go through this slide really quick. And, and I think... I think that a lot of the points I have on this slide actually pertain to most conferences, especially the first one. If you're submitting to a conference and they have specific things that they ask you for, you better damn well give them the things they ask for. Because at our conference, if you don't, we don't read your submission. We just don't. If we open, if we open your submission and, and you don't have the paper that asks, that contains the 10 things that we've told you like 14 times to put in the paper, we don't read it. Um, it's a waste of our time, it's a waste of your time. Nobody's, nobody's that special, okay? It's okay, I mean, if you miss a question or you didn't understand a question or you maybe you fall short on something, we're like, it's not, it's not that bad, right? But don't send us your slides, we didn't ask for your slides. You want us to see your slides? You can put that in a link as part of the detailed description, right? but we don't wanna see just your slides. You know why? Because your slides don't have your bio, your slides don't have your abstract, your slides don't have the other things we need to make the rest of the conference happen, okay? Give it to us in the order that we ask for it because when I go through later and I'm looking for all that information, I wanna look at the same place every single time, right? It saves me time. So follow directions. Number one thing for any conference you submit to, submit to them in the format that they're asking you for. I don't know what other conferences ask for, some of the conferences borrowed our CFP, they're asking for the same things we ask for, that's fine. Like, just read the CFP, do what they ask, right? It's not hard. Maybe it is hard, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, but do what they ask. Make your decisions based on um, what they're asking for. Um, at least in our case, if the conference is asking for a detailed description, it should be longer than your abstract. Kind of makes sense to me, right? Yeah, it, so this is interesting, because different conferences have different criteria of how much you need to submit. At the end of the day, like someone reading the thing needs to be able to discriminate, like is this appropriate and good enough to be on stage? And if you read the thing that you wrote and there's not enough information that you could make that decision, it's not sufficient, right? And, and, and so like I've- di Again, different conferences, different, you know, there's other conferences where a paragraph of information is what they base their decisions off of. And that's fine, that's what they're doing. Right. Again, go back they, to step number one, follow the directions of the conference you're submitting to. Even when they do that though, I know some of the B-sides, it's like, it's like a paragraph, which is cool. It's like a Google sheet, you but know, you that you're filling in. you provide enough information, concrete information in that paragraph. Like the word, you shouldn't have mostly pronouns and conjunctions, right? Like it's gotta be like real nouns and descriptive verbs and some adjectives that actually allow you to make the case of this is what I'm trying to say. And so just, if it's, just because it's simple in its form doesn't mean that your language selection should be simple, right? right? You need to be very, the shorter it is, the much more specific you need to be with your language in order to convince someone this right. thing should be on stage. So the next um, bullet point is kind of a big one for me. When appropriate reference prior art and the work of others in this space, right? If, it, if a simple Google search tells me that somebody else has done work very similar to yours, you should already know that. Right? If you're doing this research, you should already know who's done similar research. Reference that, it's important, 
right? If you're not doing anything that's not absolutely 100% new and something somebody's done something similar and it, you are standing on their shoulders, you're doing work that maybe builds on the work that they've done, you know, I'm not saying you have to stand on stage and give them all the accolades in the world, but you should be referencing that in your CFP. You want to know why? Because we're going to know. Sometimes We've been doing the people this for 18. On the program committee have done the prior work, and they're like, "Ah, yeah, that's kind <laughs> this of fun." Looks familiar. Thanks for not referencing me. Right? Um, it's important, right? We need to we need to hold each other up. We need to build this as a community, and we should recognize each other when we all do the work. So that's a big one for me, and and. Once I added that as a tip to the CFP, we've been seeing a lot of that. So thank you for those of you who um, have been doing that. That's really important. Uh, point of order. Uh, Do I have a spelling error? No, but we have a lot of slides. Uh, you're the one that's been talking, my friend. I, I'm actually, I, I was quiet for a while. <laughs> I'm just, I, I was just Fuck was, you and your point of order, sir. Oh, yes. That is at Robert's Rules number six. Fuck off. <laughs> All right. Y'all know how ticket sales works, okay? This slide is just in here as a legacy slide, right? The ticket sales, how we run it, has not changed now for a number of years. It's basically FIFO. Um, we do, I mean, this comes up every year where people will be like, boy, it'd be nice if Shmukon got rid of all the bots. Um, we have bot countermeasures, and we manually, literally manually review each transaction, each, you know, uh, registration process. It's my con, hand. I can run over. <laughs> he just told Goki to get bent. He's held up the five minute side and this was the response. So so we're along for this ride, folks. Actually we're we're getting close, but we'll we'll talk fast. Class I'm two just rapids giving you a are shit. now class four rapids. It's getting bumpy. Um but they're really I mean we do care, right? Like at the end of the day, like I, I think um I mean it's not that we don't make mistakes, but the people involved actually give a shit, right? Like we're trying to make sure that everyone has an equal chance of getting in and that people aren't using, you know, malicious or, or uh, you, you guys, know. it's not that we don't see little bits of shenanigans here and there, but it's not what it used to be. It's and not it's like It's not what master. you think it is, which is the more important thing, okay? Yeah. Um, it's by and large people, by and large. Some, some cows and a few some, chickens. Some cows and a few chickens. Chickens. I unplugged it. Um, again, sort of legacy. All this information on this slide is a post on the website, so I'm not going to go through all the numbers here. It's the same information that, um, again, is posted on a blog post, a news post on the website, but it's just kind of what we saw over the ticket sales rounds in terms of like unique IPs, email addresses, and all that kind of stuff. So you can, you can look at the post online if you want to see that, or you can look at these slides at some point in the near future. What's interesting to me, I will point out this, um, more and more people in the, in the ticket sales process are getting tickets off the wait list in all three rounds, which means that some of you are actually only buying one ticket. Thank you. I love when people only buy what they need versus what they think they need. That's just me. Again, legacy slide addressing shenanigans. So we do look for them. We do address them when, when we think that they're inappropriate. Again, another legacy slide. I told you we'd gain back some time. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I should yeah. shut up. Um, secondhand sales for profit are not the issue they used to be at all. I came down pretty hard on this a number of years ago, and um, the community responded. So again, thank you. That's all on you. We appreciate um, the response that we got um, from all of you in uh, tackling this issue that we had. For those of you that don't know, people used to buy a bunch of tickets, and then they'd sell them for way over what we would sell them for, and they'd make money off of all our hard work, and you can imagine how that felt. So um, thank you. Don't thank negotiate you. with terrorists is basically <laughs> the uh, subtext. Anyway, we are saying thank you for self-policing on this matter, and we appreciate it. Oh, Lord, that's really Holy small. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, you know that, I don't know, I, sent, I had a speaker info session. It was mostly about logistics and how to, like, hook up to the thing up here. Like, I totally failed at that when I got here. Um, but one of the tips I gave them was don't use anything less than 12-point font. <laughs> yeah, I think this is like, I don't know, 7.5. Um, that's okay. It's okay. Changes over the years. This was another question that people had asked. We're going to go through kind of fast. Obviously, the number one change over the years is we started out about 300, kind of grew every year, and then capped out about 2,200. We've been there for a while now. A couple of years where we dipped back down, one year was at the Hyatt due to size, and then of course the COVID last year we, we dipped down again. Um, we've had some track changes over the years. 
That was kind of fun to go back and dig out when we had all those changes, but they're there. You can look at them later. Um, we stopped doing keynotes a number of years ago. Kind of just decided that wasn't, like, why? I don't know. I mean, keynotes are fun. I don't know. Just didn't feel like a thing that we wanted to do anymore, so we stopped doing it. I didn't really have any rhyme or reason, Bruce. I don't know. We just. I, it was, I mean, it's a lot of work, and the feedback varied a lot, depending on the person. You know, yeah. you put one person on to be like, this is the most important person this day. And it was already a one. It was already a plenary yeah. track. So, so we like, just, why we are you just making stopped. delineation? And we stopped, and nobody, nobody noticed. Nobody noticed. <laughs> so like, cool. Which I think in general. The only person the, who ever asks me anymore is my dad. Every year, do you have a keynote? I'm like, Dad, I haven't done keynotes in I don't know seven years. It's really cute. Hi, he Dad, if asks, you're watching. Is there a theme? And we're like, yeah, Broadway. He's like, what does <laughs> Broadway like, have to I do with security? Yeah, he's really cute. Um, it's more of a conceptual theme. Yeah. Um, ticket sales, lots of changes over the year. I don't know, year one. I think we did PayPal. Anybody remember that? PayPal, year one. Yeah, I had to look that Fucking up. Fucking Elon. Couldn't even remember. Yeah, right? Yeah. Wow. Could you say that again? That made me happy. Fucking Elon. Thank you. My um, Twitter account has been suspended. He's not watching. Who are you kidding? He watches all. We sold our car. Um, <laughs> we, uh, then the moose cluster. Who remembers the moose cluster? That only fell over like 17 times. I think one time I crawled under the dining room table sobbing my eyes out one day. That was, that was kind of fun. Um, all, we used authorized.net until the one year I tried to use, and they were like, yeah, we don't like you anymore. You know, like two days before the con, we like went to f do no, a test transaction. No, before ticket sales. <laughs> do you remember that, David? And I was like, oh, shit. We went to do a test transaction, authorized.net. Like, it's like, hold no. on a minute. I need to find a new credit card processor. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, poor David. I was like, honey, uh, just give me a minute. Um, so now we're, now we're on Stripe. Woohoo! They, they, much better. They're pretty good. Um, to what we're running now, which is much, it's actually an evolution. We've gone through quite a, a little bit of an evolution over the last few years, but we've been solid now for a while. It runs pretty well. Um, other program changes, we introduced Schmooze a Student in 2013. Um, ShmooCon Labs, we started accepting attendees. ShmooCon Labs has kind of always, uh, I guess, officially been a part of ShmooCon since maybe year two. Um, they existed in year one because we had to have a network, but it wasn't like ShmooCon Labs. And then in um, 2017, 2007, it's very tiny, I can't even read it. Yeah. Um, we started accepting attendees. Um, Saturday night was off-site for a number of years, then on-site, and then kind of became uns uns, and now there's no uns. That's, that's my notes on that one. Um, Anyone remember going to the off-site ones? Anyone enjoy going to the off-site ones? Heaven, heaven and hell was fun. He that's where I crawled out of the bathroom onto the roof, never mind. There was um, the one year we were in Southeast, no, that was terrible. Let's, was, like, no, we, remember that thing with the five minutes and we got to keep talking? Let's not tell that story. All right, yeah. Okay. I, I'm just glad no one died that year, that legitimately. Was, that was legitimately weird. Yeah. Um, content, we were one of the first, uh, uh, well, it's kind of maybe a little ambitious to say that, but we were one of, one of the first conferences to post our content for free um, to, and to stream our content for free. Um, so that's always been pretty cool. Yeah. So I did, a lot of that in the early days was made possible because of Ted. Yeah, I was just so, going to say that. Hi, Ted. And what, what's shocking, I was talking to Heidi about this the other day, is that we got the DVDs from Ted. So Ted would rip them down to DVDs, and he was selling the DVDs and all that. And then he was gracious enough to let us post it on, online. And we would give him like a month or two lead so that he could you know, get his money out of the people that could buy them, and then we'd post it. And when we started encoding the DVDs in like 2005 and 2006, like the internet wasn't as big as it is now. So we had to make some decisions about like video quality and shrinking these things down because we were serving them ourselves and whatever. And Pablo's one of the OG schmooze, was like, you need to encode these as original DVD quality because at some point we'll be able to serve that like real DVD quality over the internet. And I'm like, dude, get off the drugs, <laughs> right? And the okay, problem but here's with Pablo's, the thing. he's, he's always a visionary. Right. And yeah. he's always right. Always right. Okay. So we actually had to re rip So he's DVDs like Mr. Ted later. Talk, yeah. right? You know, and he's amazing. Pablo's Holman, look him up. Yeah. Um, jerk. Jerk. <laughs> we've known him, I don't know, Todd, we've known him for 25 years. Maybe more. Yeah. I don't know. It's been a long time. I've known Toddlet since he was like eight. She <laughs> called you Toddlet. Sorry. Anyone else is welcome to do that going forward. I didn't say that, Todd. That's on him. 
technology, sometimes, sometimes Shmukon keeps up and sometimes we don't. Now I think you might have all noticed. Oh. I, yeah, we are doing great. Um, what does registration run off of? What do you mean? Anybody? Hamster no, boot? No, no registration. registration here at the con. Oh, two old Mac minis and a really old Mac mini. It's a G4 running 10.4. Yeah, they're still up there. We don't upgrade them. Till they die. <laughs> All right. Um, I feel like this is something we've talked about a lot, but we stay the size we are because my house only holds so many boxes. And it, the, oh, no, but it really does preserve the size and the, the feel that we want for the conference. It does, and I think, you know, it's funny because when, time we, when we limited attendance, we were one of the few conferences out there that did it, and, and there was a lot of shade about that. Now it's very common, right? People like, But we still get shade about it. Yeah, yeah. We oh, do. you're exclusive, whatever. I'm like, yeah, FIFOs are pretty exclusive in the Q theory kind of way, but... Yeah, in that, you know, only, you Algorithm can only come nerd. if you get a ticket, <laughs> in that kind of way. Yeah, the people without tickets can't come, sorry. Yeah. Ask me how I know. All right, real quick, who's at the conference? 86 staff, roughly, 54 speakers, roughly. I didn't uh, update some of these numbers. Nine, only nine registered press, you know, there's more here, but nine actually bothered to register. Um, these numbers are mostly correct, so around 16 hand wavy something general admission. 213 sponsors, that number is completely accurate. 29 events, that's actu actually accurate. 47 schmoozers, 64 students, so all total it's about 2168. Actually, I think it's just a tiny bit less, but um, that's our numbers at the con this year. Told you, 2163 is where we ended up because when I uploaded the data database, we cleaned it up a little bit. So as of about, I don't know, an hour ago, we were checked into 2013 out of 2163. I can't tell you how sad I was that that number wasn't 2022. Just saying. Doe. I know. I know. They offered. They offered to, like, you well, know. So there's at least one plus one. We had a UI issue where if you try to redeem a past cons barcode, it says this barcode is a past Mucon barcode. But it wasn't like bright enough. And it's and not so like we bright red, it just looks like the same text that you normally get. And so we had like a scab filling in doing registration and he scanned somebody and it said that he didn't notice. He handed the badge in the bag and the guy walked off. And Frank comes walking up, it was like, did you see what it says? He's like, yeah, I scanned his barcode. It just says it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. the real, I mean, this doesn't really happen that often. And the reality is, um, it pro he probably did have a valid barcode. He just pulled up oh, the wrong, wrong one. Here. Yeah. It, I mean, normally that doesn't happen. Also, thanks for telling people that because now we have to fix that. So that never well, happens it has been fixed. again. We did a hot patch to production. I'm more saying that they shouldn't even be in the database, Brian. Oh, I just, well, never mind. I'll shut okay. up. Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll fix it. No big deal. It was just really funny. It was really funny. It was really funny. So, he whatever. felt very bad about it. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Um, sponsors, real quick. We have about 43 sponsors, including labs. There's different levels of sponsorship. Sponsorship sells out really fast. I sell it out in about two weeks a year, okay? Um, it's a lot of work in those two weeks to get it all run to ground. Um, it does kind of linger on past that, but the initial rush is about two weeks. I think our sponsors are a lot of fun. They tend to bring something really different than other conferences, at least from what I've observed. Um, they're great. So if you're in here and you're a sponsor, you're probably not because you probably should be at your table. But uh, we, we have a lot of fun with our sponsors. And I will say there's a, a luxury that we have that not a lot of conferences have because we know we're going to sell out attendees and we know we're going to sell out of sponsorships. And we do it quickly and it allows us to run the con in a much more structured way without a lot of unknowns. And, and we are thankful for that every year. Um, even if some sponsors are kind of a pain in the ass to get them to pay because, again, see previous discussion of chickens and cows. It's gotten um, better. A lot of them... It has gotten better. Yes, it has yeah. gotten better. Yeah. A lot of it's because I, it sounds really kind of mean, but I kind of hold the power in the situation. So my favorite story to tell is... Um, An unnamed the, government agency. With three letters, starts with an N. Um, they sponsored one year, and, um, you know, we adore them because they pay half of our attendees and all that kind of stuff. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I... They, they tried to pay me, and where they wanted, I guess they were like, okay, well, in order for us to pay, you have to go fill out all this crap. Get a NIAX code. Yeah, and so I'm like, I'm like, shit. it's taken Register me like hours GD. to fill this out, and then it got to the point where I was gonna have to pay a fee 
to invoice them. And at this point, I'm like, fuck this. And I walked away from the money. I didn't, I just was like, I'm done. So um, whatever, I just, I just stopped caring. I'm like, I don't, I don't need your money. So I, I left it alone. And um, the next year they came back and they wanted to sponsor again. And I said, yeah, you know, nope, here's why. I said, I'm not gonna pay so you can pay me. Doesn't make any sense, that just seems kind of dumb. And, um, you know, just it was also taking, it was taken at that point like six hours of my time or something. And I'm like, that, that's also kind of dumb. I'm not a contractor. I'm not like, you know, I'm a one time event. You should have some kind of allowance for this, right? And um, they were like, okay, yeah, no, okay, yeah, I appreciate the comments, whatever. And I shit you not, a week later, I got a check in the mail. I was like, couldn't you do that the first time? Okay. Yeah. yeah, different department. And then I got a really nice challenge coin, but anyway. Um, so in Money In, um, the next two slides, I swear to you, are completely rounded back of the napkin, like frenzied math that I do, like looking through my email, looking through Bruce's email, looking at credit card statements. Do not hold me to any of this. It will not pass an audit. Do not add up the numbers. Please, God, do not add up the numbers and go, oh, Heidi, hello. It looks like you made a million dollars or it looks like you're in the hole, $13 million. I don't know, like I, the decimal point's in the wrong place, right? Do not hold me to any of this. This is just kind of a, it's to give you an idea, right? I apologize for the really tiny font on the next slide. But our, font, our funds come from just two places, spon sponsorship and ticket sales, okay? These numbers are roughly accurate, okay? This doesn't include like the stuff that comes out of receiving this money. This is just the blanket like in money in. That's a joke because where does that come from? Uh, years ago, the first time I, I think I posted about TrueCon finances on my website, I put in money in. And Beetle thought it was the funniest goddamn thing in the world, so he put it on these slides, and it's just been like that. And ever here since. we are, in it's money just, in. So out it's money out. It's an inside out. joke that can vote. All right, out money out. Any questions about where we spend our money? I know, it's because we spend a lot of money. Out money out. Enlarge. What? It depends from year to year what the biggest expense is. I mean, arguably, the biggest expense is taxes. Yeah, the money's left over. That's the one downside of being an LLC, not a 501c3, is Uncle Sam gets a cut. But it also motivates us to reinvest in the company so that Uncle Sam gets less, right? Um, um, <laughs> yeah, right? We're going to pay, pay somebody for that position next year. $10,000 in proofreading. Um, but it, it does vary from year to year. Some, you know, in, in well, the hotels probably. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, the, so I'm very, very incredibly lucky. Our contract with the hotel, um, just so you're all aware, um, I don't pay for any of the space, okay? I don't pay for any of this, okay? Our, our really, our hotel expenses come from the AV equipment and um, the, hmm? Bagels. bagels. Yeah. <laughs> I have no food and beverage commitment. Um, the the when I get the final bill, it largely consists of the money I pay for AV equipment, so basically money to encore for the internet and AV, and then um, money to cover the staff rooms. Um, I cover a single room for each of the staff because we, you know, I mean, we don't run this event for profit, so I'm they 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 have to pay for one of their rooms, <laughs> and I pay for the other night, um, and then. Um, some of those rooms that for the staff are covered by, we make a room commitment, and so that's largely how we get this contract with the hotels, we make a room commitment. So I even have to commit to so many room nights um, for the time that we're here. How and many room nights are we committed to? It's like 1050. Yeah. And so we gotta make 80% of that. We have that to make 80% uh, of that, owe. otherwise we pay a penalty. Yeah. Um, we've always made our room commitment in all the years we've run the event. Um, and then you earn room comps for a certain percentage of those, um, you know, one for X amount of rooms that you, uh, get on your room block, and, but that's also why I ask if you're booked outside of the block to let us know because we get credit for those as well. And then those room comps, I don't use those personally. They go to help pay for staff rooms. Um, so the hotel bill every year roughly is about, um, it can vary. It depends on from year to year, but it can, you know, it's usually like fifty to sixty to seventy thousand dollars. It's a little bit less these years because we're not doing the Unsun's party. Um, you know, we may go back to that, but I'm still not comfortable doing that right now in our current environment. Um, when we do the party, like that's a forty to $50,000 expense right off the top, just so y'all know. Um, 
what else? But in any given year, um, like the equipment expense is probably like the second largest expense. Yeah. Probably every third year we have a large equipment expense because we're upgrading or replacing um, laptops, switches, injectors. I mean, I don't even know. This well, year was a we and we up leveled the streaming uh, infrastructure last year, but we only had one room to deal with. Um, and so we bought one and then bought a backup of everything. And, then and this, this year, year we bought nine new laptops for Hack Fortress. Yeah. That was, you know. Well, nine. we also added more rooms. So we got another two sets of cameras, tripods, laptops to drive it, the video switcher, the whole deal. So there was a pretty big investment this year around just the last two years over streaming. Right. So we do make money from year to year, but having a buffer is nice, obviously, because you don't want to go into the next year and, you know, be in a deficit, right? <laughs> or, or, or if you screw up and you don't have the event cost of the hotel is quite large. Right. right. Um, so like if something happens and we don't make our room commitments, it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we have liability to the hotel. Um, now they can temper that down if they start booking the, uh, the rooms. You know, if they get full, they won't take us to the cleaners like that. But the personal liability rains down on us. That's an LLC is it rains down on you personally. And so the hotel can come after us for a quarter million dollars because we didn't make our room nice. Right. So any, there's any a questions? little risk there. So any questions about expenses real quick? What is the insurance cover um, So the insurance is actually kind of cheap, believe it or not. Um, it costs us about $1,000. It does not cover anything to do with water or alcohol. So as long as we don't swim or personally serve you drinks, Yeah, the alcohol becomes cheap. the hotel's problem, right? That's why, you know, we're not... TAM certified and any of that. So the hotel deals with that liability. It's $2 million worth of coverage, personal injury, property, that kind of thing, you know. To be clear, Bruce and I also carry umbrella policies. Please don't sue us. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, swimming alcohol, double. Double. Yeah. And to be clear, when you add those things into your, like, event insurance, the cost goes, like, sky high, right? I mean, it's a big deal. Because someone will die. Because somebody like, will die. That's yeah. exactly what they expect. But Swimming in flaming alcohol guarantees it, right? <laughs> like, that's a, that's a lock um, right there. But we, yeah, I mean, we kind of take style. our recommendations. We've a been using the same insurance company for cigarette. years. And we just kind of take our recommendations based on, you know, what the hotel actually <laughs> doesn't require invent insurance from us. But yeah, any do. smart, no, they don't require us to prove it. Th this year, they were sort of requiring it. They don't require proof, but they do require us to carry it. It was in the, it was in the contract. Yeah, well, okay. We <laughs> require. Well, yeah. <laughs> One of us talks to the hotel all the time. Lawyer. I know, seriously. It was I, uh, yeah, Bruce, it's been in the contract since day one, I assure you. <laughs> also, Kahlua is probably not flammable. I just wanted to be clear I knew that. You know so what? You do not drink the hand sanitizer. <laughs> do you know, I... Much told us last night that's a, that's like literally on all the hand sanitizer at the Pentagon. What, not to drink it? Labels, like little handmade labels. Do not drink. I'm is, like, is I'm looking at much. I'm like, dystopian that you're like, Ugh. I'm like, you know, it's there reason. for a reason. I'm like, which general? <laughs> which one? I need to know. Petraeus was always Peanuts whacked out in the, the army. in the jaw, not hand sanitizer. Dude, I'm sorry, Navy, but I'm like, go Army. Beat Navy. That's my team. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> any, so any questions about finances real quick? This is our last slide, so I'll ask you if there's any general questions you'd like to see in on the con going forward. Amex. I have a business Amex. I have a business account, business check. But I try to put everything on the Amex as much as possible. I have a million Amex points or more. You should ask me about my Hilton points sometime. <laughs> well, going to go if somewhere you, at some point. If you organize an event uh, at a hotel, they give the event organizer the points as if they're the person getting you know, the, all the space and everything. Um, and there's a big clause in, in, in the contract that states, like, we will only give you points if your employer allows you to have it and, and whatever, which in our case is cute, because Heidi gets to have a dialogue with herself, like, will I accept the Hilton you points? Do I get to accept the um, points? Gee, I wonder. Of course. Um, but, I mean, there's actually a fair bit on the table for some of these larger events when the event organizers are doing it, you know, and, and it hadn't really dawned on me that you, if you work for, like, a Booz Allen or Lockheed, like, you wouldn't be able to take those points. Because, but if but you're a I professional just wanna, event I, organizer, you're like, fuck yeah. I don't want to sound like I'm, like, you know, riding on the laurels of all the Hilton points. I'm, I, I tend to be, and, and for people who I meet up with at a cons and stuff, like, I, I take my staff out to dinner all the time when I can, when I'm out at various events um, as much as possible. You know, I will... 
I, you know, I, I will rent the bigger room at the hotel so they can come hang out and have a space to, you know, be in when I'm traveling around and stuff. I do try to share as much as possible with, um, with you know, the people that help make this possible. So, um, all right, so in general, this is the last slide, and then we got a boot because the hotel's got to reset this room for tonight. Anything you would like to see, and somebody else who is not me should write down the answers to this question because I won't remember, but for future own the con, yes. Todd's like, that's my job. I know, that's what I was, I was hinting at Todd. What is our, what are our plans to attract more schmoozers? Um, I don't, so, if that's, oh. that's actually, <laughs> what? The, the, the premise is that problem that we have problems attracting schmoozers. We, yeah, so we do not clearly have problems attracting schmoozers. Um, I actually generally cut the schmoozers off early, right? Um, and this year, I, I did that in part, I cut them off at about 45, 50 schmoozers, I think, I can't remember what the slide said, whatever that slide said, so I cut it off. Um, because at that point in time, we actually didn't have many student applications. And it made no sense for me to continue accepting schmoozer applications if I didn't have student applications, right? That's just me collecting money. So I cut it off. Um, and typically, I do cap schmoozers anywhere between 40 and 60, right? Now, I'm a big old pushover when it comes to the students. If a student sends in a complete application, they're generally going to get in. That's just how it is. So no matter like how far past generally that goes, past the schmoozer amount, Shmoocon's going to eat the rest of the rest of the student um, applications, no matter what. Now I say that, but please, if I get like 400, obviously, you know, I'm going to have to make some decisions there, right? Like I, you know, this is within reason. Um, but I also don't want the schmoozer um, program to become like a backdoor just to getting a ticket. I do want the people who are applying that program to be invested in our students to be participating in that program. Um, it means a lot to me. So I, I think there was also an impact um, on the students from COVID in the sense that in an undergraduate program, you have like, you know, four years of institutional knowledge that's constantly a sliding window and COVID shot a hole in that. And so you had a group of kids coming in who had never heard of Shmukon or anything like this. And then two years two year of people gap, who had yeah. left. And so there was no institutional, there was little institutional knowledge left about, oh, there's this thing you can do. Well, the good news the, is, though, is some of the professors Some are of the professors could, but we even saw yeah. that same trend with, like, uh, scouts. Like, we've been involved with scout, scouting for a long time, and, you know, uh, Cub Scouts are younger, and they have, like, day camp that Heidi helps run. Um, and again, that's like a five-year sliding window. And when we came out of COVID, there was far less interest in, in the summer camp and I don't think it was because people were afraid of COVID. I think it's because like they lost the muscle memory about like, oh, it's time to go to summer camp. We need to tell all the kids and the kids go and whatever. And I think the same things happened with the students um, here at, at ShmooCon. So the, the, the older people, if you will, who you know, you've been in the industry a while, you're aware of like all these events and which ones you want to go to and not, the students lost that, that view. So this year we saw an uptick from last year for sure. Well, last year I did, I did hold the numbers low because yeah, we yeah. kept the overall conference low due to more COVID restrictions. Um, but yeah, having the gap year, I think, did impact the program. But, you know, it did all right this year. It was, it was kind of back to normal this year. Maybe it wasn't quite, it was only like about 10 or 15 lower than kind of normal. So it did all right. Anybody else? I'm really looking for, like, anything else you guys want to see because, you know, the slides haven't really changed in 18 years. But the jokes haven't either. They really haven't. We sell the same jokes every year. Also, I get a leg cramp every year at this one, so I think that means I'm sitting around too much. You can stand up. No. Yeah, the way more <laughs> puppet play. I, the puppets will not come back next year. <laughs> I Ask me how I I would know. like to apologize right now for that 10 minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Anything else before we, before we let you go? Yes, sir. Um, you get to for, for new conferences. <laughs> Don't do. Well, I, so are you asking like which other ones you should attend, or or start up? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I've never been handed a hand grenade before. Uh, <laughs> uh, what's uh, the Eagles? So. Um, and all of South Philly actually is what's happening in Philly. I think that um, the one of the things that's been clear to me, uh, two things, 
don't overcomplicate the situation, right? Like, especially cooks in the kitchen. Like, when I say complicate it, like, if you're going to do an event, there's something, I mean, we've done a lot of weird things over our life where, like, we volunteered and, and run things. And the more people you get involved early on, I think the less likely you are to be successful. There was something that uh, someone said to me in, in college uh, uh, when I was in the, the only fraternity in the state of Alaska. He was Long president. conversation. I was president. That every event like this requires a maniac to be at the helm to run it, right? <laughs> like, you need someone who can, like, pour on the gas Why, and just you. make shit happen and go. So if you're going to do an event, just, like, go, and people will follow along behind you, right? And if you're a good leader, but, they'll follow. Okay, the the, so uh, the oh other thing... <laughs> Ooh, I won that one. The other thing um, that I would say is that focus on your volunteers and reward them and make them feel like they're part of it that so it's a balance right like you have to be the maniac that drives the thing but you also have to build the community volunteers to come with you to help do the thing and that's really the challenge that you have to balance that's what she does oh well so at, at that Whoa. stage of the game we had the schmoo group was a much more functional entity and there were like 30 of us involved in the schmoo group and it was basically like get 10 friends to show up. Oh, yeah. No, it was really like begging on lists to be like, okay. And and we all had to pay our own way. Yeah, like we paid our way in. We like all bought tickets. It was a tickets. totally different deal in the early days. But that was yeah. because we had that huge group of, of people. We'd already been doing open source projects and conference presentations and uh, books and articles and that kind of thing. So we were used to working with each other. So we got a lot but of I value think, over um, that. I think even in those early days as we brought on volunteers like Louise in the back working, who does labs for us, um, and even David who came on. I mean, not in, you weren't a volunteer maybe in the first few years, but came on pretty early. Um, and I'm looking around, I can't really see, but there's probably more of you in the room. Um, when, um, you know, when, when people who are committed to you show up, you got to be committed right back at them. And um, I hope I make this very clear. This isn't about me. It's not about Bruce by any stretch of imagination. It's not, it's just not, right? I know we, we get we get a lot of the attention. We get a lot of the accolades. We're the ones up here talking in the microphone. I get that. And we do carry a lot of the load. I'm not trying to necessarily minimize what we do. But it's entirely, absolutely not possible without the team that we have around us. We wouldn't do it if they weren't here, period. We couldn't do it if they weren't here. And, you, you know, we, they support us, their family, we support them. And I think that, um, I always like to say there's a hierarchy in what I care about when it comes to the conference, and the volunteers are the number one thing. Everything else is after. So on that lovely sappy note that we can get all emo about, um, we're going to close so that you can reset this room for game night. But if you, in the future, if there's anything you want to know about the con, info at schmoocon.org is a great place to write. I will promise you that I'll get an answer maybe sometime next week. Um, and if there's anything you'd like to see in the future in these slides, let me know. I'll put a new slide stamp on the next slide that I add it to. Um, otherwise, thank you for being here. We'll see you on the con floor.